13. Search. The barman looked up. The inn was crowded, and in the normal course of business, anyone entering should not have caused him to notice. But the figure who entered was not one of his ordinary customers, nor was the barman an ordinary barman. The newcomer was a woman, tall and alert in her stance, wearing an all-concealing robe of sturdy weave, fine enough to mark her as more than a common street girl, but not so elegant as to mark her as nobility. For a moment, the barman expected one or more men to follow her, escorts to protect her from the street's rougher denizens. When none appeared, he was certain there was nothing ordinary about this woman. She glanced around the room as if seeking someone. Then she locked eyes with the barman. She threw back the hood of the cloak, revealing a youthful appearance, though the barman knew well enough appearances were deceiving, with dark hair and green eyes. She was not pretty, but striking, with a full mouth and good cheekbones. Her eyes were dangerous. Most men would have called her beautiful, but most men wouldn't have known how dangerous she was. A young bravo stepped up to intercept her before she could reach the bar. He was at the peak of youth, feeling too much the rush of blood and ale. He was nearly majestic in appearance, half a foot taller than six feet, with shoulders broad with iron plates and enough scars to ensure that few of his boasts were challenged as lies. "'Here now,' he said with a drunken laugh, pushing back a crested helmet so he could see better. "'What is so wonderful a wench doing without my company?' This brought a laugh from two of his companions and a disapproving look from the whore who had counted on all three of these soldiers, making her night profitable. The woman stopped as the young warrior stepped before her and looked him slowly up and down. "'Excuse me.' she said softly. The man-boy grinned and seemed about to say something. Then his smile slowly faded until he looked down upon the woman with a puzzled expression. I'm sorry, he said quietly as he stepped aside. His friends looked on in amazement and one stood up to say something. The barman produced a light crossbow and put it on the bar with a bolt pointed directly at the protester. Why don't you sit back down and finish your drink? Hold on, Tarbert. We spend a lot of gold here. Don't be threatening us. Broca, you get drunk on cheap wine down at the market, then stagger up here to grope and fondle one of my girls until closing, when half the time you don't have enough to pay for her company. The girl who had been sitting with the three men stood up and said, And the half of the time they have money, they don't have any iron left in their swords from all that cheap wine. And even when they do, it's nothing much to brag on. This brought a torrent of laughter and insults from the rest of the patrons of the commons. The third warrior, who had been holding the whore until she stood up, said, Arlet, I thought you liked us. Show me your gold, then. I love you, darling, she said with a grin lacking any affection. Tabbert said, Why don't you three boys head on down to Kinjinkies and annoy his girls for a while? He's Tsarani blood, so he'll bear up under the abuse with better grace than I. The two companions looked ready to dispute this request, but the first, who had tried to stop the woman, nodded slowly and pulled his helm back down. Reaching under the table, he retrieved his weapon and shield. Come on, we can find our fun somewhere else. His two friends were about to protest when he bellowed, I said, come on! The abrupt rage startled the others, and they hesitated, then agreed, following him out of the room. The woman reached the bar. The barman knew her first question before she asked. He said, I haven't seen him. The woman raised one eyebrow in question. Whoever it is you're looking for, I haven't seen him. Who do you think I'm looking for? The barman, a stout fellow with mutton-chop sideburns and a receding hairline, said, There is only one kind of man who would bring a woman like you searching, and one like that hasn't come by recently. And what kind of woman are you taking me for? she asked. One who sees things others miss. You're very observant for a barman, she countered. Most barmen are, though they learn not to show it. I, on the other hand, am not most barman. Your name? Tarbert. Lowering her voice, she spoke. I have been to every shabby inn and dirty tap room in Lamut, seeking something I was told on good authority would be here. So far I got nothing but blank looks and confused stammering. Speaking even more softly, she said, I need to find the hall. With a smile, he said, A back room. 
He led her through a small back room, then down a flight of stairs. This storage room connects with others below the city, he said. He opened a door at the foot of the stairs and led her to the far end of a narrow hall. There was no door, only a small alcove doorway, hidden by a piece of cloth hung from a metal rod. As she reached the door, Tabbert said, You'll understand when I say if you're in this room, I can't help you. I can only show you the door. Miranda nodded, though she wasn't entirely sure of the meaning of what he said. She stepped through into the small room. As she stepped across the threshold and passed under the rod, she felt the energy emanating from it. For a brief instant, she saw a tiny storage room, stacked high with a few empty ale and wine casks and some crates, but instantly she understood the barman's words. She willed herself into phase with the energies coursing down from the metal rod, and an instant later she stood somewhere else. The hall was endless, or at least no creature able to communicate had ever discovered the end of it. Miranda saw that every so often a doorway, a rectangle of light, adjoined the hall on the sides. Between the entrances a gray nothingness loomed. That she could see it all was something of a mystery, for there was no obvious source of light. Miranda shifted her perceptions and instantly regretted it. The darkness she experienced was so profound it produced an instant despair. She returned her sight to the magically tuned vision she had employed, and again she could see. She considered the barman's words. You'll understand when I say if you're in this room I can't help you. I can only show you the door. He knew of the magic portal into the hall, but could not empower anyone to enter. Only a talent like Miranda or a few others on mid would have the means of entering the hall and surviving once there. She turned and looked at the door she had just stepped through, seeking to set it apart in her mind from the others, should she need to return this way. At first nothing out of the ordinary marked the doorway. At last she noticed faint runes hovering over the top of the door, difficult to see. She focused her attention on them and memorized the shape and formation, in her mind translating the glyphs to mid -chemia. Across from the door only a featureless gray void beckoned. The doors were staggered on the left and right so that none faced another. She moved down and saw that the glyphs of the door on the other side of the one through which she had entered bore a different mark. She memorized that one as well. If she were to be turned around somehow and lose sight of where she was, a series of familiar landmarks would prove useful. After memorizing a half dozen of the nearest door glyphs, she continued on, assuming that, without information, one direction was as apt as another, and began to walk. The figure in the distance appeared roughly human in shape, but it could have been a member of any number of races. Miranda stopped walking and watched. She was able to defend herself, but she thought it better to avoid rushing into trouble if she could avoid it. A door to her right provided the potential for escape, though she had no idea what was on the other side. As if reading her thoughts, the figure yelled something, holding out its gloved hand to show it was holding no weapons. The gesture was less than reassuring, as the creature was otherwise bristling with more arms than Miranda thought anyone should be able to carry and still walk upright. Upon its head a full visor masked its features, while the body was covered in a material that looked as rigid as steel, yet gave the appearance of being more flexible. It was a dull, pale silver in color, almost white, and lacked the high reflective quality that most polished armor possessed. The creature carried a round shield on its back, giving it a turtle-like appearance. A long-sword's hilt peeked over one shoulder, while what appeared to be the stock of a crossbow was visible over the other. At the right hip hung a short sword, and an assortment of knives and throwing implements hung around the figure's torso. A whip was rolled up and hung from the left side of the creature's belt, and over one shoulder a large sack was thrown. Miranda called out in the kingdom tongue. I can see you are not carrying anything in your hand at the moment. The figure moved cautiously toward her and said something in a language different from the first it had used. Miranda answered in Keshian, and the slowly walking arsenal answered in yet another tongue. At last Miranda spoke in a variant of the language of the kingdom of Roldham, 
And the figure said, Aye, you're a Medkemian. I thought I'd recognize Dalkian a bit ago, but I'm rusty. He, for his voice sounded like that of a man, said, I have been trying to tell you that if you jump through that door, you'd better be able to breathe methane. I have means of protecting myself from lethal gas, answered Miranda. The man reached up slowly and removed his helm, revealing a face that was almost boyish. A freckled visage set with green eyes and topped with a damp mat of red hair, a face split with a friendly smile. Few who walk the hall don't, but the stress is pretty awful. You'd weigh about two hundred times as much as you do normally on Fedicio, which is what the inhabitants call that world, and that can slow movement down a great deal. Thank you, Miranda said at last. First time in the hall? Asked the man. Why do you ask? Well, unless you're a great deal more powerful than you look, and I'll be the first to admit that appearances are almost always deceiving, it's usually first-timers whom we find wandering the hall without company. We? Those of us who live here. You live in the hall? You're a first-timer, no doubt. He set the bag down. I am Boldar Blood. Interesting name, Miranda said, visibly amused. Well, it's not the one my parents gave me, certainly, but I'm a mercenary, and one must attempt a certain level of intimidation in my line of work. Hardly credible, I know, but it does prove to be the case. Besides, he pointed to his own countenance, is this a face to inspire terror? Miranda shook her head and smiled in return. No, I guess not. You can call me Miranda. Yes, it's my first time in the hall. Can you get back to Midkemia? If I turn around and walk about 220 doors, I suspect I'll find the right one. Boldar shook his head. That's the long way. There's a door a short way off that will put you in the city of Italy, on the world of Iljabon. If you can get through the two blocks to another entrance without being accosted by the locals, you'll find a door that leads back into the hall next to the door that leads to... I forget which Midkemian door it is, but it's one of them. He leaned over, opened his bag, and took out a bottle. He fished around inside the sack and produced a pair of metal cups. Care to join me in a cup of wine? Thank you, said Miranda. I am a little thirsty. Old R said, When I first stumbled into the hall, must have been a century and a half or so ago, I wandered around until I almost starved to death. A very agreeable thief saved my life in exchange for a seemingly inexhaustible series of reminders of that fact, usually in conjunction with a need for a favor from me. But he did save me a great deal of difficulty at the time. Knowledge of how to navigate the hall is quite useful, and it's knowledge that I'm delighted to share with you. In exchange for... You catch on quickly, said Blood with a grin. Nothing is free in the hall. Sometimes you might do something to build accounts and put others in your debt, but nothing ever goes without something in return. There are three types of people you'll meet in the hall. Those who will avoid you and spare you their society in passing, those who will try to bargain with you, and those who will try to take advantage of you. The second and third groups are not necessarily the same thing. I can take care of myself, Miranda said with a challenge in her voice. As I said earlier, you couldn't be here in the first place and not have some capacity. But remember, this is also true of everyone else you meet in the Hall of Worlds. Oh, occasionally some poor soul without any powers, talents, or abilities blunders in unbidden. No one quite understands how. But quickly they walk out the wrong door or run into those who seek easy prey or step off into the void. What happens when you step off into the void? If you know the right spot, you end up coming into a saloon of a great inn, known by many names, owned by a man named John. The inn is called simply The Inn. And as John is known as variously, John the Oath Keeper, John Without Deceit, John the Scrupulous, John Who Has Ethics, or any other of a half dozen such honorifics, the saloon is usually called Honest John's. There were, at last count, 1,117 known entrances to the saloon. If you don't know the right spot, well, no one knows, for no one has ever returned to tell anyone what exists in the void. It is simply the void. Miranda relaxed. The mercenary's affable manner was such that she doubted he would attempt to take advantage of her. 
Would you be willing to show me to one of these entrances? Certainly, for a price. That being? She asked, raising an eyebrow. In the hall, there are many things of value. The usual, gold and other precious metal, gems and stones, deeds of ownership to estates, slaves and indentures, and most of all, information. Then there is the unusual, items unique, services personal, manipulations of reality, souls of those who will never be born, things of those types. Miranda nodded. What would you? What have you? They began haggling. Twice in less than a day, blood had proven his worth. Miranda was finding herself fortunate that he had been the first person she encountered, rather than a party of interdimensional slavers whom they encountered several hours later. Miranda had a personal distaste for the institution of slavery, a bias now heightened by the attempt to reduce her and Boldar to inventory. Boldar had disposed of the four guards and the slaver after attempting to allow them peaceful passage. Miranda thought she might have been able to cope with them alone, but she was impressed how Boldar had instantly recognized the moment the negotiations had soured and had disposed of two guards before she could begin to focus her mind on protecting herself. By the time she would have encased herself in a protective aura, the conflict was over. The slaves had been freed, which had required a great deal of argument on Miranda's part, for now she had to make good on the portion of profit Boldar stood to make upon acquiring the slaves and selling them. Miranda pointed out that as he was currently in her employ, he was in fact acting as her agent, and she was free to do with the slaves what she chose. He found this proposition somewhat dubious, but after considering the difficulty of feeding and caring for the slaves, decided that accepting a bonus for Miranda would prove the better solution. The second encounter had been with another band of mercenaries who seemed inclined to give Blood and his employer a wide berth, but who, Miranda was certain, would have acted entirely differently had she been alone. While they walked, she learned. So if you know the locations of the common doors, the journey through the hall can be shortened? Certainly, said Blood. It depends on the world how many doorways exist and where they are relative to one another in the hall. Vander or space, for example, he waved at a door they passed, has but one door, which, unfortunately, opens into the Hall of Sacrifice in the most sacred temple of a cult of cannibalistic humanoids, who are less fussy about defining cannibalism than they are devoted to eating anyone who stumbles into their most holy of holies. This is a world seldom visited. Merlin, on the other hand, he waved at another door a short distance ahead, is a commerce world that is served by no less than six doors, which makes it a hub of trade, both among its resident nations and for other whole worlds. The world from which you appear to hail, Midkemia, has at least three doors I'm aware of. Which did you use to enter? Under a bar in Lamut. Ah, yes, Tabbert's. Good food, decent ale, and bad women. Fine sort of place. He seemed somehow to be grinning behind the mask. How Miranda could tell, she didn't know. Perhaps it was some subtlety in the mercenary's body language, or a note in his voice. How does one learn of these doors? Is there a map? Well, there's one, said Boldar, at Honest John's. It's on a wall in the public room. There you can see the known limits of the hall. The last time I looked, there were something like 36,000-odd doors identified and catalogued. There are occasionally messages forwarded to the inn from those who encounter new doors, either in the hall or upon any world where a new passage is discovered. There's even one legendary lunatic, whose name I forget, who is exploring the far reaches and sending back messages, some which take decades to reach John's. He's getting so far from the inn, he's becoming a myth. Miranda thought. How long has this been going on? Boldar shrugged. I suspect the hall has existed since the dawn of time. Men and other creatures have lived here for ages. It requires a certain talent to survive for long within the hall, so it has its appeal for those who seek a higher-stakes sort of living. What of you? asked Miranda. You could live well on most worlds with the fee you charge me. The mercenary shrugged. I do this less for the bounty than for the excitement. I must confess that I do grow easily bored. There are worlds where I could rule as king, but that has little appeal for me. 
In truth, I find myself happiest in circumstances that would drive most sane men mad. War, murder, assassination, intrigue. These are my stock in trade, and there are few who match me in skill. I say this not to brag, for I have your commission already, but to tell you simply, once you grow used to living in the hall, there is no other life. Miranda nodded. The scope of the place was staggering. It was literally the sum of all known and quite a few unknown worlds. Boldar said, As much as I am enjoying your company, Miranda, and as much as I enjoy the wealth you promise, I grow tired. While time has no meaning here, fatigue and hunger are real in all dimensions, at least the ones I've visited. And you still haven't told me where you go. Miranda said, That's because I really don't know where I'm going. I'm looking for someone. May I inquire whom? A worker of magic, by name Pug of Stardock. Boldar shrugged. Never heard of him. But if there is one place where both our present needs can likely be met, it is the inn. Miranda was uncertain and wondered at her own reluctance to embrace the obvious. If there was a communal center to the hall, then should Pug have come through the hall, that was the most likely place to inquire. But she feared others might also be interested in his passing and thought it likely he would have avoided letting others know of his whereabouts. Still, it was better than wandering aimlessly. Are we far from the inn? No, actually, said Boldar. We've passed two other entrances since we met, and there is another a short distance away. He motioned for her to follow, and after progressing past another two doors, he pointed to the void. This is very difficult the first time, he pointed to the door opposite the void. Note that, Mark. She nodded. It's Haliali, a nice place if you enjoy mountains. One of the entrances to Honest John's lies across from it. Now, you simply step off and expect to meet a step or foot or so beyond the edge of the void. So saying, he stepped into the gray and vanished. Miranda took a breath. Then, as she started to duplicate his move, thought, Step up or down? Miranda fell forward. The step was down, and she had guessed up. Strong arms caught her, and she opened her eyes wide at the sight of white fur on them. She tried remaining calm as she disengaged herself from her helper, a nine-foot-tall creature covered in that same white fur from head to foot. Black spots broke up the otherwise snowy surface, and two immense blue eyes and a mouth were the only visible features on a shaggy head. A plaintive grunt was followed by Boldar, saying, If you have any weapons, now is the time to surrender them. She saw he was efficiently divesting himself of his arsenal, including several rather innocuous-looking items, that had been secreted about his person. Miranda carried only two daggers, one in her waistband and another strapped to the inside of her right calf, and she quickly surrendered them. Boldar said, The proprietor learned ages ago that his establishment thrives so long as it is neutral ground for everyone. Quad ensures that no one who starts trouble remains inside the saloon any longer than necessary. Quad? Our large hirsute friend here, answered Boldar. As they left the doorway, he continued, Quads are Korapapan, stronger by the pound than any creature known, almost completely resistant to any magic, and the most toxic poisons take a week or so to kill one. They make incredible bodyguards if you can get one to leave their homeworld. Miranda stopped and gaped. The saloon was immense, easily two hundred yards across and twice that deep. Along the right wall, nearly the entire way, ran a single bar, with a dozen barmen rushing to meet their customers' demands. A pair of galleries, one above the other, overhung the other three sides of the hall, thick with tables and chairs, providing vantage points from which those drinking and dining could gaze down upon the main floor. There, every game of chance conceivable was being played, from several variations of dice to a knife duel in a small sand pit. Creatures of every imaginable confirmation moved easily through the press, greeting one another as they chanced upon old acquaintances. Creatures carried trays covered with a variety of pots, platters, cups, buckets, and bowls. Some were put before creatures that defied Miranda's sense of order. At least a dozen clearly reptilian creatures were dining in the hall, the mere fact of which caused her to be very uncomfortable. The majority of the clientele was humanoid, though an occasional insect-like being or something that looked like a walking dog could be seen. Welcome to Honest John's, said Boldar. Where's John? she asked. He is over there. 
He pointed to the long bar. At the near end stood a man wearing a strange suit of shining cloth. It consisted of trousers that broke without cuffs at the top of shiny black boots with oddly pointed toes. The jacket was open in front, revealing a white shirt with ruffles, closed by pearl studs and sporting a pointed collar, set off with a cravat of bright yellow. Upon his head he wore a wide-brimmed white hat with a shimmering red silk hat band. He spoke closely with a creature that looked like a man with an extra set of eyes in his forehead. Boldar waved as they approached, and a man identified as John said something to the four-eyed man, who nodded once and departed. With a wide smile, John said, Boldar, it's been a lot of year. Not quite, John, but close enough. How do you tell time in the hall? asked Miranda. John glanced at Boldar, who said, My current employer, Miranda. With a theatrical gesture, John doffed his hat and swept it across his chest, bowing at the waist as he reached out with his other and took one of hers lightly in it. He then made a gesture of kissing it, though his lips never touched skin. She withdrew it quickly, feeling somewhat awkward at the contact. John said, Welcome to my humble establishment. Suddenly Miranda's eyes widened. What language are you? Are we? John said, Your first visit, I say. I thought it unlikely we should host as lovely a guest as yourself before without my notice. He waved them to a table located near the bar and pulled out a chair. She blinked at it a moment before she realized he was waiting for her to sit. She was unused to this odd behavior, but considering the range of human custom, she chose not to offend and let him seat her. One of the few magic spells allowed. It is not only useful, it is necessary. It's not foolproof, I fear, for we do occasionally have the odd visitor whose personal frame of reference is so alien to the majority of sentient life that only the most basic communication is possible, if any. And we also do get the occasional fool. Boldar chuckled and said, That we do. John waved his hand. Now, as to your first question, measuring time is simple. Outside the hall, time passes as it does everywhere else in the universe as far as I know. But to answer what you meant to ask, we measure it as we did on my home world. It's a vanity, but as I am the owner of the establishment, it's my right to make the rules. What world do you hail from, if I might know? Midkemia. Ah, then, it's very close to what you're used to. Mere hours different per year, enough to trouble scribes and philosophers, but in the course of a normal lifetime— You'd only be off by a few days on your birthday between the two calendars. Miranda said, When I first learned of the hall, I thought it a magic gate through which I might seek other worlds. I had no idea. John nodded. Few do. But humans, for that is what I judge you to be, are like most other intelligent creatures. They adapt, and they find things that are useful and continue to do them. Likewise, those of us who are privileged to walk the hall, well, we adapt too. There are too many reasons to stay within the hall, too many benefits, once one finds one's way into it, to ignore. So most of us become citizens of the hall, abandoning our former ties, or at least neglecting them shamefully. Benefits? John and Boldar exchanged looks. So I don't bore you, my dear. Why don't you tell me what you know about the hall? Suggested John. Miranda said, In my travels I have heard of the Hall of Worlds several times. I had to look for quite some time to find the entrance. I know it is a means of traveling through space to reach distant worlds. And through time as well, said Boldar. Miranda said, Time? To reach a distant world by conventional means takes lifetimes. The hall reduces transit to days, in some cases hours. John said, Then to the heart of the matter. The hall exists independent of objective reality, as we like to define it when standing on the surface of our home worlds. It links worlds that may be in different universes, different space-times, for lack of a better term. We have no way of knowing. For that matter, it may link worlds at different times. My home world, a not very distinguished sphere orbiting an unremarkable sun, May very well have died of old age before your world was born, Miranda. How would we know? If we move through objective space, then why not through objective time? And because of that, we have here, within the hall, everything. Or if not that, then as close as a mortal can wish. 
We trade in wonders in the hall, and in the prosaic, every chattel and species, every service and debt. If you can imagine it, if it can be found anywhere, it can be found here. Or at least here you can find someone to take you to it. What are the benefits? Well, for one, you don't age in the hall. Immortality? Oh, something close enough to it to make little difference, said John. It may be that those of us able to find the hall possess this gift already. Or it may be that by living within the hall we avoid death's icy hand. But the gains in time are not trivial, and few give them up willingly. He waved his hand to the gallery above. Those who inhabit my guest quarters number several hundred who fear to ever again leave the hall, conducting their businesses in their entirety in rooms I lease them. Others come here as the only possible refuge from all danger, while yet others spend part of their days on other worlds and part of them here. But no denizen of the hall will give up its lure after becoming aware of the benefits. What of Mokros the Black? At the mention of that name, both John and Boldar looked uncomfortable. He's a special case, answered John after a while. He may be an agent of some higher power or even a higher power himself. At the very least, he's something beyond what we would count mortal here in the hall. How much of what has been placed at his feet is true, and how much legend only a few can tell. What do you know of him? Only what was told me in Midkemia. Not the world of his birth, said John. Of that I am almost certain. But what brings his name into this conversation? Only that he's a special case, as you have said. So there might be others. Perhaps. Such as Pug of Stardock? Again John looked discomforted, though Boldor hadn't so much as blinked at mention of Pug's name. If you seek Pug, I may not be able to offer you much by way of encouragement. Why is that? He passed through here quite a few months ago, ostensibly on his way to some odd world I can't remember, to do research, but I fear that is a ruse. Why do you say that? because he hired several of Boldar's friends to prevent anyone who asked for him from following after. Who? Oh, said Boldar, looking around the room. William the Gripper, Jeremiah the Red, and Elin Scarlet, the Grey Assassin. Boldar shook his head. Those are three likely to cause some trouble. He leaned forward to Miranda. I could most likely best Jeremiah. His reputation is built mostly on rumor. But William and Eland both possess the death touch, and that makes it dicey if they're working together. Miranda said, Do I look like a Pantathian? John said, My dear, after as many lifetimes as I have spent in the hall, looks are the last thing I would depend upon. You, for all your evident charms, could turn out to be my own grandfather, and it would barely surprise me. Though I fervently hope the old boy is dead, as we buried him when I was fourteen years old. Rising, he said, Pug of Stardock is another, like Mokros, who is not of the hall, but utilizes it occasionally. But his word is good, and so is his gold. He paid for protection, and such he will get. My advice is not to let anyone else in this room know you seek him, and to find some other means to trace his whereabouts, or be prepared to meet two of the hall's most reputable mercenaries, and one of the most feared assassins, no less than one minute after you leave this place. He bowed. Please have refreshments as my guest. He signaled a small man and said something to him, indicating that a round of drinks should be produced. Should you need quarters for a time, you'll find us reasonable. If not, I trust you'll enjoy yourself as long as you're here, and return to us soon. He bowed, tipping his white hat, and left to return to the bar and his conversation with a four-eyed man, who had just returned from whatever errand he had been on. Blood let out his breath in a dramatic fashion. What do you choose to do? he asked. I intend to keep looking. I mean Pug no harm. Would he think that? We've never met. I know him by name only. But he would not think me dangerous, I know. I've never met him either, but John recognized his name instantly. That means his reputation is spreading, and for that to occur in the hall, one must possess a significant level of gifts. For him to worry about being followed... He shrugged. Miranda was inclined to take Boldar at face value, and nothing he had said was inclining her to suspect him. 
Still, the stakes were too high for her to take chances. She said, if he doesn't want to be followed, enough to take such precautions, how would one follow his trail? Boldire blew out his cheeks. There are several oracles. I have consulted with the oracle of Aal. If she doesn't know, then none of them do, he observed. There's the toy maker. Who is he? A creator of devices, several of which may be used to spy out people who don't wish to be seen. But he is somewhat mad and therefore undependable. Who else? The waiter appeared with a round of drinks, placing a frosty mug of something that looked like ale before Boldar, and a large crystal goblet before Miranda. He made a show of unfolding napkins and placing one in Miranda's lap and the other in Boldar's. He said, Compliments of my master, and withdrew. The wine was delicious, and Miranda drank deeply, discovering she was quite thirsty and hungry. There's Quarrel Doggett, said Boldar. He deals in information. The more improbable, the better he likes it, as long as it's true. For that reason, he's a full cut above the average rumor monger hereabouts. Miranda picked up her napkin to blot her lips, and a folded piece of paper fell to the floor. She looked down, then at Boldar, who bent over and picked it up. He handed it to her, unopened. She took it and unfolded it to find a single word. Who's Mustafa? she asked. Boldar slammed his hand down upon the table. The very fellow we must see. He glanced around and said, Up there, pointing to the gallery. He rose and Miranda followed. They wended their way through the press of tables and alien bodies. Reaching a stairway, they climbed to the first of the two overhanging galleries. Miranda was surprised to discover that the gallery was but one side of a wide promenade, which had large corridors stretching away. Is all this part of the inn? Boldar said, Certainly. How big is it? Only Honest John knows for certain. He let her past booths offering all manner of goods and services, several lewd, a score or more clearly illegal anywhere Miranda had ever been, and many incomprehensible. Rumor has it that John was a barkeep on his home world who was run out of his birth city over some dispute. A roving band of some sort of aboriginal people chased him, and he blundered into the entrance to the hall. As fate would have it, he appeared in the hall in the midst of a battle. It has been said that, not knowing any better, he jumped into the void opposite the door he had entered, discovering the first entrance into the stable place in which the inn is now housed. Boldar moved down a side corridor. He blundered around in a strange darkness, then somehow found his way back to the hall, moving back to his home world once he was certain the aborigines were gone and returning to his birth city. Over the years he came back to the hall, exploring and trading. When he finally had some sense of the society within the hall, he decided the inn was what would make him rich. He made some deals, hired some workers, and returned here to establish his small inn. He's added on to it over the years, until now it's a small township. Whenever he adds on to the building, he encounters no limit to the size he can increase his holdings, or at least not so far. Has it? What? Made John rich? Boldar laughed, and again Miranda was struck by how boyish the mercenary looked. I suspect that by any reasonable measure John is the richest man in creation. He could buy and sell worlds, should he choose. But like most of us, he's found that after a while... Riches are only a means to keep oneself amused, or to keep tally on how well one does in the various games and transactions in the hall. Reaching the doorway, hung with the curtain, Boldar called, Mustafa, are you in? Who wants to know? That got a laugh from Boldar, who swept aside the curtain, indicating Miranda should enter. She did, and found herself inside a small room with but a single table, upon which a solitary candle burned. Otherwise, the room was without distinction, no wall hangings or other furniture, just another door in the wall facing the one through which they'd entered. A man stood behind the table, his face nearly black, like aged and oiled leather. A white beard adorned his cheeks and chin, though his upper lip was shaven, and his head was covered with a green turban. He bowed. Peace be upon you, he said in the language of the Jalpur. Upon you be peace entered Miranda. You seek Pug of Stardark? he asked. Miranda nodded. Glancing at Boldar, she raised an eyebrow in question. Boldar said, Mustafa is a fortune teller. Mustafa said, You must first cross my palm with gold. 
He held out his hand. Miranda reached into her belt and withdrew a coin, placing it upon his hand. He put it in his own belt pouch without looking at it. What do you seek? I just told you. Mustafa said, You need to say it aloud. Fighting off irritation at what she thought was needless show to convince gullible travelers, Miranda said, I need to find Pug of Stardock. Why? Miranda said, That is my business, but the need is great. Many look for this man. He has taken precautions against being followed by those he would rather not encounter. How may I know you are not such a one? Miranda said, one may vouch for me, but he is back upon the world of Midkemia. Tomas, friend of Pug. The dragon rider, Mustafa nodded. That is a name few would know who meant to harm Pug. Where might I find him? He seeks alliances and goes to speak with the gods. Seek him in the celestial city, in the hall of the gods awaiting. Miranda said, How do I get there? Return to Medchemia, answered Mustafa, and get you to the land of Novendus. In the great mountains, the pillars of the stars, find the necropolis, the home of the dead gods. There, atop the peaks of the mountains, there is a hall in which those gods waiting to be reborn abide. Go there. Miranda didn't wait, but rose and left, leaving Boldar standing alone with Mustafa. After a second, Boldar said, Is this true? Or are you doing one of your carnival acts? Mustafa shrugged. I don't know if it's true. That's just what I was paid to say. Who paid you? Pug of Stardock. The old man took off his turban, revealing a nearly bald pate. Scratching his head, he said, I suspect it's probably another false lead. I have the distinct impression this Pug is a man who doesn't wish to be found. Baldar said, This gets interesting. I think I'll catch up with her and see if she needs help. Mustafa shook his head and said, Find him or not, I have a feeling she's going to need a great deal of help before this is over. Some idiot left open a critical gate to the demon realm, and a couple of realities could be in jeopardy as a result. He yawned. Baldar was about to ask what that meant, but considered Miranda getting too far ahead, so he said nothing and left. A moment after Boldar left, the other door opened, and a man stepped through. Small but striking, he had dark hair and eyes and a closely trimmed beard, and wore a simple robe of black. He reached into a pouch at his belt and pulled out some gold coins. Handing them to Mustafa, he said, Thank you. You did well. Any time. What are you going to do now? I think I'll go set up a small test. Mustafa said, Well, enjoy yourself. And let me know how the situation with the demon realm turns out. Things could get busy around here if they get loose. I will. Goodbye, Mustafa, said the man as he began to move his hands. Goodbye, Pug, responded Mustafa. But by the time he had spoken, Pug of Stardock had vanished from sight. Fourteen. Journey. Eric dismounted. Rue grabbed the reins of Eric's and Billy's horses and led them away. Eric and Billy ran forward, weapons at the ready, while the maneuver was repeated up and down the line. Since leaving Brex at Shingazi's landing two weeks before, Callus had been drilling the men continually. They were now being trained as a mounted infantry. At the first sign of attack, one man in three would lead the horses to be staked behind the line, while the other two made a defensive position where instructed. The men had complained about this, saying it made no sense to leave a perfectly good horse and get down to fight. But the complaints had fallen on deaf ears. Nacor had laughed it off, saying only, Man and horse gives a much bigger target than man on foot hiding behind a rock. The drills were becoming second nature to Eric and the others, who now waited to see what would happen next. Sometimes nothing. Other times, Atonis's company of clansmen from the city of the Serpent River would attack, and the results could be painful. The drills were conducted using heavy wooden swords, weighted with lead rods that were twice the heft of a normal short sword. Eric swore his own sword was feather light in his hand after weeks of drilling with the false swords, which he supposed was the point of it all, but the wooden swords could leave heavy welts and even break bones, and the clansmen from the city of the Serpent River seemed to take delight in embarrassing Callus's company. Eric didn't understand the politics of this strange land. He knew that Callus and Hatonis were old friends, or at least friendly acquaintances, 
but the other men from that distant city seemed either suspicious or contemptuous of Callus's men. He asked and was told by one of the soldiers from Callus's last voyage that clan warriors simply didn't have much use for mercenaries. Eric took this to mean that only a few leaders, such as Atonis, knew of their real purpose in coming to this distant land. Eric heard a rattle behind him, and knew that Rue had returned and was laying down the odd short spears they had picked up at Brex. Soft iron, they were designed to be thrown at charging opponents, either injuring them or fouling their shields. Once they struck something, they were useless, as they bent easily, so the enemy couldn't throw them back. A shout went up from a crest nearby, and suddenly it was raining arrows. Eric raised his shield, crouching low behind it, and felt two shafts strike and shatter on the heavy metal and wood. A curse nearby told Eric that Luis hadn't been as fortunate and had been struck by the dull point of a practice shaft. Not lethal, these shafts nevertheless stung when they struck, and occasionally they could cause real injury. Then another shout signaled the charge, and Eric rose, gripping one of the heavy iron spears. Ready? shouted De Longville. As the charging clansmen came near, Eric tensed, and as if reading his mind, De Longville shouted, Wait for it! As the clansmen bore down upon them, the men of Callus's company waited until De Longville shouted, Throw! And Eric and the others motioned, throwing the pylum, as the short, soft spear was known in the Quagan tongue. Having no practice pylum to use, they couldn't throw the weapon, so after pantomiming a cast, each man dropped his spear next to where they waited, and with a few audible groans, readied the ponderous practice swords. Eric recognized the man bearing down on him, a large, somber fellow named Pataki. Eric braced himself and let the man throw the first blow, which he easily caught on his shield. He stepped slightly to his left and threw a roundhouse blow with his sword that got over the top of Pataki's shield and caught him behind the head. Eric winced, for he knew the blow must hurt, despite the helm the other man wore. Glancing around, he saw that his companions were easily repulsing the attackers, and within a minute the clansmen threw down their swords and removed their helms in the mercenaries' sign of surrender. A few of Callus's company cheered the victory, but the majority were content to stand motionless for a few minutes. Riding most of the day, then suddenly fighting a battle, even if only a mock skirmish, took its toll. Most of the men learned to steal rest whenever it was possible, even if only for a minute. All right, shouted Foster. Pick him up. Eric got his practice sword under one arm and was starting to retrieve his pylum when he heard Billy say, This one's not moving. Eric saw that Pataki was still lying face down in the dust. Rue was the first to reach him and rolled the bulky man over. He then leaned over and after a moment said, He's still breathing, but he's out cold. The Longville hurried over. What's this? Eric picked up his pylum. I caught him on the back of the head. I hit him harder than I intended, I guess. You guess, said the Longville, his eyes narrowing as if he was about to launch into another reprimand. Suddenly he grinned and said, That's my lad. He told Rue, Toss some water on him and get your kit together. Rue rolled his eyes heavenward and hurried to where the horses were picketed. He fetched a water skin and doused the motionless man. Pataki came awake, spitting out the water, and once he had regained his feet, returned to his own company. Eric carried his set of pylum, practice sword, and shield to where the horses were waiting. He loaded up his equipment, then waited for Rue to catch up. When the shorter man returned, he said, You really caught him with that headshot. You saw? I wasn't occupied at the moment. The fellow who came at me was blindsided by Billy, so I had nothing to do. You could have lent me a hand, Eric said. As if you needed one, said Rue. You're turning into something of a terror with that practice sword. Maybe you want to keep with it when the real fighting starts. You can bludgeon with it better than most men can cut. Eric half smiled and shook his head. Maybe I'll find one of those big dwarven warhammers and smash rocks, too. Mount, came the order from Foster, and with accompanying groans the men complied. Moving into position, Eric and Rue fell in with Chopee, Vigo, Luis, and Billy. The company waited. Then came the order to ride. There was at least another hour of daylight before they'd be ordered to make camp, and that would entail another two hours of work. Eric glanced at the sun, an angry red globe lowering in the west, and said, It's too damn hot for this time of year. From behind him, Callus said, The seasons are reversed here, Eric. It's winter in the kingdom, but it's early summer here. The days are getting longer and hotter. Wonderful, said Eric, too tired to wonder how the captain had come to be riding next to him. When we spar with the clansmen, said Callus with a faint smile, try to be a little more subdued with them. Pataki's a nephew of Regan, the Lion Clan chieftain. If you'd broken his head, it would have strained things a bit. I'll try to remember, Captain, 
said Eric, without humor. Callus set heels to his horse and moved toward the head of the line. Rue said, Was he joking? Who cares, said Billy Goodwin. It's too hot, and I'm too tired to worry about it. Figo, who rode next to Billy, said, Not strange. What? asked Rue. The sun's so red, but it's another hour or more to sunset. Looking toward the west, they nodded. What could be causing it? asked Luis from his place behind Bigot. Smoke, answered a clansman who was riding past. Word came last night that Kaipur was falling. That must be it burning. Rue said, But that's hundreds of miles from here. At least that's what the captain said. Show P spoke softly. Very big fire, was all he said. The training wore on, and Eric and the others no longer had to think about what to do. They just did it. Even the routine of building fortifications every night became commonplace. Eric ceased being astonished at how much work the seventy-five men could accomplish. Once the routine was established, Callas and DeLongville would disrupt it, seeking to keep the men constantly alert. As the days wore on, Eric thought it unnecessary. Riders came and went as messages were carried from various agents Callas had established over the years. Rather than take years to establish its control over the surrounding countryside, the host of the Emerald Queen was driving on the city of Lanada. Riding in the second company, Eric heard Callus speak to Hatonis and one of the riders who had just brought that news. It was seven years between the fall of Sulth and the assault on Hamsa. Hatonis said, Thought the invaders had to fight through the forest of Irabek. Three years between Hamsa and Kilbar. Then a year between Kilbar and Kaipur. Callus nodded. As they control more of the continent, they seem more intent on accelerating their advance. The Longville speculated, Maybe the army's getting too big to control, and its generals have to keep it busy with conquest. Callus shrugged. We need to change our line of march. To the rider, he said, Rest with us tonight, and tomorrow return north. Carry word to the Deshande. We will not be coming their way. We are going to leave the Serpent River and turn straight west. Pass the word to those who seek us that we are going to attempt to intercept the invaders between Kaipur and Lanada. Look for us at the mercenaries' rendezvous. Eric and the others turned to look across the Serpent River, where in the distance they saw a vast valley of forests and meadows, and beyond that a small range of mountains. They would have to cross the river, ride through that, and once across the mountains, down into the riverlands of the Vedra. The Longville said, Do we turn around for the crossing point at Brex? Callus said, No, it would lose us too much time. Send scouts ahead and find us a place to cross. The Longville ordered riders forward, and two days later they reported a broadening of the river, for the current was slow enough that rafting might be possible. Callus reached that point and agreed it was worth the try. He ordered the men to cut what little growth there was along the river to make a set of small rafts. A dozen men, including Eric and Bigot, made the treacherous crossing, holding their way from one side to the other, carrying lines that would be used to get the others across. On the far bank, the dozen men cut enough trees of a size to lash together logs into four rafts, each large enough to hold four horses. The horses, for the most part, cooperated, though one raft was lost on the second to the last trip as a line parted and the logs broke apart. The horses and men jumped into the water as the raft disintegrated, and all the men were pulled out downstream, but only one horse made it to the shore. There were sufficient remounts so that the losing of three horses was not a serious deprivation, but the thought of the animals drowning bothered Eric. He found that disturbing, for the specter of battle and men dying held no pain for him, but the idea of a horse, terrified as it was being swept downriver, made him very sad. The valley swept from the fork in the river to the west, ending in a series of rising meadows, until at last they would have to crest the ridge of mountains. On the tenth day of the march, a scout returned to tell Callus of a party of hunters he had encountered ahead. Eric, Rue, and four other men were sent ahead with Foster to negotiate with the hunters. Eric was grateful for anything that broke the monotony of the march. Every day had been toil without respite. As much as he enjoyed horses and working with them, Eric had never been a great rider. He found twelve hours in the saddle, interrupted only by walking beside the horses to rest them, making and breaking camp, mock combats, and a steady diet of dried rations more drudgery than even his worst days at the forge. The countryside was sloping hills, all moving quickly up into peaks and crests. The mountains of this region topped out at a lower elevation than the biggest Eric was used to at home. But there were far more of them here. 
The three major peaks of Darkmoor were surrounded by many hills, but otherwise few true mountains. Mostly they were high plateaus and sloping hillsides. But here, while modest in altitude, the mountains were plentiful and steep, with quickly rising buttes and prominences, dead-end valleys and box canyons, hard granite cut by streams and rivers. The trees grew in abundance, and none of the surrounding peaks rose high enough above the timber line to give them a clear point of reference as they traveled through the dense woods. Eric suspected this range of mountains might prove a hazard as well as an inconvenience. The hunters were waiting at the agreed-upon location. Eric reined in as Foster dismounted, removed his sword belt, and approached with his hands open. Eric studied the hunters. They were hill people, dressed in fur-covered vests and long woolen trousers. Eric suspected there were herds of sheep or goats secreted away in the local meadows. Each man carried an efficient-looking bow, not quite as impressive as the kingdom longbow, but clearly powerful enough to kill a man or bear, as well as a deer. The leader was a grey-bearded man who stepped forward to speak with Foster, while the other three stood motionless. Eric glanced around and saw no sign of any horses. These men hunted on foot. Given the terrain, Eric judged that more sensible than trying to convince a horse to act like a donkey or goat. If the hunter's village was any higher up the slopes, horses would be less than an inconvenience. They'd be a danger. Two of the other men bore a strong resemblance to the leader, while the third appeared like him in manner only. Eric guessed they were a family, with the odd man perhaps being married to a daughter. Foster nodded, reached into his tunic, and pulled out a heavy purse. He counted out some gold pieces and returned to where Rue held his mount. You men wait here. With a motion of his head, he made it clear that they were to keep the hunters from running off with the gold he just gave them. I'll bring up the rest of the company. These fellows have a way over the mountains that's safe for the horses. Eric glanced at the steep rise of the landscape before him and nodded. I hope so. While they waited, the hunters talked among themselves. The one who didn't resemble the other three listened as the leader spoke. Then, without comment, he turned and began to trot toward the tree line. One of the soldiers, a man named Greeley, shouted, Where does he think he's going? The hunter stopped. Greeley's command of the local language, learned on ship and while traveling, was better than Eric's, but his accent obviously struck the hillmen as odd enough that they looked puzzled by the question. The leader looked at him. Do you think treachery? Seeing that all four hunters were ready to unsling bows and start firing if the wrong answer was forthcoming, Eric glanced at Rue. Suddenly Rue said, He's sending his son-in-law home to tell his wife and daughter that he and his sons won't be home for supper tonight, am I right? The lead hunter nodded once and waited. Greeley said, Well, I guess that's all right. The leader made a curt gesture, and the fourth hunter began trotting off again. Then the leader of the hunter said, And tomorrow, too. It's a harsh two days over the ridge, with no easy time going down the day after. But once on the trail, you'll have that well enough without my help. He leaned upon his bow once more. About fifteen minutes of silence followed, then the sound of horses approaching from the rear heralded Callus and his company's approach. Callus rode at the head of the company, and when he pulled up, he spoke rapidly to the hunter. The exchange was so quick and heavily accented that Eric couldn't follow most of it. But in the end, Callus seemed satisfied and turned to the others, who were still riding up behind. This is Curzon and his sons. They know a trail over the ridge and down into the Vedra River Valley. It's narrow and difficult. For two hours they followed the hunters along a narrow trail, winding up into the hills. The way was dangerous enough that they took it at a slow pace, since any mistake could cause an injury to horse and rider. After reaching a small meadow, the hunter turned to confer with Callus. Callus nodded, then said, We'll camp now and leave at first light. Suddenly De Longville and Foster were shouting orders, and Eric and Rue were snapping to without thought. Getting the horses in picket, unsaddled and placed so they could crop the long grass, proved more time-consuming than if they had simply been staked out in a line and had fodder carried to them. By the time Eric and the others in charge of the horses were finished, the rest of the company had already dug most of the moat, throwing up dirt on four sides in a breastwork. Eric grabbed the shovel and jumped down next to the others. Quickly the defense was made ready. The drop gate was assembled, interlocking planks of wood carried on a baggage animal that, when run out, served as a broad bridge over the trench. Then Eric climbed out, as others were doing, on the short side of the trench, walked to the gate and crossed over, and began tamping the earth of the breastwork. Rue came over with a set of iron-tipped wooden stakes, which he inserted at a set distance along the top of the breastwork. Then they hurried to join with the rest of the men and erect their six-man tent, fashioned with interwoven pieces of fabric, one section carried by each man. They placed their bedrolls inside and returned to the commissary area, where soup was being boiled. On the march, they ate dried bread and fruits, with vegetable soups whenever possible. 
At first Eric and some others grumbled over the lack of meat in the diet, but he now found he agreed with the older soldiers that heavy food weighed them down in the field. He knew that while the thought of a steaming roast or a joint of mutton or his mother's meat pies could make his mouth water, he hadn't felt stronger in his life. Wooden bowls were handed out, and each man came away with a steaming helping of stewed vegetables, with just enough beef suet and flour to give it some texture. Sitting near the campfire, Rue said, I'd love some hot bread to soak this up with. Foster, who was walking by, said, People in the lower hills would love a cool drink of water, me lad. Enjoy what you have. Tomorrow we're on trail rations. The men groaned. The dried fruit and hardtack was nourishing, but almost tasteless, and a man could seemingly chew for hours without making the mess any easier to swallow. What Eric found himself missing most was wine. Growing up in Darkmoor, he had taken wine for granted. The quality of the wine made in the region was near legendary, and this made even the cheapest plonk drunk at meals by the commoners a cut above the usual. Until he reached Crondor, he had no idea that wine that was too inexpensive to justify transport would have earned a fair return in the taverns and kitchens of the Princess City. He remarked on this to Rue, who said, That might be just the ticket for an enterprising lad such as myself. He grinned, and Eric laughed. Bigger, who was sitting on the other side of the fire, said, What? You're going to truck bottles of the stuff into Crondor and lose money? Rue narrowed his gaze. After my father-in-law, Helmut Grindel, advances me enough gold to work with, I have a plan that will put good wine on every table in the Western realm. Eric laughed. You haven't even met the girl. She may be married with a brace of children by the time you return. And Jerome Handy said, If you return. They fell silent. Horses are contrary creatures, thought Eric as he blinked dust out of his eyes. He had been given the responsibility of herding the remounts over the mountains and had picked a half dozen of the better riders to ride herd. One surprise had been Nacor volunteering. Most men would find riding behind the herd, drag as the position was called, choking on their dust, poor duty. But the chronically curious Isolani found the entire process fascinating, and it turned out, to Eric's relief, that the man was a competent enough horseman. Twice horses had been content to walk down a bluff that would have taken them to a place where they would either have to back up, one of the least favored choices of most horses, or learn to fly, which Eric judged even less likely. Whoa! he shouted at one particularly troublesome horse who was determined to walk off the mountain. He shied a rock at her, which bounced off her right shoulder, turning her in the direction he wanted. Stupid bitch! he shouted. Trying to turn yourself into crow bait? Nacor rode closer to the edge than any sane man was like to do, and seemed ready to somehow will his horse into flight, so he could interpose himself between a horse bolting the wrong way and thin air. Whenever Eric mentioned he might come in a bit, the little man just grinned and told him everything was fine. She's in season. Mares get very stupid when in heat, he observed. She's not overly bright even when she's not ready to breed. At least we have no stallions along. That would make life interesting. I had a stallion once said Nacor, a great black horse keeping me by the interest of great cash. Eric regarded the man. That's interesting. Like the others who had gotten to know Nacor, he was reluctant to call him a liar. So much of what he said was highly improbable, but he never said he could do anything he couldn't back up, so the men had come to take most of what he claimed at face value. The horse died, Nacor said. Good horse. Sorry to see him go. Ate some bad grass, got colic. A shout from ahead warned Eric the herd was bunching up, and he sent Billy Goodman forward to help keep the horses moving through a narrow defile that cut across the ridge of the mountains. Once through that, they would be heading downward into the valley of the Vedra River. Eric shouted for Billy to come back to the rear and ride drag while he urged his own horse on to the head of the thirty horses that served as the company's remounts. A balky gelding was trying to turn around, and Eric used his own horse to push the recalcitrant animal into the gap and then the horses were moving in orderly fashion. Eric pulled up and waited for the rest of the animals to pass, then joined again with Billy and Acor in back. Downhill from here, said Billy. Suddenly, Acor's mare took a bite at Billy's horse, and his animal reared. Acor shouted, Look out! Billy lost his grip on his reins and fell backwards and landed hard on the ground. Eric jumped down from his animal and ran over while Billy's horse ran after the herd. Leaning over, he saw Billy staring up into the sky. His head rested upon a large rock while a crimson pool spread behind him. Nacor shouted, How is he? Eric said, He's dead. There was a moment of silence. Then Nacor said, I'll follow the horses. You bring him along to where we can bury him. 
Eric stood up, started to reach down to grab Billy, and suddenly remembered having to pick up Tyndall's body. Oh, damn, he said as tears came unbidden to his eyes. He found himself trembling as he realized that of those who had been sentenced to hang that day, Billy was the first to die. Oh, damn, he repeated as he stood clenching and unclenching his fists. Why? he asked the fates. One moment Billy had been sitting astride his horse, the next he was dead. And nothing more important than a stupid, poorly trained gelding shying from a bite by a mare in heat had cost it. Eric didn't know why he suddenly felt so sad at Billy's death. He felt his body tremble and realized he was afraid. Sucking down a lungful of air, he closed his eyes and bent and picked up Billy. The body was surprisingly light. He turned and moved to his own horse, who started to shy as he approached. Whoa! he commanded, almost yelling, and the horse obeyed. He lifted Billy across the horse's neck and the front of the saddle, then swung up behind. Sliding into the saddle, he lifted Billy enough so that he could rest him as much as possible across his upper thighs so the horse could manage the weight. Slowly, he moved after the distant herd. Damn, he whispered again as he willed his fear and anger back deep inside himself. A man named Notombi, with a heavy Keshian accent, was moved into their tent, taking Billy's place. The five remaining members of Eric's company were cordial but distant. While he was an outsider, his training made him mesh quickly, knowing exactly which duties to perform without being told. Two days after crossing the ridge of the mountains, Curzon and his sons pointed the way down and returned to their hunting. Callus paid them off in gold and bade them farewell. Eric returned to the routine of travel, though the difficult descent into the hills west of the mountains gave little time for reflection. He buried all his memories of his feelings at Billy's death and continued as before. Five days after crossing the mountains, they encountered a difficult rise. Eric went ahead with Callus to scout out a clear trail before allowing the full company to proceed. Turning around nearly seventy-five riders and another thirty remounts was tricky business under the best of conditions. In tight quarters, it was nearly impossible. Reaching a crest, they reined in, and Eric exclaimed, For God's weep! In the distance, to the north, the great tower of smoke that had been turning the sun red could now be seen. How far is that? asked Eric. Still more than a hundred miles distant, answered Callus. They must be burning every village and farm within a week's ride of Kaipur. The wind's blowing at east, else we'd be tasting that soot as well as seeing it. Eric's eyes stung slightly. I'm feeling it now. Callus smiled his strange half-smile. It would be worse if you were closer. Riding back, they found an easier trail than the first, and as they moved toward the company, Eric said, Captain, what are our chances of getting home? Callus laughed, and Eric turned to regard him. You're the first with the grit to come out and ask. I was wondering who it would be. Eric said nothing. Callus said, I think our chances of getting home are as good as we can make them. Only the gods know just how mad this plan is. Why couldn't you sneak one man in, have him look around, then sneak him out? Good question, said Callus. We tried several times. He glanced around as he rode, as if scouting was a habit. This land is a land of few standing armies, as we know them in the kingdom and cash. Here you're either a swordsman for your family or clan, or you're in the palace guard of some city ruler, or you're a hired sword. Mercenary armies are the rule. I would think that with hired swords on both sides, it would be easy enough to slip a man across the lines. Callus's expression showed it was a fair observation. One would think that. But a single man attracts notice, especially one who is ignorant of basic customs and attitudes. But a company of freebooters from a distant land? That's not unusual in these parts. And reputation counts for much. So, I am Callus, and we're the Crimson Eagles, and no one looks twice at an elf living among humans here. A long-lived leading such a company is rare, but not unheard of. You would be found out by magic or treachery were you to come here alone, Eric. But as a member of my company, no one will pay you the least heed. He said nothing for a while, looking down on the rolling hills that led down to the river. After a while, he said, This is a beautiful land, isn't it? Eric said, Yes, it seems so. Callus was silent for a moment, then said, Twenty-four years ago, I came to this country for the first time, Eric. I have been back twice since then, once with my own army. I have left graves behind me in numbers you can't imagine. I overheard the Longville and Nacor back on Sorcerer's Isle, admitted Eric, as he reined his horse around for better footing on the trail. It sounded terrible, it was. 
Many of the kingdom's best soldiers died on that march. Hand picked men. Foster, de Longueville, and a few others were able to escape with me, and only because we took a chance and went where the enemy didn't expect us to go. Callus was again silent a moment. That's why I agreed with Bobby's plan and convinced Arutha that only men desperate to stay alive would serve. Soldiers are all too willing to die for the colors, and we need men who would do everything in their power to stay alive, sort of betraying us. Eric nodded. And soldiers don't make convincing mercenaries. That, too. You're going to meet some men who will change your thinking about what humanity is capable of. And you won't be better for knowing them. He looked at Eric as if studying him. You're part of an odd lot. We searched for those things in each man that would give us all the chance of blending in. An ability to be violent, no pretension of ideals, just men who are as rough as those we must go among. But we also needed men who were more than a common scum the tides of battle usually wash ashore. We needed men who, when it came time, would answer the call rather than run. He smiled, and it was a smile of genuine amusement. Or at least they would run in the proper direction and keep their wits about them. As if a thought struck him for the first time, he said, I think I had better keep you and your company close by. Most of the men we've selected are cutthroats who would happily kill their grannies to earn a gold piece. But your little band numbers some of our oddest characters. If your friend Bigo starts talking about the Death Goddess, who is a figure of terror in this land, named Kali Shi, and who is only worshipped in secret, or if Shou Pi starts discussing philosophy with some of the blood drinkers we're going to hook up with, we'll have hell to pay. I'll tell De Longville when we camp tonight that your six is to be billeted closest to my tent. Eric fell silent. He was surprised that Callus knew enough about them as individuals to know about Bigot's theories on the Death Goddess, or Chopin's odd view of things. And he didn't know if being close to the captain, to Longville and Foster, was a comfort or nuisance. Days of cautious travel at last brought them to rolling lowlands. Then, on the fifth day after leaving the mountains, they approached a village, one that sat athwart the major north-south road between Lanara and Kaipur. They found the houses abandoned, for the presence of a company of armed men usually meant a raid in this land. Callus waited an hour in a small town square, his men tending their horses with water from the well, but otherwise leaving everything untouched. A young man in his early twenties appeared from hiding in a stand of trees close by. What company? he called out, ready to duck back into the sheltering copse at the first sign of trouble. Callus's Crimson Eagles. What village is this? We not. Whom do you serve? The man, eyeing Callus suspiciously, said, Are you pledged? We are a free company. That answer didn't seem to sit well with the villager. He spoke softly, conferring with someone hidden behind him. Then at last he said, We tie the priest-king of Lanada. Where lies Lanada from here? A day's ride south along that road, came the answer. Callus turned to de Longville. We are farther south than I wanted to be, but the army will catch up with us sooner or later. Uh, grind over us, answered Longville. Make camp tonight in that meadow over to the east, instructed Callus. Turning to the still half-hidden villager, he said, We'll need a market. I need feed, grain for bread, chickens if you have any, fruit, vegetables, and wine. We are poor. We have little to share, said the man, backing deeper into the shadow of the trees. Eric's squad was stationed right behind Callus, and Bigger, who had listened to the exchange, whispered to Eric, I'm a monk of dollar. This is rich land, and those beggars have whatever they own stashed away somewhere in those woods. Louise leaned down from where he still sat his horse and said, And we are probably being watched over a half dozen hours. Callus called out, We'll pay in gold. He reached into his tunic, pulled out a small purse, and turned it over, emptying a dozen pieces of gold onto the ground. As if signaled, a score of men appeared, all holding weapons. Eric studied them, making a comparison to the townspeople he had grown up with. These were farmers, but they also held their weapons in a sure-handed fashion. These men had to fight to keep what was theirs, and Eric was glad that Callus was the sort of leader who paid for what he needed, rather than taking it. The leader, an older man with a limp who carried a large sword strapped across his back, knelt and picked up the gold pieces. "'You'll burn the piece?' he asked Callus. "'Done,' said Callus throwing the reins of his horse to Foster. He held out his arm, and the village leader gripped his wrist, as Callus gripped in return. They shook twice and let go. 
Abruptly, the trees emptied of men, followed a short time after by women and children. Before Eric's eyes, he saw a market take form in the small square of the village. Rue said, I don't know where they kept all this, as he motioned to pots of honey, jars of wine, and baskets of fruit that seemed to have materialized out of nowhere. Get raided often and often. I expect you'll learn how to hide things in a hurry, fellow me lad, observed Vigo. Plenty of basements with hidden traps and false walls in those buildings, I'm thinking. Chopee, who motioned for the others to follow to where camp was being set up, said, They have the look of fighting men, those farmers. Eric agreed. I think we're in a beautiful but very harsh land. They picketed their horses, were instructed by Corporal Foster, then began the routine of making camp. They rested while Callus waited. What he was waiting for wasn't clear to Eric and the others, and Callus wasn't taking them into his confidence. The villagers were guarded in dealing with the mercenaries, approachable but not warm. There was no inn, but one of the local merchants had erected a pavilion and served average quality wine and ale. Foster warned against any public drunkenness, promising a flogging to any man who couldn't pull his weight the next morning because of a thick head. Each day brought more drills and new practices. For three days they worked on holding their shields above their heads while moving heavy objects about. Foster and DeLongville stood on top of a hillock nearby, throwing rocks into the air so they would fall straight down on the drilling men, reminding them to keep their shields up. After a week had passed, one of the guards set at the north end of the town cried out, Riders! Foster barked out orders for the men to get ready, and practice swords were discarded, replaced by steel. Those men selected as bowmen hurried to a position overlooking the town, under Foster's command, while DeLongville and Callus moved the rest of the company to defensive positions at the north end of the village. Callus moved to where Eric and his companions waited and said, They're coming fast. Eric squinted and saw a half-dozen men racing down the road that led into the village. As they drew near, they reined in, probably having seen a glint of metal or the movement of men. Vigo said, They're not so quick to come rushing in now that they know we're here. Eric nodded. Rue said, Look over there. Eric turned to where Rue pointed, back into the village, and was astonished to see it was once again deserted. They do know how to make themselves scarce, don't they? The riders began to trot toward the village, and when they were close enough to be seen clearly, Kala shouted, Raji! The leader waved and spurred his horse into a canter while his companions followed. As they neared, Eric saw that the six men were mercenaries, or at least dressed as such, and that the man in the van was easily the ugliest person he had ever seen. A face like seamed leather was dominated by an improbably large nose and a huge brow. His long hair, mostly gray, was tied back. He rode poorly. His hands were far too busy, and it was irritating his horse. Getting down, the man walked toward the defensive position. Callus! Callus walked forward, and the two men embraced, with heavy back slapping on both sides. The man pushed Callus away and said, You don't look a damn day older. Curse you long-lived bastards. Steal all the pretty women, then come back and steal their daughters. Callus said, I expected to see you at the rendezvous. There isn't going to be one, the man called the Praji said. At least not where you'd expect it to be. Kaipur has fallen. So I heard. That's why you're here and not marching up the banks of the Serpent River, said Praji. Foster motioned for Eric and five other men to take the horses. As they gathered the animals, they studied the other five riders. Hard men all, they had a beaten, tired look. Praji said, We got our tails singed for sure. I barely got out with a score of our men. We got as close to the siege as we could, but the greenskins had outriders, and they came down on us hard. I didn't even have time to claim we were looking for work. No truces. You're either with them or you're attacked. He hiked the thumb at his companions. After we got loose, we split up. Half the lads went with Vaja to the Jashandi. Figured you'd be coming up that way, but in case you put in at Maharta, I was heading that way. Figured you'd send word through our agents where you were if I was wrong. Give me something to drink. My throat's coated with half the dirt between here and Kaipur. Kala said, Let's get a drink and you can tell me more. He took the man over to the pavilion, and as they moved, the villagers began to appear as if from the air. Eric and the other men, detailed to the horses, took the riders over to the remounts, and Eric inspected them all. They had been ridden hard. They were heavily lathered and breathing deep. He unsaddled the horse he led and told the other men to start walking the animals. They needed an hour's cooling at least, he judged before they could be allowed to eat or drink, lest they become colicky. 
After the horses were cooled, Eric staked them out and rubbed them down, checking to make sure none was injured or coming up lame. When he was satisfied the horses were all right, he returned to his own tent. With the arrival of the riders, order in camp was lax, and he found his five bunkmates lying on their bedrolls. He knew that it could be seconds before the order to fall was issued, so he luxuriated in the first moment he felt the bedroll under him. Napombe said, Legionnaires always grab whatever rest they can, minute to minute. Who? Oh? asked Luis. You call them dog soldiers, said the Keshian. In ancient times they were kept away from the cities, penned up like dogs, to be unleashed upon the empire's enemies. Like Jado, Natombi shaved his head, and his dark skin made the whites of his eyes and his teeth appear in stark contrast when he spoke. The nearly black irises made Eric think of deep secrets. You're a dog, then, you're saying? asked Vigo with mock innocence. The others laughed. Natombi snorted. No, stupid head, I was a legionary. He sat up on his bedroll, his head almost touching the canvas above. He placed his fist on his chest. I served with the Ninth Legion on the Auburn Deep. I've heard of those, said Luis, making a display of not being impressed by shaking his open hand back and forth. Shopee rolled over and raised up on his elbows. In my country, Kesh is the heartland of the Empire. Isolani is my nation, but we are ruled by Kesh. Those he speaks of are the heart of the army. How did one from the Legion come so far? Atombi shrugged. Bad company. Figo laughed. This isn't an improvement, I'll wager. I was serving with a patrol that was to escort a man, a very important man of the true blood. We traveled to Durban, and there I fell into disgrace. Women gambling or what? asked Figo, now genuinely interested. Natombi was something of a mystery to the others, even though they had shared the same tent with him for more than a week since Billy's death. I let the man die at the hands of an assassin. I was disgraced and fled. You let him die? asked Rue. Were you in charge? I was a captain of the Legion. And I was queen of the Midsummer Festival, said Bigo with a laugh. It's true. But now I am as you. A criminal living on time given to me by another. My life is over, and now I live another man's life. That doesn't make us particularly unique, observed Bigot. Blue said, What was it like in the Legion? Natombi laughed. You know, you live like a legionary. What do you mean? Blue looked confused. This is a Legion camp, said Natombi. It's true, agreed Chopin. The formations, the way we march, the practices. This is all of the Legion. Natombi said, This man, Callus, our captain, he is a very smart man, I am thinking. He tapped his head to make the point. This captain, he trains us to survive, for man to man there is no army on this world that can face the Legion of the Overn and survive. No army here has faced the Legions of Kesh, and when you fight someone, it's good to fight them with tactics they've never encountered before. Makes even better the chance to survive. Luis was cleaning his fingernails with his dagger. Flipping it up, he balanced it on the tip, resting lightly upon one finger point. Then he let it slip, caught it by the handle, and slammed it point first into the dirt. Watching it vibrate from the impact, he said, And that's what it's all about, isn't it, my friends? Survival. Fifteen. Village. The lookout shouted, Riders! Eric and the others moved away from their various tasks and put on their weapons. Since arriving the week before, Praji had warned Callus's men that companies fleeing the fall of Kaipur would be heading south. Twice already bands of fighters had passed, avoiding the village after having seen the fortifications Callus had ordered constructed after conferring with the villagers. Eric was uncertain if the captain intended to truly defend this village, or simply wanted to drill the men in another aspect of warcraft. Where just another village had stood, now a respectable fortification sat athwart the road. A full-scale moat had been dug around the village, with the earth from it serving as the foundation of the palisades. Two gates bound with iron had been hung, one at the north end and one at the south of the village, each securely attached to gate posts carved from the trunks of oaks from across the river. Eric had overseen the forging of the hinges, pins, and bands. The village smithy had been abandoned years before, when the last smith died, but the old forge still stood. 
Lacking a full set of Smith's tools, Eric had made do with those carried in the baggage train so he could shoe the horses. Given enough time, he could use those tools to make other tools and eventually restore the smithy completely. Each time Eric looked at the gates, he felt a sense of pride. It would take a serious siege engine to knock them down. Glancing around, he thought he'd rather attempt to breach the log wall, perhaps burning it, than to send a company against either gate while being fired upon by the men on the wall. He looked over his shoulder as he put on his armor and saw Foster and De Longville following hard on the heels of Callus as they came down from the tower that was being erected in the center of the village. This tower, built atop a huge mound of earth, when finished would give them an unobstructed view for miles and prevent any company of significant size from approaching unnoticed. Eric and Rue hurried to their appointed places, each suddenly checking to see that all weapons and supplies were where they needed to be. Rue carried a half-dozen of the heavy iron spears, and Eric found himself amazed at the wiry strength his friend had developed since they had run from Ravensburg. He felt a stab of unexpected pain at a fleeting memory of his mother and Rosalind, then let the thought go as the riders came clearly into view. It was a company of at least thirty men, all seasoned warriors by their look. At the head of the company rode a heavy-set man of middle years, his gray beard hanging down to his stomach. He signaled for a pair of his men to circle out and around the fortress, and slowed as he approached. As soon as he came within hailing distance, he shouted, Hello, the fort! From the wall, Callus shouted back, Who rides? Bill Barry's regulars, fresh from the fall of Kuiper. And glancing around, he added, Oh, what's left of us? The outriders returned, and Eric assumed they were informing their leader that it was a closed fortress, not a simple barricade. Callus called back, Who commands? I know Bill Barry, and you're not he. The leader again looked around. I guess I do. Bill Barry died at the wall. He spit and made a sign. And we took the day's grace after the fall. My name is Zila. Praji came to stand next to Callus, and Eric could hear him say, I know them. A good enough band for butchery, though I'd not want any of them sharing my bunk. They'll honor the peace of the camp, more or less. I can give you the peace of the camp, said Callus. How long? Two days, answered Callus. Fair enough, then Zila laughed. More than fair. Who commands here? I do. Callus. Callus's Crimson Eagles? asked Zila as he dismounted. The same. I heard you died at Hamsa, he said as Callus motioned for the gates to be opened. As Eric and the others waited, Foster came by and said, Stand down, but be alert. These wouldn't be the first to promise the peace of the camp, but change their minds once inside. All thought of such betrayal vanished when the company entered the village. They were beaten men. Eric noticed that several horses were injured and all were footsore. Even two days of rest would not be enough to bring some of those mounts to soundness. Eric heard Zila snort, clear his throat, and spit. Damn dust, he said. The smoke was worse. Fires from one horizon to the other. He glanced at the men of Callus's company. You did well to avoid that one. Motioning to his horse, he asked, Got a smith in your company. Callus motioned for Eric, who handed his sword and shield to Rue. Put these away from me, would you? Rue's answer was rude, but he took the armor and headed off toward their tent. Eric came up to Zila, who said, Threw a shoe somewhere along the way. She's not lame, but she's going to be. Eric only needed a glance to tell Zila was right. He picked up the horse's leg and saw that the frog of the hoof was bloody. I'll clean this and dress it. With a new shoe, packed and padded, she should be all right if you don't push her too hard. Ha! <laughs> said Zita. To Callus, he said, There's an army of thirty thousand or more coming this way. They just kicked hell out of us. Unless someone organizes a rendezvous north of here soon, we're but the first of maybe a hundred or more companies that are going to come riding this way, and most of those lads are damn out of sorts over having been butchered by the lizards. Callus said, Lizards? Zila nodded. For a drink, I'll tell you about it. Callus instructed Eric to care for the newcomer's horses, and Eric signaled the nearest men to take charge of the others as he took Zila's mount in tow. The animal was limping, and by the time they reached the pen for remounts, Eric was certain she would have been useless in another day, two at the most. The newcomers were split equally between those who were content to let Callus's men treat their animals and those who insisted on following along to ensure their animals were well cared for. Eric was completely unsurprised to see that those who came along had the best mounts. Despite the hardships, those horses were the fittest and should recover after resting up. The others were a poor lot at best, 
and Eric suspected that others besides Zilas would soon be unable to carry their riders. Eric had each horse inspected and made a mental list of which animals would be worth caring for and which would be best killed today. After conferring with a couple of the more experienced horsemen in Callus's forces, he found no argument. As he moved away, one of the newcomers approached. You. What's your name? Eric. He paused and waited to see what the newcomer had to say. Lowering his voice, the man said, Mine is Ryan. You know your way around horses. He was a large man with a flat face, reddish from the sun and covered in road dust. His eyes were dark, but his hair was reddish-brown, his beard grey-shot. He carried himself easily, one hand absently resting on a longsword. Eric nodded, but said nothing. I could use another horse. Mine will come sound if I don't ride her for another week. Do you think your captain would sell me one? I'll ask him, Eric said, and started to move off. Ryan restrained him with a gentle touch to the arm. Zena's a good enough fighter in a brawl, he whispered, but he's no proper captain. We were heading down to Maharta to seek service with a Raj. It should take the better part of the next year for that lot up north to get past Lanada. He glanced around to see if anyone else was listening. Your captain seems to know his way around the fortification, and you seem more like garrison soldiers than hired swords. Every man in Callus's company had been warned against spies, so Eric responded without having to think. I just follow orders. Captain Callus has kept every man here alive at least once, so I don't question him. You think he's got room for another sword? I'll ask. But I thought you were heading for Maharta. After the beating we took at Kaipur, you'd think a year or two of resting up and waiting might be nice. But truth to tell, there's no booty, and I get bored easily. I'll tell him that, too, Eric said, leaving the man with the horses. He moved through the village, and several of the villagers nodded greeting. Callus's men weren't treated with open fear any more, but the villagers were equally split between those happy to have their swords around for protection, as well as their gold, and those who feared that the fortification would attract unwanted attention. The village was routinely raided over the years, and the villagers had a time-tested method of fleeing into the nearby hills. Few died, if there was any advance warning. But this fortress on the road, that was both a protection and a trap. Someone called Eric's name, and he glanced over to see Embrysa, a girl of fourteen who had taken a liking to him. She was pretty in a large boned way, with pale blue eyes, her most striking feature, but Eric knew that she would be old before she was thirty, probably with three or four children and a husband who worked her from dawn to dusk. A town-bred boy, Eric had little sense of what real poverty and hard work were until he had come to this village. He spoke a quick greeting, then excused himself as he went to the pavilion that served as an inn. Rough wooden benches and tables had been fashioned by an enterprising farmer named Shabo, who had used the profits from serving Callus's men poor wine and ale to build a wooden trellis alongside his rude hut. Eric considered that if they stayed long enough, Shabo would be a proper innkeeper, as he kept using his profits to improve his little enterprise. His latest innovation had been to knock out a second door to the hut, so he could serve across a newly built bar that ran the length of the building. Eric considered the hut might get very cold during winter, though he had no idea how cold it got in these parts. Callus and Zila and some others sat at one table, while other men in Zila's company drank heavily and did indeed look like beaten men. Praji had joined Callus and was nodding as Zila said, I've seen thirty years of fighting man and boy, but nothing like this. He drained his tankard and wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. Callus raised an eyebrow at Eric, who said, Half the mounds either need a month of grazing and no work or need to be put down. The rest could be ready to be ridden if they lay up a week. Callus nodded. Zila said, We don't have much. Being on the losing side pays little. But we'll buy some mounts from you if you'll sell them. What are you planning to do? asked Callus. We're heading for Maharta. The Raj is sending his royal immortals to help the priest king of Lanada defend against the Greenskins and their army. That means his war elephants and those drug-crazed maniacs of the priest king are on the same side for a change. Praji said, Things must be grim to make those two old enemies take the same cause. Zila waved for another tankard, and Shabo hurried over to replace the empty one. Yes, but it also means the Raj will need more fighters to keep peace around his city, so there will be work for us. I could use a couple of years of keeping farmers in line after what we just went through. He looked at Praji and Callus. You say you were at Hansa? Yes, they both answered. It was ten times as bad at Kaipur. Before this war began, we were like you, a company of mercenaries who plied our trade between Kaipur and the meeting place. 
Eric knew he spoke of the annual meeting of the Deshandi horsemen and other tribes who came to the boundary of the steppes to trade with the nomads of the eastern grasslands. Oh, we worked along the central Vedra. Once we even took a caravan across the plain of Jams to Palams on the Satpura River. He shook his head. But this war, this was like nothing I've seen. We signed on after the fall of Kilbar. I've heard enough from those who survived to know it was bad, but nothing prepared us for what happened at Kaipur. He stopped as if collecting his thoughts. Bilbari signed us on to ride picket and run messages. The Raj of Kaipur had one of those pretty little armies that looked so nice on parade, but he knew he needed veterans to slow down the invaders while he hired some mother killers to train his army and make real fighters out of them. My comrades and I aren't Ashanti, but we ride and fight well enough for the job. A month after we signed on, we got our first glimpse of the invaders. A company much like yours, about sixty seasoned fighters, rode skirmish against our forward position, then retreated without doing or taking much harm. We reported the contact and settled in to wait for the next assault. We woke up one day and the sky was brown with dust to the northwest. A week later, ten thousand men and horses rode into view. Zita laughed a bitter laugh. Old Bilbari messed his pants but good, and I'll tell you he wasn't the only one with brown britches that day. There were maybe two hundred of us in a fortification not as stout as this one, and it took us all of a minute to decide to get the hell out. By the time we reached the city walls, every company to the north and west of the city was also heading in. There was no fighting except at the city wall. Then from that day forward they just came at us. He glanced at the faces in the pavilion, as now every eye was upon him and every man listened closely. Some of the boys gave as good as they got, and by the third month of siege, those pretty home guard soldiers of the Raj had turned into as tough a bunch as I've seen, and they fought for their homes, so they were more motivated than we were. He fell silent. Callus said nothing for a long while, until finally he asked, When did they call for surrender? Zila looked uncomfortable. That was what caused everything to fall apart. Eric knew from what he had heard around camp that the behavior of mercenaries was strictly governed by convention and tradition. Zeeler's manner suggested something out of the ordinary had occurred. At last Callus asked, What? They didn't call for surrender. They just came to the limit of our arrows and started digging, setting up their siege trenches and readying their engines. For a week there was no real fighting, just a few shots from the walls to keep them alert. The Raj was a brave enough man for someone who had never held more than a ceremonial sword in his life. And he stood at the head of his army. Zila closed his eyes. He covered them with his hand, and for a moment Eric thought he might be weeping. When he removed his hand, Eric didn't see tears, but he did see bottled-up rage. A silly bastard stood there wearing a God's thrice damned golden crown, holding a peacock fan of office, while those lizards rode around below his walls. He commanded them to leave. Kala said, What else? He couldn't understand that this was no war out on the plain or the control of trading routes or to settle some matter of honor with the Raj of Maharta or the priest king of Lanata. He didn't understand even when they swarmed into his palace and started cutting up his wives and children in front of his eyes. Zila closed his eyes and then whispered, I don't think he understood when they hoisted him up and impaled him before his own palace. Impaled him? blurted Eric. Talos looked at him for a moment, then said, What aren't you telling? Ah, uh, it's a nasty business, said Zila. And I speak ill of the dead to repeat it, and of myself truth to tell. You're protected by the peace of the camp, reminded Praji, his ugly face turned even less appealing by dark suspicion. Did you turn coat? Zila nodded. My captain, and the others. He seemed lost in the tale, and said, You know, there are ways in and out of a city under siege, for a crafty man with enough money... The lizards didn't ask for our surrender. They just came at us again and again. The men fighting with them were worse than any I've met, and I've met some black-hearted murderers in my time. But the lizards... He took a long drink. They stand nine, ten feet tall, and they're as broad as two men across the shoulders. One blow with their sword can numb a strong man's arm to the shoulder or split a shield, and they have no fear. They didn't attack until the wall was breached. He shook his head. Until we quit the wall and gave it to them... They sent an agent who found my captain and some others and told us there would be no formal offer of truce and that after the battle those in the city would be put to the sword. They said those of us who abandoned the walls and stood aside would be free to join in the looting. Praji looked ready to attack the man as he slowly rose. He stared at Zila for a long, dark moment, then spit on the ground and left. 
Callus seemed more interested in facts than in condemning the man. What else? The captains brought the offer to us. We knew we were beaten. Every day more men and supplies would come down river to bolster them, while we grew weaker. Someone had set fire to a grain warehouse. Eric winced in anticipation. He knew that grain dust in the air could explode if touched by spark or match. That was why no fire was permitted near the mill or the grain silos near Ravensburg. Then the explosion took out half the supplies of grain as well as a block of dwellings. Someone else poisoned a good amount of the wine being harbored near the palace. And at least a score of men died screaming as they held their bellies. He closed his eyes, and this time a tear did fall, one of rage and frustration as well as regret. And their damned spellcasters. The Raj had hired his own, and some were good. A few priests were there, too, healing the wounded and sick. But the lizard magicians were stronger. Strange noises would come during battle, and a man would feel terror no matter how well the fight went. Rats came boiling out of the sewers in broad daylight to bite your ankles and climb up your legs. There were clouds of gnats and flies so thick you inhaled them, or swallowed them if you opened your mouth. Fresh bread turned moldy moments after being taken from the oven, and milk soured in the bucket below the cow. And every day the lizards dug their trenches and turned their siege engines and kept hammering at us. Zila looked around at the faces. I don't know if you'd have done different in my place, but I doubt it. His tone was defiant. My captain came to us and told us what was going to happen, and we knew he wouldn't lie to us. We knew he was no coward. He said to Callus accusingly, You said you knew him? Callus nodded. He was no coward. It was the lizards that broke the compact. They changed the rules of war. They gave us no choice. How did you escape? asked a voice from behind, and Eric turned to see de Longville, who had come up some time during the narrative. Something the lizard's agent said bothered my captain. I don't know exactly what, but I do know that when they impaled the Raj in front of his own people, they told everyone still alive that they could either sit a stake next to their former ruler or serve. You weren't given the day's grace to quit the field, said Foster from behind de Longville, and Eric stepped aside so they could see Zila better. We weren't given enough time to pick up our own kits. But Bilbari knew they were up to something, and had us gather by the smallest gate to the south. We fought our way out, and they were too busy to send anyone after us. That's where our captain died, leading us out of the city we had betrayed. Callus said, It was your captain's choice. Zita said, I'd be a liar if I told you. We're regulars, and until then every man had a contract with Bilbari. We voted on it like regulars do. How did you vote? demanded Longville. Does it matter? You're damn right it matters he answered, his face set in an angry mask. Turning coat is the lowest thing a man can do. Zila said, Every man voted to leave. Kala said, You have the peace of the camp until sunrise the day after tomorrow. See that you're gone by then. He rose, and as he left the pavilion, Eric hurried after him. Captain? Callus halted, and Eric was shocked at the anger he read in the half-elf's face. What? Some of their horses need to lie up. If they don't, Give them another couple of days, and they're useless. That's Zila and his companion's problem. Captain, I don't give a nail's head for Zila and his men. I'm thinking of the horses. Callus looked at Eric, then said, Tend the horses as best you can, but do nothing special for them. Hay and water, that's all we'll give them. What they buy from the villagers is their own business. There's a man named Ryan who wants to know if we'll take him. Says he doesn't want to lie around the harter. Callus was silent for a moment. Finally, he said, if one of those turncoats is in sight when the sun reaches the sky the day after tomorrow, he will be killed. Eric nodded and returned to the remounts. There he found Ryan and said, My captain says we have no room. The man's expression shifted, and for an instant Eric thought he'd appeal. But at last he said, Very well. Will you sell horses? Eric said, I don't think it would earn me my captain's thanks to keep you here. Lowering his voice, he said, Keep what little gold you have. Take that buckskin gelding over there. He motioned toward the horse. He's just come sound from a stocked-up leg. He got it kicking out for no damn reason at all. And he's got rocks for brains. But he's fit enough to get you out of here in two days. The man named Ryan said, I don't think I'll wait that long. My captain's dead, and so are Bill Barry's regulars with him. I'm heading south to find a billet before word gets down there. Once a man's labeled turncoat, no one will ever trust him. Eric nodded. Ziva said you had no choice. Ryan spat. A man always has a choice. Sometimes it's to die with honor or live without. But there's always a choice. That pretty Raj was a man. He might never have fought a day in his life, but when it came time to surrender, he spit over the wall. 
he cried like a baby when they hoisted him up onto the stake, and he howled like a broken-backed dog when he felt it coming up his gut. But even while he hung there with his own shit and blood running down the pole, he never asked for mercy. And if Kali she, he used the local name for the goddess of death who judges the lives of men, has any goodness in her, she'll give him another chance on the wheel. Eric said, Zelos said you were never offered the chance of surrender. Zelos a lying sack of pig guts. He was our corporal, and with the captain and sergeant dead, he thinks he's our captain. No one's killed him yet because we're all too damn tired. Come with me, said Eric. He led Ryan to the hut Callus used as his office and quarters and asked to see the captain. When Callus appeared, he looked at Ryan, then at Eric. What? I think you should hear this man out, said Eric. Turning to Ryan, he said, What about the offer to surrender? Ryan shrugged. The Raj told the lizards he would burn in hell before he'd open the gates of his city to them, but he offered any captain who wanted to quit the city the chance to leave, without pay, of course. Ryan sighed. If you knew Bill Barry, you'd know he was one greedy son of a mule. He took a bonus for staying, then made a deal with the lizards to betray the city and join in the looting. He shook his head. But that was the joke. It was the worst betrayal of all. As soon as the fire started and the looting began, they hunted down the mercenary companies one at a time. Those that stood died, and those that surrendered were given the choice of swearing service or taking the stake. No day's grace, no laying down of weapons and walking away, nothing. Serve or die. A few of us managed to get free. Callus shook his head. How could you betray your vow? I never did, said Ryan, with what was the closest to a show of emotion Eric had seen so far. He stared Callus in the eyes and repeated, I never did. We were a regular company, soldiers for life, sworn in oath as brothers. We voted, and those who voted to stay and fight were on the losing side. But we swore an oath to each other long before we took the Raj's gold. And damn me if I'd leave a brother for being wrong-headed. Then why did you seek service with us? Because Bill Barry's dead and our brotherhood is broken. He looked genuinely sad. If you knew Bill Barry, you also know he had his own way of taking care of his men. Some of us were with him ten, fifteen years, Captain. He was nobody's father, but he was everyone's eldest brother, and he'd kill the first man who harmed one of his own. I've been selling my sword since I was fifteen years old, and it's the only family I've known. But it's a dead family now. After Kaipur, no man will have us to service, and that means being a bandit or starving. What will you do? said Callus. I'd like to head out tonight and get a march on this news heading south. Maybe catch a boat out of my heart if I can't find a billet there. Head up coast to the city of the Serpent River, or down to Chattistan. Some place nobody knows me. I'll find another company who'll hire me, or a merchant needing a bodyguard. He looked to the north for a moment with a thoughtful expression. But with what's up there, I don't know that any of us can find a peaceful life anywhere. I've never seen war like this before. You saw the smoke, Captain? Callus nodded. They fired the city when they were through. I don't mean a fire here or there, but the entire city. We saw from a ridge to the south before we ran for our lives. But we saw. His voice lowered as if he was afraid someone might overhear. From one end to the other the fire burned, and the smoke rose so high it flattened and spread through the clouds like a big tent. Soot rained from the sky for days. Twenty, thirty thousand soldiers, standing shoulder to shoulder before the gates, shouting and laughing, chanting and singing as they killed those who wouldn't serve their cause. And I saw her. Who? said Callus with sudden interest. The Emerald Queen, some call her. In the distance. Couldn't see her face, but I saw a company of lizards on those damn big horses of theirs, and a big wagon bigger than anything I've ever seen before. And on the wagon was this big golden throne, and this woman sat there in a long robe. You could see the green flicker of the emeralds at her throat and wrists, and she had a crown with emeralds. And the lizards all went wild, hissing and chanting, and even some of the men, those who'd been with them long enough, they all bowed when she came by. You've been helpful, said Callus. Take a fresh horse and whatever food you need, and slip out at the guard change at sundown. Ryan saluted and left. Eric turned to leave, and Callus said, Keep what you heard to yourself. Eric nodded. Then he said, Captain, the horses? Callus shook his head. Very well. Do what you can, but nothing that diminishes our ability to care for our own animals. No medicines you can't replace. Easily replace. Eric was about to say thank you, but Callus turned and re-entered the hut, leaving him alone. After a moment, he headed back to the horses. There was a great deal of work to do, and some of Zeta's companions would be leaving on foot in two days if he didn't work miracles. Eric! Eric looked up to see Embrysa standing nearby, just outside the corral where he was examining a horse's leg, and he said, Hello. 
Shyly, she said, Can you have supper tonight? Eric smiled. The girl had asked him twice before so he could meet her father and mother. Though he already had in the market and knew them by sight, she wanted a formal meeting. It was becoming clear she had decided that Eric should court her, and he was both flattered and disturbed by the attention. She would be of marrying age in another two years in Ravensburg, but that was Ravensburg. The people here were much poorer, and children meant hands that could work at three years of age, out in the field gleaning grain that fell from the stalks as the crops were harvested, helping with the heavy work by six or seven years. A boy was a man at twelve, and a father at fifteen. He crossed to the rails and climbed over, stepping down next to her. Come here, he said quietly. She stepped closer, and he looked down and put his hand on her shoulder. He kept his voice low as he said, I like you very much. You're as nice a girl as I've met, but I'm going to be leaving soon. You could stay, she said in a rush. You're only a mercenary, and you can lead the company. A smith would be a man of importance here, and you'd quickly become a leader. Eric was suddenly aware that besides being pretty, she was also a cunning girl who had sized up the most likely man in the company to become rich, at least by village standards, should he remain in ply a trade. Isn't there a boy here? he began. No, she said, half in anger, half in embarrassment. Most of them are already married or too young. The girls outnumbered them because of the wars. Eric nodded. His own company, though composed of condemned men, numbered more than one former farmer's son who had left home to seek his fortune as a soldier or bandit. Suddenly Rue was standing beside them, and Eric knew he had overheard the entire conversation, though he pretended not to, by saying, And Brysa, I didn't see you there. How are you? Fine she said, lowering her eyes. Her sullen tone showed she wasn't. As if nothing was amiss, Rue said, Did you talk to Henrik today? Eric knew who Rue spoke of, a young man from a village not too far from Ravensburg who served with another squad, but one whom he had barely exchanged a dozen words with over the course of his travels. Henrik was a dull man with little to say. No, not today, answered Eric, wondering what Rue was leading up to. Lowering his voice, Rue said, he says he might come back here after we're done. Says he likes it and might just settle down. He looked at Embrysa. Find a wife and set up a mill. Embrysa's eyes widened. He's a miller? His father was one, or so he says. Embrysa said, oh, I must go. Sorry you can't come to supper, Eric. After the girl was gone, Eric said, Thanks. I was over there and heard what was going on, said Rue with a grin. I figure a miller is the only one likely to make more money here than a smith, so I thought I'd give your young friend another target. Eric said, Is Henrik really thinking of staying, or are you just making trouble? Well, I don't know how much trouble, given she's a saucy lass with an ample bosom and a firm young bum. If she nets our friend the miller's son, who knows? It could be true love, and he could indeed be thinking of staying by tomorrow. Eric shook his head, or hiding from her father. Maybe, but as her father's down river with his wife and their sons, leaving Embrysa here alone, I suspect she was laying a snare for you. He glanced at where the girl had gone. Though I think it might have been a pleasant one for a night. The girl's not yet fifteen years old, Rue, said Eric. Around here, that's old enough for motherhood, answered Rue. Anyway, it won't do the last much good getting either of you in her bed, cause the captain's not likely to let any of us wander off. True, agreed Eric. And besides, we're leaving in two days. What? Riders from the south came in about ten minutes ago with messages. Some more soldiers are joining us in two days' time, and we'll all ride north. Well, I'd better get to work, said Eric. I've got to sort out this horse business with Zila's men. I think we'll have to leave about a dozen horses here. The villagers will love that, said Rue with a grin. The ones they can't use for plowing, they'll eat. Eric nodded, knowing he wasn't really joking. Come on, give me a hand. Rue grumbled, but he followed Eric back into the corral to cut out the lame horses. Eric looked toward the southern gate expectantly. Zila and his renegades had left the night before, as agreed, and now the new company from the south that was to join them was coming in ahead of schedule. The Longville had already passed word. If the southern riders showed up before noon, they were off as soon as the company was mustered, all save a dozen men who would hold this fortress against the need of a southern retreat. Now the work made sense to Eric. A dozen well-armed soldiers could hold this village against up to three times that number of bandits, and if the villagers joined in the fight, it would require a small army to take it. Already, without the order being given, men were hurrying to get ready to move out. Then Eric caught sight of a familiar figure among those riding in the gate. Greylock! Eric exclaimed. Owen Greylock turned. Gripping Eric's arm in a gesture of greeting, he then pulled him to his chest with a slap on the back. Releasing the young man, he said, You look well. 
We thought we spied that gray banner of yours on the deck of the ranger one day in passage, but we didn't see you come ashore. Pulling loose a scarf that had been around his face to cut the road to dust, the former swordmaster of Thorkmoor said, That's because I didn't. I sailed on with a couple of others to the city of the Serpent River to make some arrangements, then on to Maharta to take care of some other matters. After the ranger left for Crondor, it was ride like hell for a week getting up to Lanada. Then another backbreaker getting here. Soldiers in various dress were riding in the south gate. Who are they? asked Eric dubiously. Don't let the ragged cut of their outfits fool you. Those are some of the best soldiers from around these parts, and picked by our friend Praji over the last few years. Lowering his voice, he said, We need to blend in. What are you doing here? asked Eric. Last I saw of you was before I was arrested. Long story. Let me report to Callus, and after we've ordered our mounts, share a cup of wine with me, and I'll tell you all. It's going to have to be at camp tonight, answered Eric. We leave in an hour. You've only got time to pick some fresh mounts and grab a bite before we're on our way. Greylock groaned. That bastard isn't giving a man's spine a hope of recovery, is he? I fear not. Come on, I've got some fine horses, and I'll pick one out for you with a soft back. Greylock laughed and said, Lead on. Sixteen. Rendezvous. Callus signaled a halt. Eric and his companions, first company in line behind Callus into Longville, reined in and passed word back for the halt. Owen Greylock was riding with Callus, and Eric hadn't found the opportunity to talk to him. Two scouts who had ridden ahead at first line were galloping down the road. One of them, a clansman whose name was unknown to Eric, said, A merchant caravan's been taken an hour ahead. They tried to stand and fight, but there were no more than six guards for six wagons. Delongville said, The merchant was traveling light. The other scout, a man named Durrany, said, They didn't even have time to stop the wagons. Looks like the raiders swooped down out of the trees and shot them full of arrows before they knew what was happening. The murderers stripped everyone down to the skin and took their armor and weapons and everything else they could carry. Callus asked, How many? The clansman said, Twenty or twenty-five, maybe more. Eric said, Where are the bandits? Ignoring the source of the question, Callus nodded, and Durrany said, they headed back into the trees. We followed their tracks about an hour's ride into the woods, where they turned south. They've been shadowing the road since. He looked around. We never overtook them. They may be looping behind us already. What about the village? asked De Longville. Calla said, Our twelve can hold the village if they could advance warning. But these raiders are acting more like a mercenary company on a rampage than bandits. If they come up on the village undetected... Turning to De Longville, he said, Bobby, take six men and head back to the village to warn them. That's the most we can do. Then catch up as soon as you can. The Longville nodded. You come along with me, he said to Eric, and as they rode past, he motioned for Eric's five companions to fall in. They pulled out of line, and soon the seven of them were riding back to the village of Weenot. Smoke told them they were too late even before they could see the fort. As they crested a rise in the road, they saw the charred ruins of the outer wall and the still unfinished tower now blazing like a banner. Without waiting for orders, Eric spurred his horse forward to a canter and got as close to the fire as he could. He called out a few names of villagers he had come to know, and after a moment, a man emerged from the woods. Tarmel, shouted Eric. What happened? The villager was covered in soot and looked tired, but otherwise unhurt. Those men who were supposed to leave yesterday morning came back last night with another band of men, asking to buy provisions. Your soldiers said no, and they got into an argument over giving their word and leaving and things I didn't follow. He waved up the road. While they were shouting at each other at the south gate, this other group climbed over the north wall and opened the north gate. Your men tried to fight, but they were cut down from two sides. Most of us who could slipped out the south gate or climbed the walls. Then someone set a fire. The bandits didn't trouble most of us after that. They were too busy trying to steal whatever they could before everything burned up. Did everyone get out? Tom shook his head. No, I don't think so. Some of the men I don't know from which band took out to the hills there with two of our women. Drax's wife, Finia, and Embrysa, maybe some others. De Longville came up and said, don't you ever go riding off like that without leave. They've taken some of the women up into the hills. The Longville swore. I told Callus. He cut himself off before he said anything more. He looked at Tarnell. How long ago and how many men? Less than an hour and about five or six. Spread out, ordered De Longville. See if you can spot any tracks. Natombi found tracks indicating that a large band of riders went south, while Chopi found signs of another smaller group heading into the hills. De Longville motioned for the former monk and Cassian legionary to take the point and begin to follow. They had only a short way to go before the screams of women revealed the bandits' whereabouts. De Longville motioned for the six riders to dismount and spread out and moved quietly toward the sounds. 
Eric had his shield on his arm and his sword out a moment after tying his horse, and glanced over to see Rue on his right and Luis on his left. They crept forward through the trees and came upon a sight that set Eric's teeth on edge. Two men were lying on top of two women, one who was struggling. The other lay motionless. Three other men sat close by, drinking from an earthen jug as they watched the rape. A sad cry was followed by a convulsion as one of the men finished and stood up and started pulling up his trousers. One of the men who had been drinking tossed aside the jug and started unfastening his trousers as he came to take the first man's place. He halted and looked at the still form on the ground, then said, "'Gods and demons, Cully, you killed her, you fool!' "'She was biting, so I covered her mouth. "'You smothered her, you idiot!' "'She's not more than a minute or two dead, Sager. "'Go ahead, she's still warm.' Eric saw the body and felt his heart lurch. The corpse was Embrysa. Something strangely familiar struck him, and for an instant he saw Rosalind in a similar position, her clothing torn away. Without thought he rose up and moved toward the nearest men. One was watching the argument between his companions, but the other started to rise. He was halfway off the log where he had sat when he died. With a single sweeping motion, Eric cleaved his head completely from his shoulders. Eric's companions charged and shouted, and the four remaining men scrambled to defend themselves. Eric crossed to where the man named Sager stood, while the one called Cully dashed to where his sword and shield lay. Sager pulled his only weapon, a dagger, at his belt, and Eric advanced upon him like death come into human form. Fear crossed the man's face as Eric bore down on him, and he made ready to defend himself as best he could. He lunged and feint with his dagger, but Eric only stepped forward, bashing with his shield, knocking him to the ground. He raised his sword above his head, then brought it down with a thundering blow, cutting completely through Sager's upraised forearm, slicing him from shoulder to belly. Eric had to put his foot on the man's chest to pull free his sword, and when he did, he turned to see that the remaining three men had taken off their helms and thrown weapons to the ground, the sign among mercenaries of surrender. Eric's eyes were wild and wide as he looked at the man named Cully. He walked purposefully toward him. De Longville stepped before Eric and, using all his strength, pushed him backwards. It was like trying to move a tree, but he did slow Eric's forward advance. Get a hold of yourself on Darkmoor, he commanded. Eric paused at the sound of his name. He looked to where the two women lay. Finia had all her clothing torn from her and lay motionless in the grass, the only sign she was still alive being the slow rise and fall of her small breasts. Ambrysa lay a short distance away, also nude, but bloody from belly to knee. Eric turned to stare at the man named Cully. He dies. Now. Slowly. De Longville said, Did you know her? Yes, answered Eric, part of his mind being surprised De Longville didn't. She was fourteen. One of the captives said, They was villagers. We didn't know they belonged to anyone. Eric advanced, and this time De Longville threw his shoulder into him, knocking him back a step. You stand fast when I tell you, he shouted at Eric. Turning to face the three men, he said, What company? A man named Cully said, Well, Captain, we've been sort of looking out for ourselves lately. Did you hit that caravan a half-day's ride north of here? A grin of broken and blackened teeth greeted the question. Well, now, it wouldn't be the truth if we took credit for it all by ourselves. There were another six or seven boys in on that one. But they joined up with some men who wanted to raid that fort at the village. Fat man rode a big roan horse. He took them all together. Zila, said the Longville. I'll settle up with him some day. Cully continued. We was watching from the woods and got in to grab what we would when they started to leave. We saw these two women getting out of a burning house, so we decided to have some fun. He nodded at the still living but stunned Finia and the dead Ambrysa. We didn't mean to be so rough, but these was the only two we could find, and there's five of us. We'll pay you gold if they was yours, Captain, to make up for it, you see. We won't even say nothing about the two boys you already killed. We only killed the one. Two for one seems more than fair. Give the other a couple of hours to rest, and why, she could serve us all six of you and a couple of us in the bargain. On your knees, commanded Longville. Figo, Natombi, and Luis forced the three men to their knees, holding them fast. I want that one, said Eric, pointing at Cully. I'm going to stake him out face down over an anthill and watch him die screaming. The Longville turned and struck Eric as hard across the face as he could. Eric staggered, fell to his knees, and could barely retain consciousness from the unexpected blow. When his vision cleared, he saw the Longville come up behind the first man. With an economy of motion, he pulled his dagger, grabbed the man's hair, and pulled back his head, cutting his throat with a single slice. The other two tried to rise, but Bigo and Luis kept them under control. Before Eric could regain his feet, the other two men had been executed. Eric took one staggering step, then shook his head to clear it. 
He came to stand over the body of Cully and looked at Delongville, who said, See to the woman. When Eric hesitated, he shouted, Now! Eric and Rue moved to where Finia lay, eyes staring vacantly at the sky. When they knelt over her, her eyes seemed to focus for the first time. Recognizing Eric and Rue, she said in a whisper, Is it over? Eric nodded, and Rue took off his cloak and used it to cover her. Eric helped the woman get to her feet, and she wobbled as she rose. Rue put his arm around her to steady her, and she looked over at Embrysa. I told her to do as they said. She scratched and bit them. She was screaming and crying, and her nose stuffed up. When they covered her mouth, she couldn't breathe. Eric inclined his head to Rue to take her to where the horses were. He took off his own cloak and wrapped Embrysa in it. Lifting her, he carried her as if she were asleep. Softly, he said, Now you'll never find that rich husband. Eric was the last to reach the horses and found De Longville holding his reins. He handed the girl's body to the sergeant, mounted, then took the corpse as De Longville handed her up to him. After the sergeant had mounted his own horse, Eric said, You let them off easy. De Longville said, I know. They should have died over a slow fire. They deserve to suffer, but I'll not visit that on any man. Why? Why do you care what happens to scum like them? De Longville moved his horse alongside Eric's, so he was almost nose to nose with Eric when he answered, I don't care what happens to scum like them. You could cut off a piece at a time over a week, and I wouldn't give a horse promise for what it would do to them. But I do care what it would do to you, Eric. Without waiting for an answer, De Longville moved away and shouted, Let's get back to the village. We've got a hell of a ride before we catch up with the captain. Eric rode after him, not sure what De Longville had meant, but feeling troubled by what he had said. They reached Callus's camp an hour after dark. As before, he had ordered a complete fortification dug, and as DeLongville and the others approached, a guard challenged them. Well done, said a weary DeLongville. Now lower the gate or I'll rip your ears from your head. No one in Callus's company could fail to recognize that voice, so without a further remark, the drop bridge was run out across the trench surrounding the camp. The horses' hooves clattered on the wood and iron as the riders crossed, and when they reached the center of the camp, Callus stood waiting. Zeeler and the bandits joined up and fired the village. Most got away. He glanced at Derek. They killed a girl, and we killed the five of them that did it. Callus nodded, motioning for DeLongville to join him in his command tent. Eric took the reins of DeLongville's horse and led him with his own to where the remounts were waiting. It took him better than an hour to cool down the horses, clean hooves and saddle marks, and bedded them down with fresh fodder. By the time he was finished, he was aching to his bones, and he knew it was more than just the fatigue of the ride and fighting. The killing of the men had been so effortless. As he walked back to where his companions were erecting their tent, he recalled what he had done. The first man he had struck had been an obstacle, nothing more. He hadn't been trying to decapitate him, only to brush him aside. Louise had said something later about its being a terrible blow, as was the cleaving of the second man Eric had faced. But Eric thought it a distant act, as if someone else had been doing the fighting. He could remember the smells the smoke of the burning village and the campfire in the clearing, the stench of sweat and feces mixed in with the iron bite of blood and the stink of fear. He felt the shock of the blows he delivered running up his arm and the pounding of his own blood in his forehead. But it was all distant, muted, and he couldn't find it within himself to grapple with and understand what had occurred. He knew he had wanted M. Bryce's killer to suffer. He knew he wanted a man to feel her pain a thousand times over. Yet now he was dead, feeling nothing. If Bigo was to be believed, the man was being judged by the death goddess, but whatever the truth, he was feeling none of this life's pain. Maybe de Longville was right. Eric thought he was the one who was now suffering, and it made him both sad and angry. He reached the tent and found that Rue had taken Eric's section of tent and erected it, so that the six-man dwelling was up and waiting for him. Eric looked at his boyhood friend and said, Thank you. Rue said, Well, you spent enough time looking out for my horse. And mine, said Bigo. And everyone else's, said Luis. Do you think we should pay this boy for being so good to us? Eric looked over at Luis, whose sense of humor was rarely in evidence, and saw that the often short-tempered Rhodesian was looking at him with a rare warmth in his expression. Bigo said, well, maybe. Or we could do his bit with setting up and tearing down the tent, like we did tonight. I can manage my own weight, said Eric. No one needs to do for me. He heard an irritation in his voice that was unexpected. Suddenly he discovered he was feeling very angry. Bigo reached from his bedroll across the narrow aisle, separating the three bunks on each side, and said, We know, lad. 
You do more than your share, that's all. No one said anything, but you've become the horsemaster for our little company of cutthroats. At the mention of the word cutthroat, Eric was struck by the image of the three men being butchered by de Longville. Suddenly he felt sick, and his body felt flushed, as if fever was coming over him. Closing his eyes a second, he said, Thank you. I know you mean well. He paused for a moment, then stood as upright as he could in the low tent and walked away. I'll be back. I need some air. Guard duty in two hours, Rue called after him. Walking through the camp, Eric tried to calm himself. He found his stomach clenched, and he felt as if he might be sick. Running for the privy trench, he barely got there in time to keep from fouling his pants. After agonizing minutes of squatting and feeling as if he was passing fire, he felt his stomach twist, and suddenly he was vomiting into the trench. When he at last finished, he felt as if he had no strength left. He went to the edge of the nearby stream and cleaned himself up. Then he returned to the cook fire, where he found Owen Greylock helping himself to a bowl of stew and a hunk of bread. Despite having lost everything in his gut only moments before, Eric was suddenly ravenous as he smelled the stew. He grabbed a wooden bowl as Owen greeted him and watched while Eric scooped out a large bowl of stew, ignoring the hot liquid as it covered his hand to the wrist. Look out, said Owen. God, you're going to boil yourself. Eric lifted the bowl to his lips and took a long sip, then said, Heat doesn't bother me. I think it's the years of the forge. Now, cold, that makes me hurt. No one laughed. Hungry? Eric tore a large piece of bread off one of the loaves on the serving table and said, Can we talk for a minute? Owen motioned for Eric to sit on a log that had been felled to provide a rude bench for men eating. No one else was nearby save the two men who would clean up the cook area and ready it for the morning meal before turning in. Owen said, Where do you want to begin? Eric said, I want to know how you got here, but first can I ask you something? Certainly. When you kill a man, how does that make you feel? Owen was silent and then blew out his cheeks and let a long breath slowly escape. That's a difficult one, isn't it? He fell silent a minute, then said, I've killed men two ways, Eric. As my lord's swordmaster, I was dispenser of the high justice, and I've hung more than one man. It's different each time, and never easy. Then it depends on why I'm hanging them. Murderers, rapists, thugs, they... I don't feel much of anything except relief when it's over. When it's something dicey, like your execution was said to be, then it's a nasty business. I feel like taking a long, long hot bath afterward, though I rarely get the chance. When it comes to battle, things just happen too quickly, and you're usually too busy staying alive to think about it. Does that answer you? Eric nodded as he munched on soggy vegetables. In a way. Did you ever want to see someone suffer? Owen scratched his head at this. Can't say as I have. I've wanted to see a few men dead, but suffer? Not really. I wanted to see a man feel pain today. Eric explained about Embrysa and how he had wanted to make her killer experience a long, slow, terrible death. When he finished, he added, Then I found I could barely keep my arse closed. Flocks, and then throwing up. Then suddenly I'm here eating like nothing happened. Rage does strange things to you, Owen said. You're not going to like hearing this, I think, but the only two other men I've known who felt as you say you did were your father and... Stefan. Eric shook his head and laughed ruefully. You're right, I didn't like hearing that. Your father only got that way with rage. If he was angry, he'd rather have seen his enemy injured and in pain than dead. But that was the only time. His voice lowered. Stefan was worse. He really enjoyed watching people suffer. He got excited by it. Your father had to bribe more than one father off because his daughter was damaged. What about Manfred? Owen shrugged. Given who his parents are, he's a decent enough person. You'd like him, given a chance to know each other. But that's neither here nor there. Owen studied Eric, then said, I've known you a long time, since you were a baby, Eric. And while you have some of your father in you, you don't have only your father's blood in you. Your mother can be a hard woman, but she was never a mean one. She's never hurt anyone for pleasure. And you can bet that Stefan was the worst mix of his father and mother. I think I can understand why you'd be so ferocious with a man who killed the girl. You were fond of her, I take it? In a way, Eric smiled. She tried to cousin me into her bed so she could be the village smith's wife. He shook his head in regret. 
She was so obvious, and there was no art to it, but in a way... It made you feel good? Yes. Owen nodded. We all have a vanity, and a pretty girl's attentions are rarely unwelcomed by any man. But it doesn't explain why I wanted to see that man hurt so much. I can still feel it, Owen. If I could raise him from the dead and cause him to scream in agony, I think I'd do it. Justice, maybe. The girl died in agony, and he got a simple death in return. A voice from the dock said, Sometimes revenge goes disguised as justice. Both Owen and Eric turned to see Nacor entering from the darkness. I was out walking and heard you talk. Sounds like an interesting discussion. Without asking their leave, he sat down. Eric said, I was telling Owen here what happened today. Have you heard? Nacor nodded. Sharpie told me, You are in a rage. You wanted to cause this man pain. Bobby kept you from indulging in his suffering. Eric nodded. Nacor said, Some men take to the pain and others the way other men take to strong drink or potent drugs. If you recognize that appetite in yourself early and learn to master it within yourself, you'll be the better man for knowing, Eric. I don't know what I wanted, Eric admitted. I don't know if it was that he didn't suffer enough or if I really wanted to see something in his eyes as he died. Owen said, most soldiers are struck by others' death after the fact. That you got sick, Nacor said. You got sick? Like I had eaten green apples, admitted Eric. Nacor grinned. Then you're not a man to eat poison and like it. If you hadn't gotten sick, it would be because that poison of hate found a home in your gut. He reached over and poked a finger into Eric's side. You ate the hatred, but your body threw it up, as if it were those green apples, he smiled, apparently satisfied with the explanation. Do your reiki each night, and let your mind seek calmness, and you will survive the terrors you've just met. Owen and Eric exchanged looks that said neither man knew what Nacor was talking about. Eric said, Now tell me how you came here. Owen said, That was due to you. Me? Owen said, When you were caught, my lady Matilda and your half-brother raced to Crondor to ensure the prince knew you were to be hung without question. When we got there, I asked a friend in the prince's court to grant me an audience with Nicholas, and I tried to give him some idea of how you'd been dealt with as a child. He shrugged. It obviously didn't do any good, as you were to be hung, and the dowager baroness discovered I had tried to intercede upon your behalf. He looked at Eric and smiled. I was asked to retire from my office. Manfred said he regretted to ask, but she is his mother, after all. I've never met her, but she seems a most persuasive woman by all reports, offered Nacor. That's one way of putting it, said Owen. Well, there isn't a great demand for discharged swordmasters, so I applied to the prince's guard for a billet. I was prepared to stand down to man at arms if needs be, or to attempt to gain a commission on the frontier. Failing that, I was going to try my hand at the mercenary trade, providing escort for merchant trains down into the Vale of Dreams and Great Cash. But that black heart, Bobby de Longville, found me at a tavern and got me very drunk, and I woke up the next day and discovered I was going to be running like a madman from Quester's View to Land's End on one errand or another for Prince Nicholas and Callus. Owen continued, That's a strange customer, our captain. Did you know he ranks in the court as a duke? Eric said, I only know him as the Eagle of Crondor, finished Owen. I know. He's important, that's all I know. But when the dust settled, I was on the Freeport Ranger with a list of missions to last three months and one month to finish them when we made port in the harter. Eric finished his food and said, Sorry to have put you to this, Owen. Owen laughed. It was in the cards, as the gamblers say. And truth to tell, I was growing bored at Darkmoor. The wine's the best in the world and the women as fair as anywhere, but there's little else to stir a man there. I've grown tired of hanging bandits and running escort from one safe city to another. I think it's time for something grand. Nacor shook his head. There's little grand ahead of us. He stood up, yawning. I'm going to sleep. We have three long days ahead. Why? asked Eric. While you were killing those men, we got word of a rendezvous. What is that? asked Eric. I've heard that term before. Meeting, said Owen. A great camp, offered Nacor. With a grin, he said, It is where the two sides in this war will come to make offers for the service of companies like ours. It's where we will find the army of this Emerald Queen, and then friend Greylock's adventure will begin. He wandered off into the gloom. Owen said, He may be the strangest man I've met. I've only talked to him a couple of times since yesterday, but he has some of the oddest notions I've ever encountered. 
But he's right about one thing. It's a long day tomorrow, and we both need to sleep. Eric nodded and took Owen's bowl. I'll wash that up. I'm doing mine anyway. Thank you. And thank you, replied Eric. For what? For talking? Owen put his hand upon Eric's shoulder. Any time, Eric. Good night. He walked up to Nacor. Eric went to the bucket used to clean the wooden bowls and rinsed them with water, scoured them with cleaning sand, then rinsed with fresh water again. He put the bowls where the men who would make the morning mess would expect to find them and returned to his own tent. The others were sleeping except Rue, who said, Are you all right? Eric sighed and said, I don't know, but I am better. Rue seemed about to make a remark, then thought better of it and turned over to go to sleep. Eric lay in the darkness, and while he intended to practice the self-healing Nacor had taught him, sleep was on him less than a minute after Rue. The camp was immense. At least ten thousand armed men were scattered across a low valley that ran from the hills on the east to the river on the west. Cutting through the middle was a smaller tributary to the Vedra, and along this smaller river camps had been made. The brokers who were conducting the contracts were arrayed under a large canopy, ochre in color, at the heart of the valley. Eric rode with his companions in their usual position near the head of the column, near enough to Callus to overhear his conversations with the men around him. The prodigy pointed. Some of those banners are damn strange. I thought I knew every company worth talking about in this God's forsaken continent. He glanced around. Some of these others are a long way from home. How is it shaping up? asked De Longville. It's early yet. Kuiper fell less than a month ago. If the Emerald Queen's representatives get here in the next week, I'll be surprised. But I'll bet you a whore's hoard that the priest king of Lanada is spending money like a sailor in port. Looking around, he said, We'd better head up the valley and see if there's anywhere good near the river. He sniffed the air. With a number of these fools pissing in the water after they get drunk, downstream's the last place I want to be. The Longville laughed. Looks like the best places are chicken. Only if you like the taste of another man's piss in your water, said Prodji. This is just the start. The words have been about for five years now. There's a big war to end all wars coming, and any man with a sword who doesn't get in now will be out of the looting. He shook his head. Doesn't make much sense, does it? You'd think any man with eyes in his head could see. Callus cut him off with an upraised hand. Not here. Too many ears. Prodji nodded. Look for a Red Eagle banner, twin to your own. That'll be Vaja, if he's found his way here. Callus nodded. They rode into the camp area, and Eric felt his pulse race. Never had so many pairs of eyes regarded him with suspicion. The rendezvous was neutral ground, where both sides in the coming conflict could recruit mercenary companies to their cause, openly bidding against one another, and tradition bound every man who entered sight of the tent to keep his sword sheathed. But tradition and enforceable law were two different things, and more than once a battle had erupted at such a meeting. Men in this camp knew only that those in their own company were allies. Anyone else might be someone they would see across the field of battle mere days or weeks after leaving the rendezvous. They passed by the large yellowish tent, though on the other side of the water, as they picked their way upriver and away from the main body of men camping. Callus found a small rise with a flat top that gave a commanding view of the valley below and motioned to De Longville that they would camp there. No fortifications. It's against the compact, but I want double guard. When the whores come by, let the men indulge, but no strong drink and no drugs. Chase the peddlers away. I'll not have some fool start a war because he sees the ghost of some enemy in the smoke and pulls his sword. De Longville nodded and gave the order. Without the need to dig a trench and rampart, making camp took little time, when Eric's squad had finished erecting their tent, Foster came by and gave the rotation for guard duty. Eric groaned when he was told the second watch, which was from midnight to two hours before dawn. Sleep interrupted was as good as not sleeping, from his point of view. Still, after three days in the saddle, a little time to lie around would be welcome. And if he had the midnight watch tonight, that meant the dawn watch tomorrow, and the day after, no watch at all. He found that a little gratifying and was glad to have found any reason to feel good whatsoever. Trumpets blew, and Eric came awake with a start. They had been in camp for five days now, and he was back to a split night of guard duty. He rolled out of his tent and saw that everyone was looking down into the valley below. Rue came to his side and laughed. Looks like an anthill with a stick in it. Eric laughed, for Rue was right. There was motion everywhere. Then Foster was hurrying through camp, shouting, Every man to horse! We muster for inspection! Eric and Rue turned and went back to their low tent, grabbing their swords and shields. They hurried to where other men were already saddling their horses and got theirs ready. When the order to fall in came, they swung up into saddle and moved the horses to their position in the column. Foster rode by and said, 
Rest a while, lads. The shopping is beginning, and you'll be doing little for a day. When the brokers come by, do your best to look fierce. This got a laugh, and Jado Shotty's bass voice carried from somewhere back in line. Just put Jerome in front, man. That will scare them, don't you know? This brought another laugh, and then the Longville's voice cut through the air. Next man who says anything better make me laugh, or he'll wish his mother had taken holy vows of celibacy before he was born. The company fell silent. An hour later, the sound of riders came up from the valley, and Eric turned to see a small company of a dozen men heading their way. At their head was a large man, gray of hair, but otherwise young-looking. He wore foppish regalia, and obviously had put much thought into his appearance, despite being covered with road dust. At his side rode another, carrying a crimson eagle banner. Fadja! cried Prodji as they pulled up. You sorry old peacock! I thought someone had killed you out of mercy. What took you so long? The other man, handsome despite his years, laughed and said, You found them. If I hadn't heard of the rendezvous, I would still be on my way down to the city of the Serpent River, looking for our good captain and this company of sorry fools. Callus came riding over as Vaja and his men dismounted. You have come just in time. The muster begins today. Vaja looked around. There's plenty of time yet. We'll have three or four days of this at least. Are both sides here? No word of the Emerald Queen's agents, just the Priest King, answered Callus. Vaja said, Good. That gives me ample time to bathe and eat. You won't be taking any offer for days. Calla said, You know that, and I know that, but if we're to be convincing, they, he hiked his thumb over his shoulder in the general direction of the broker's tent, can't know that. We have to look as if we're weighing all offers equally. Understood, said Vaja. But I still have time for a bath. I'll be back in an hour. He turned and led his companions away. Praji said, Twenty-nine years I fought at his side, and I swear to this day no man more vain exists on this world. He'd primp for his own execution. Callus smiled, and Eric realized it was one of the few times he had ever seen the captain smile. For days they would muster on command, and brokers would come by to look over the company. With Vaja's men and the men under Hatonis, they numbered better than one hundred swords, a significant enough troop to be taken seriously, but not so large as to bear special scrutiny. After the third such day, offers began to come in, and Callus listened to them politely. He remained non-committal. A week after the mustering had started, Eric noticed a few companies departing. He asked Praji about this over supper, and the old mercenary said, They've signed on with the priest king. Probably poor captains running low on gold to pay their men. They have to find employment quickly, or lose their fighters to richer companies. Most are waiting around to hear what the other side has to offer. Still more days passed, and the other side didn't appear. Two weeks after arriving, Eric had requested permission to move the horses upriver. As they had grazed the area clean, and the hay and grain brokers were charging outrageous prices, Callus gave permission, but instructed Eric to make sure a full guard company surrounded the animals at all times. Another week went by. Almost a month after arriving, Eric was walking back from having checked the horses, a three-times-daily ritual now, to hear a series of loud trumpet calls from the heart of the camp. The weather was hot, the hottest part of the summer, he had been told by one of the clansmen, and soon summer would be waning. It felt odd to lose a winter, to leave in fall and return to spring. Eric was sure Nacor could explain this backwards season to him, but he wasn't sure he was up for hearing the little man's explanation. Trumpets continued, insistent, and Eric started to hurry to see what the matter was. As he neared his own tent area, Foster came running toward him and shouted, Get those horses down here! That's a call to quarter! We're being put on notice, a fight's going to break out! Eric dashed back up the hill and down into the next small valley, and waved his hand as he shouted to the men standing guard, Bring as many as you can lead! He hurried past to the most distant picket line and managed to lead four horses away. Others came hurrying past, and before he had reached the main camp, every horse was being led after him. The men broke camp faster than Eric had ever seen. Callus gave orders for a defensive perimeter to be established, and a company began digging a breastwork. Archers scanned the hill below for signs of anyone heading their way. Despite the sound of quarter, no sounds of battle erupted from below. Instead, a strange buzzing sound carried up the hill, and it took Eric a long minute to realize he was listening to men's voices. 
Arguments and curses carried up the hillside, and the sound carried a frantic quality, but there were still no sounds of fighting. At last Calla said, Bobby, take some men down there and find out what's going on. The Longville said, Bigo, Von Darkmoor, Jado, and Jerome, with me. Rue laughed. He's got the four biggest men in the company to hide behind. The Longville turned in a single motion, looked at Rue, and said, And you, my little man. With evil delight in his eyes, he grinned as he said, You can stand on my shield side. If trouble erupts, I'm going to pick you up and throw you with the first man heading my way. Rue rolled his eyes heavenward and fell in beside Eric. That will teach me to keep my mouth shut. Eric said, I doubt it. They made their way down into the camp below, on foot, trying not to call attention to themselves as they approached another campsite. Men were arguing with one another as they came within earshot. I don't care, it's an insult. I say let's ride south and take whatever the priest king offers. Another voice said, You want to fight your way out so you can turn around and fight again? Eric tried to make sense of the remarks, but the Longville said, Follow me. He made his way through several such camps, more than one marked by a busy attempt to get ready to ride. One man said, If you break to the east, up this river, then cut through the hills to the south, you will probably get free. The man next to him answered, What? You're an oracle now. The Longville led them to the area surrounding the broker's tent, where he found a knot of terrified brokers standing outside their own tent. He pushed past and entered. A low wooden desk was used by the brokers, and behind it sat a large man in fine armor, well cared for, but obviously used often. His feet rested on the polished wood, mud scattering all over the documents still upon them. He looked little different from the other soldiers in camp, except that he was older, perhaps older than Praji and Vanja, the oldest men in Kalos's company. But rather than of age, his aura was that of a man of profound experience. He calmly looked at the Longville and his companions as they entered and nodded to another soldier who stood behind him. Both wore an emerald green armband on their left arm, but otherwise they wore no distinctive markings or uniform. The Longville stopped and said, Well, then, what fool blows a call to quarters? I have no idea, said the old soldier. I certainly didn't want to cause this much commotion. Are you the Emerald Queen's agent? The man said, I am General Guthy. I am no one's agent. I'm here to inform you of your choices. Eric sensed something in this man he had seen in a few others. The Prince of Crondor, Duke James, and Callus upon occasion. It was a sureness of command, an expectation that orders would be followed without debate, and Eric decided that this man's title was no mercenary vanity. This man commanded an army. The Longville put his hands on his hips and said, Ah, uh, and what choices are those? You can serve the Emerald Queen, or you can die. With a slight gesture of his head, the Longville instructed the men around him to spread out. Eric stepped to his right until he stood opposite the single soldier in the tent behind Coffey. The Longville said, Usually I get paid to fight, but your tone makes me think I might be willing to forgo payment this one time. Goppy sighed. Break the peace of the camp at risk, Captain. I'm no captain, said the Longville. I am a sergeant. My captain sent me down to see what the fuss was. The fuss, as you call it, answered Goppy, is the consternation of men too stupid to realize they have no choice. So you don't hear a garbled version of what was said here an hour ago. I repeat this so you can tell your captain. All companies of mercenaries mustering in this valley must swear fealty to the Emerald Queen. We begin our campaign downriver against Lenada in a month's time. If you attempt to leave to take service with our lady's enemies, you will be hunted down and killed. And who's doing this hunting and killing? asked the Longville. With an easy smile, Goppy said, The thirty thousand soldiers who are now surrounding this pleasant little valley? The Longville turned and glanced outside the tent. He searched the ridges above the valley and saw movement, a glint of light upon metal or a flicker of shadow, but enough to tell him that a sizable force was ringing the valley. Letting out an exasperated sound, he said, We wondered what was taking you so long to reach here. We didn't think you'd be coming in force. Carry word to your captain. You have no choice. Looking at the general, de Longville seemed about to say something. Then he just nodded and motioned for the others to follow him. They were silent until they were away from the main camp when Eric said, You look bothered, Sergeant. I thought the purpose was to join this army. 
I don't like it when the other side changes the rules, said de Longville. Around here you pay a man to fight. I think we may be getting sucked deeper into the sand than we thought. Besides, he added, when I'm going to get buggered, I like to be asked nicely first. It annoys me when I'm not. 17. Discovery Rue pointed. In the distance, fire marked a skirmish. True to his word, General Gothi attacked any band seeking to leave to the south. A few captains were stiff-backed enough to try to smash their way through the encircling army, and they were met with a full weight of those soldiers already in better positions and dug in. The valley might have made a pleasant enough place for the rendezvous, but as a place from which to launch an attack it had little to recommend it. Since it was narrow and steep to the north and south, the only possible means of escape was through the eastern end, the way Vaja and his companions had come, which he reported as being treacherous hills with unforgiving trails for those taking a wrong turn. Still, some smaller bands attempted to leave this way. Others moved out, as did Callus's Crimson Eagles, either to serve and take whatever recompense might be forthcoming through looting or other rewards, or to steal away at some future opportunity. Everywhere Eric looked he saw unhappy men. The Longville wasn't the only one feeling buggered without leave. Those who obeyed General Gothi's orders mustered in columns at the lowest end of the river, just before it joined with the larger Vedra. A bridge, long burned out in some forgotten war, marked the place, and a series of ferries had been established to provide transport from north to south on the east side of the Vedra, or from east to west, below the nameless tributary. Callus's company was among the last to reach the ferry, having quartered higher up in the valley than most, and as a result they were afforded a longer opportunity to sit and watch than those who came before. Men and a few women from every corner of Novindus were moving across the river, crossing to join those like Callus's already on the south bank. A man wearing a green armband rode up and said, What company? The Longville pointed at Callus, who sat next to him on the left, and said, Callus's Crimson Eagles, from the city of the Serpent River. The man frowned, looking at Callus. From the siege at Hamsa? Callus nodded. The man grinned, and there was nothing friendly in the expression. I almost had you, you slippery bastard. But you went east to the Deshandi, and by the time my company doubled back, you were into the steps. He looked hard at Callus. Had I known you were of the long lived, I would have headed east straight away. A lot of your kind with a Deshandi. He took out a parchment and a charcoal stick, made some marks, and said, But Our Lady accepts all who come to her, so we're on the same side now. He waved toward the south. Make your way down river about a mile. Find the master of the camp there and report in. In a few days you'll get orders. Until then, the rules of the camp are simple. Any fighting and you're killed. We're all brothers now under the banner of the Emerald Queen, so any man who starts trouble goes to the stake. I don't recommend it. I've seen some men twitch for an hour or longer. He didn't ask if the order was understood, simply putting heels to his horse and riding off toward the next company. That was simple, said Praji, who sat on Callus's left. Callus said, Let's find this master of the camp and report in. We might as well get situated as quickly as possible. He nodded at Praji and Vaja, who peeled off from the company without comment. What's that? asked Eric quietly. Foster, who was riding next to Eric, said, Keep your mouth shut. But Nacor laughed. With all the confusion, it's easy to get separated from one's own company. It may take Praji and Vaja days to find out where we're camped. They'll have lots of time to hear many things. Kala shook his head and looked over his shoulder, as if warning the Isolani to keep this to himself, but the little man giggled in delight at the notion. He said, I think I'll get lost for a while, too. He tossed his reins to Louise, saying, I do better on foot, and slid off his horse. Before Callus could object, he was scampering down to where a huge company of horsemen was disembarking from barges, while another large company rode in from the west. Within minutes the two companies were locked in milling confusion, and Nacor had vanished into the press, ducking between horsemen who shouted curses as their horses shied at Nacor's sudden movements. Callus said, He's done this before. Foster looked after Nacor with black murder in his eyes. But Callus and de Longville only shook their heads. 
They found the master of the camp hours later. A narrow face with dark, dotting eyes regarded them as Callus reported in. He made a mark on a document, then waved toward the riverbank. Find a spot between here and two miles downriver. There are other companies scattered along both sides of the road. Find a campsite between the river and the road. There should be a company calling itself Gagari's Command, just to the north of you. Across the road will be a company under a captain named Dalbreen. If you move south of that position, you will be assumed to be deserting, and you will be hunted down. Those not killed will be brought back for public execution. And do not try to cross the river. He made a vague motion across the river, where in the distance they could see a company of horse riding along at an easy lope. Something bothered Eric, and then he realized that the riders and horses were far too large for the distance and the speed they were moving. He blinked as he tried to make sense of the image, then he realized what he was seeing. Lizard men, he said aloud without thinking. The master of the camp said, Our lady's allies are called the Sa'awar. Do not call them lizards or snakes, lest you incur her wrath. He motioned for Callus to lead his company away as another company approached from behind. Squinting against the afternoon sun, Eric tried to make sense of the distant riders. Those horses must be twenty hands, said Chopin. Closer to twenty-two or four, said Eric. They're bigger than draft animals, but they move like cavalry mounts. As the riders moved away, he admired the fluid motion of the horses. The Sa'awar rode with an easy, rocking seat, though their bodies looked oddly top-heavy, as their armor was cut in an almost triangular configuration due to flaring shoulder guards and a cinched waist. I'd like to get a closer look at one of those horses, said Eric. No, you wouldn't, snapped the Longville. At least not one with a rider on his back. Eric shook his head in wonder as the riders were lost in the distant afternoon haze. They located the campsite, and Callus made a guarded introduction to his neighboring captains. It was clear that no one was feeling talkative, as none of the companies knew if those next to them were actively supporting the cause of the Emerald Queen, or were those coerced into serving. Eric was no military expert, but he got the feeling that in this strange country, with its custom of hiring men to fight as opposed to supporting standing armies, having men without loyalty under arms was not a very smart thing to do. Still, no general uprising seemed to be taking place, so Eric assumed those in command of this host knew something he didn't, and left it at that. Callus ordered the men to bed down without erecting tents. There was no order given to dig a perimeter defense or erect a breastwork. It was clear without being said that he wanted the men to be up off the ground and on horseback in the shortest possible time, if the need arose. After the second day, the surrounding camps became small communities, to be visited if the men weren't on duty. Bartering, gambling, swapping stories, or just alleviating the boredom of a camp between battles, the men wandered as far as they could without causing trouble. The level of trust was rising, albeit slowly, as those forced to serve grew more accepting of fate. They might resent having no choice as to who their new master was, but for most captains one side was as good as the other, and booty was booty. Some companies had an open attitude, welcoming a new face who might bring some news, gold to gamble, or just a break from the routine. But others were still wary, and twice Rue and Eric had been told to keep moving when they approached one of those camps. The second night Foster walked through the camp, stopping at every group of men to speak with them. He came upon Eric, Rue, Chopi, and Louise, who were sitting around a fire, watching as Bigo and Natombi took their turn cooking for the squad. Here, he said, motioning for the men to stand. When they did, he opened the purse and counted out two golden coins and five silver for each man. In a low voice, he said, Mercenaries get paid, and if you can't buy something from a vendor or whore now and again, you'll get people asking questions about us. And the first man who gets drunk and says the wrong thing into the wrong ear, I'll personally have his liver on a stick. Eric hefted the coins, feeling them cold in his hand. He hadn't held coins since leaving Darkmoor, he realized, and it made him feel good to be able to buy something. He put them into a pouch sewn into a seam in his tunic where they would be safe. Whores appeared later that night, plying their trade. Without tenants there was little privacy, but that seemed to bother few of the men. Many simply pulled the woman of their choice under a blanket and ignored whoever might be sitting a few feet away. A pair of them came by where Eric and Rue sat, and one said, Looking for some company, boys? Rue grinned, and suddenly Eric found himself flushing with embarrassment. The last time whores had visited their camp, at the other site up on the tributary of the Vedra, 
He had been looking after the horses, and they had moved on by the time he returned. He was certain he was the only man in camp who had never lain with a woman. Eric thought, I might never get the chance again. He looked at his friend, whose smile spread ear to ear, then found himself grinning back. Why not? he asked. One of the women said, We get paid first. Rue laughed. And pigs fly. He waved at the camp. We're not going anywhere, but we can't say the same for you now, can we? The whore who had spoken gave him a sour look, but she nodded. You're not as young as you look, I wager. Rue stood up. I'm older than I've ever been before in my life. The whore looked confused by the statement, but followed Rue as he motioned for her to follow. Eric stood, finding himself alone with the other woman. She could have been young, but it was difficult to tell. A hard expression in the dim campfire light made it impossible to tell if she was closer to fifteen years or forty. Some gray in her dark hair convinced him she was older than he, but he didn't know if that made him feel more comfortable or less. Here, she asked. What? Do you want to do it here or somewhere else? Suddenly, feeling profoundly embarrassed, Eric said, Let's go down by the river. He stuck out his hand awkwardly, and she took it, her grip firm and her hand dry. He suddenly felt regret for the gesture, as his palm was damp and his grip uncertain. She laughed softly, and he said, What? First time, is it? He said, Why, of course not. It's just been a long time with travel and... Of course, she said. Eric couldn't tell if there was warmth in her amusement or contempt. He led her down to the bank of the river and nearly stepped on a couple who were in a frantic embrace. He moved to where it was relatively dark and stood there uncertain. The woman quickly was out of her clothing, and Eric felt his own body respond to the sight of her. Her body was nothing extraordinary, a little plump around the hips and thighs, and her breasts sagged, but he suddenly thought of what he was about to do, and he couldn't get out of his clothing fast enough. He had his tunic off and was working on his boots when she said, You're a big lad, aren't you? Eric looked down at his own body as if noticing it for the first time. The passage of time and the rigors of his life since being taken prisoner had hardened him to a fitness beyond what he had known at Ravensburg. Always strong, he had lost a softer outer layer of fat, and now his powerful smith's chest and shoulders were rippling muscle, as if he had been carved by a sculptor of the heroic. He said, I have always been big for my age. He sat and pulled off his boots, and she came over and took the top of his pants in a firm grip. Her voice was husky as she said, Let's see how big. She pulled off his pants, and looking at his obvious readiness, she laughed and said, Big enough. Considering her profession, she was tender. She took her time and didn't laugh at Eric's awkward fumbling. She calmed him when he needed it, and while their coupling was frantic and quick, there was some sense of caring in it. After it was over, she quickly dressed, but stayed a moment after he paid her. What's your name? Eric, he said, not sure if he was comfortable telling her. You're a wild boy, Eric, in a man's body. The right woman's going to come to love your touch, if you always remember how strong you are and how tender her flesh is. Suddenly he felt self-conscious. Did I hurt you? She laughed. Not really. You were enthusiastic. I'll have a bruise or two on my backside from hitting the damn ground so hard at the end there. But nothing like when those lads who like to slap a whore around get done with me. Pulling on his clothing, Eric said, Why do you do it? The woman shrugged in the gloom, the gesture almost lost as she dressed. What else can I do? My man was a soldier like you. He died five years ago. I have no family or rank. I can steal or whore. She repeated without apology or regret. What else can I do? Before he could say anything more, she was gone to seek another customer. Eric felt both relieved and empty. There had been something missing in their coupling, and Eric couldn't tell what it was, but he also knew he was already anxious to try this wonderful thing again. Six days after making camp, Eric saw Praji and Vaja riding up. Callus motioned for them to come over to where he sat, a short distance from Eric and his squad, who had just finished their midday meal. Men nodded greetings to the two old mercenaries, who walked to where Callus waited and knelt down next to him. What did you discover? asked Callus. Praji said, Nothing terribly surprising, with a wave of his hand to indicate those companies mustered on all sides. 
We're all boxed in between a range of hills to the east, the river over there, about twenty, twenty-five thousand swords to the north of us, and the armies of Lanada and Maharta mustering about fifty miles south of here. The Raj of Maharta sent his army that far north? That's the rumor, said Vajra, keeping his voice low so only those near Callus's campfire could hear him. Pradi said, This campaign's been going on for a dozen years, since the fall of Iribek. Sooner or later, you'd think the Raj would figure it out. One by one, the cities of the river have fallen, each hoping its neighbor to the north would be the last the Emerald Queen took. Kata said, What else? We're moving out in a few days, a week at the most, I think. What did you hear? asked Callus as Robert de Longville and Charlie Foster approached to stand behind Callus. Praji said, Nothing that said we march in three days. Just watching and listening. Vaja waved to the north. They're building a large bridge across the river where the ferry is. Got at least six companies of engineers and a couple of hundred slaves working on it all day and all night. No one from this side can go north without a pass, said Praji. And no one can leave this area unless they have signed orders, added Vaja. On the north side of the river, continued Praji. There's where all the old vets are gathered, the ones who've been at the heart of this campaign from the start, them and the Sa'awa lizardmen. Callus was silent for a moment. Sir, so we're war fodder. Looks like, said Praji. Eric turned to the other men in his squad and whispered, War fodder? Bigo kept his voice low so the officers wouldn't hear him when he answered, Best to march to the wall, old son. You get fed to the wall, as it were. Lewis made a motion of drawing a blade across his own throat. First companies to hit the wall lose the most men, he added softly. Callus said, We need to be alert. We've got to get closer to this Emerald Queen and her generals to find out what we really need to know. If that means we're the first through the gate or over the wall to prove our worth, that's what we'll do. Once we know what we need to know, then we'll worry about how we get the hell out of here. Eric lay back on his pallet, arm behind his head. He watched his clouds scurried by overhead in the late afternoon breeze. He would have night watched, so he thought he'd try to get some rest. But the thought of being the first to attack the wall of a city, that image returned again and again. He'd killed four men so far, on three different occasions, but he'd never been in battle. He worried he would somehow do something wrong. He was still contemplating the coming campaign when Foster came along and kicked his boots, telling him it was time to get to his post. Eric found himself surprised that it was now night. He had lost himself in contemplations of the coming struggle, and the sun had set without his noticing. He rose and got his sword and shield and moved down toward the river to spend the next few hours watching for trouble. He thought it ironic that he was on guard in the midst of an army that would turn on Callus's crimson eagles in an instant if they understood their real purpose, and from what he had no idea, as no enemy was closer than fifty miles. Still, he was told to go stand guard, and that he did. Nacor stood at the edge of the crowd, watching the priest lift up the dead sheep. The Sa'our warriors closest to the fire let out a yell of approval, a deep-throated hissing that echoed through the night like a chorus of enraged dragons. Those humans behind the circle of lizard men watched in fascination, for these rites were unknown to any but the Sa'our. Many humans made signs of protection to their own gods and goddesses. A great celebration was underway, and Nacor was wandering freely through the various companies of men. He had seen many things and was both gratified and horrified. Gratified that he had uncovered several key elements of the mystery that would help Callus best decide what to do next, and horrified because in his long life he had never met a gathering of evil men so concentrated in both numbers and malignancy. The heart of this army was the Sa'awar, and a large company of men who called themselves the Chosen Guard. They wore both the common emerald armband and green scarves tied around their heads. Their malignancy was clearly demonstrated by one of their number who stood a short distance from Nacor, wearing a necklace of human ears. Rumor in the camp had it these were the most violent, dangerous, and depraved men in an army of dark souls. To join their ranks one must have endured several campaigns and distinguished oneself by deeds black and numerous. It was rumored that the final act of acceptance was ritual cannibalism. Nacor didn't doubt it. 
but having visited cannibals in the Skoshakan Islands in prior years, he also knew these men indulged in practices that would have revolted most cannibals. Nacor nodded and grinned at a man covered in tattoos who held a young boy tightly to him. The boy had an iron collar around his neck, and his eyes had a drug-induced vacancy in them. The man snarled at Nacor, who merely grinned even more as he moved away. Nacor was trying to move around the largest clump of celebrators so he could gain a vantage point from which to see the Emerald Queen's pavilion. Strange energies floated on the night wind, and old, familiar echoes of distant magic sounded between the notes of song, and Nacor was coming to a conclusion about who and what he would find there. But he wasn't certain, and without certainty he couldn't return to find Callus on the other side of the tributary to tell him what he must do next. The only thing of which he was certain was the need to return to Crondor, to warn Nicholas that whatever he had feared was occurring in this distant land. Far worse forces were being unleashed. Subtle, behind the ancient magic of the Pantathians, a lingering scent of alien origin hung in the air. Glancing skyward, Nacor smelled demon essences in the clouds, as if ready to fall like rain. He shook his head. I'm getting tired, he muttered to himself, as he picked his way among giant Sa'our warriors. One of Nacor's better tricks, as he called his abilities, was the knack of moving in crowds without attracting undue notice. But it didn't always work, and this moment was one such time. A Sa'our warrior looked down and snarled, Where do you go, human? Its voice was deep, and its accent sounded harsh to Nacor. Nacor regarded the hooded eyes, deep red irises surrounded by white. I am insignificant, O oh mighty one. I cannot see. I move to a place from which I may better observe this wondrous rite. Nacor had been curious about the Sa'our when he had first reached the heart of the camp. But now he was anxious to remove himself from them. They were still a mystery to him. They bore as much resemblance to the Pantathians as humans did to elves, which was to say that superficially they looked very similar, but upon close examination they were totally unrelated. Nacor was almost certain they came from another world entirely, and that they were warm-blooded creatures, like men, elves, and dwarves, while he knew the Pantathians were not. He would have liked to be able to discuss such theories with an educated Sa'awa, but all he had encountered were young male warriors with an attitude toward humans that could only be called contemptuous. He had no doubt that should the men in this camp not be servants of this Emerald Queen, the Sa'awa would have been delighted to murder every human in the camp. They could barely keep their antipathy for humans in check. The average Sa'awa stood between nine and ten feet in height. The Sa'awas were massive in chest and shoulder, but strangely delicate of neck and while their legs were strong enough to control their massive horses, they didn't seem to be a race of runners or jumpers. On foot, any good company of humans could prove their match, thought Nacor. The lizard man grunted, and Nacor didn't know if that was approval or not, but he took it as permission to move on, and he did so, judging he would deal with the consequences of being wrong if he turned out to be. He was not. The warrior returned his attention to the welcoming ritual. The pavilion of the Emerald Queen was raised up on a giant dais, constructed either of wood or of earth, Nacor couldn't tell which, but six feet higher than the other tents in this part of the camp. The structure was surrounded by a host of Sa'awa, and for the first time Nacor saw Pantathian priests beyond. Even more, he saw Pantathian warriors as well. Nacor grinned, for this was a new thing to his experience, and he always enjoyed discovering the unfamiliar. The priest now turned and threw the slaughtered sheep onto a pyre, and then cast scented oils after it. The smoke that rose was fragrant and thick, dark and coiling. The priest and the rest of the Sa'awa watched intently. Then the priest pointed and spoke in an alien language, but the tone was positive, and Nacor guessed he was saying the spirits were pleased with the offering, or the portents were good, or some other priestly mumbo-jumbo. Nacor squinted as a figure emerged from within the depths of the pavilion, a man in green armor, followed by another, who made way for a third, whose green armor was trimmed in gold. This powerful-looking man was General Fadawa, first commander of the host. Nacor sensed evil hung around the man like smoke around a fire. For a soldier, he fairly reeked of magic. Then came a woman with emeralds at her neck and wrists, dressed in a green gown cut low in front, 
so that the fall of emeralds at her throat could be better shown. Upon her raven hair she wore a crown of emeralds. Nacor muttered, That is a lot of emeralds, even for you. The woman moved in a way Nacor found disturbing, and when she came forward to answer the cheers of her army, he became deeply troubled. Something was profoundly wrong. He studied her and listened as she spoke. My faithful, I who am your lady, who am but a vassal for one much greater, I thank you for your gifts. The Sky Horde of the Sa'our and the Emerald Queen promise you victory in this life and immortal reward in the next. Our spies return to tell us the unbelievers lie in wait just three days' march to the south. Soon we shall move to crush them, then fall upon the heathen cities and reduce them to cinders. Each victory comes more swiftly than the last, and our numbers grow. The woman called the Emerald Queen, stepped forward to the very edge of the dais, and looked down on the faces of those nearest to her, both Sa'our and human. Pointing to one man, she said, You shall be my messenger to the gods this night. The man raised his fist in triumph and ran up the first four steps to the dais. He threw himself across the final two, so his head was on the floor before his mistress. She raised her foot and placed it on the man's head for a moment in ritual, then removed it, turning to move back into the tent. The man rose with a grin, winked back at his comrades, who cheered him and followed the queen into her pavilion. Oh, this is very bad, whispered Nacor. He glanced around and saw the celebration was building in intensity. Soon men would be drunk and fighting, as much as was allowed, and given the lax discipline Nacor had seen in this part of the army, he suspected much brawling and even bloodshed were tolerated. Now he would have to work his way through a company of very drunk, drug-crazed killers and seek a way across the river to Callus, assuming he could locate Callus's camp. Nacor was never one to worry, and this certainly wasn't a time to begin. Still, he was anxious that he not delay too long, for now he knew what was behind all the conflict that had been underway for the last twelve years, and what was more, he realized he might be the only man in the world who would fully understand all the different aspects of what he had just seen. Shaking his head in consternation at the complexities of life, the little man started negotiating his way back away from the edge of the Emerald Queen's pavilion. A courier rode up and asked, Are you Captain Callus? Callus said, I am. Orders, you have to take your company and ford the river. He motioned to some place to the north of him, so Eric, who sat nearby, assumed the ford must be close at hand, and conduct a sweep along the far bank for ten miles downstream. Jilani tribesmen were seen by one of our scouts. The generals want to keep the opposite bank free of such pests. He turned and rode away as Prodi said, Pests? Looking after the retreating courier, he shook his head in disbelief. Obviously that lad has never encountered any of the Jilani. Neither have I, said Callus. Who are they? Prodi spoke while he casually picked up his kit and made ready to ride out. Barbarians. He paused and said, No, savages, really. Tribespeople. No one knows who they are or where they come from. They speak a tongue only a few can master, and they rarely give anyone from outside a chance to learn it. They're tough, and they fight like maniacs. They wander the plain of Jams or up in the foothills of the Rottengari, hunting the big bison herds or chasing elk and deer. Picking up his own bedroll, Vacha said, Most of the trouble folks on this side of the river have with them is over horses. They're the best damn horse thieves in the world. A man's rank is earned by how many enemies he's killed and how many horses he's stolen. They don't ride them, they eat them, so I heard. Well, they give us much trouble, said Callus. Hell, we probably won't even see one, answered Prodji. He tossed his bedroll to Eric and said, Hang on to that for me for a minute. He bent to get a bag that contained the rest of his personal belongings. They're tough little guys, about half again the size of dwarves. And with an evil grin, he pointed at Rue. Just like him. The men laughed as Prodji reclaimed his bedroll from Eric, and they started moving toward the picket line of horses. The Longville and Foster began calling orders to the company to ride. Prodji said, They can vanish into that tall grass across the river like they were spirits. They live in these low huts they put together out of woven grass, and you can be standing ten feet from one and never see it. Difficult folks to figure. But they can fight, said Vaja. As they started readying their horses, Prodji said, That indeed they can do. There, Captain, now you know as much about the Jelani as just about any man born in these parts. 
Carla said, well, if they want to avoid trouble, we should be able to make a swing ten miles to the south and back before sundown. As if concerned over something, he looked back at the main body of the camp, then said to Longville, Leave a squad to look after things. Lowering his voice, he said, And tell them to keep an eye out for Nacor. Foster motioned to another squad that was moving to saddle their horses and gave them instructions. Eric glanced back as he lifted his saddle to place it on the back of his own mount. Where was Nacor, he wondered. Nacor grunted as he picked up the plank, silently cursing the fool at the other end who didn't seem to realize something existed called coordinated effort. The man, whose name was unknown to Nacor, but whom he thought of as that idiot, insisted on lifting, moving, and dropping without bothering to mention it to Nacor. As a result, over the last two days, Nacor had accumulated an astonishing collection of splinters, scrapes, and bruises. Nacor had encountered difficulties returning to Callus's company. The muster had finally halted with the Corps Army to the north of this tributary to the River Vedra, while Callus and other new mercenary companies were to the south. Passing across the smaller river was now accomplished only by riders with official-looking passes, issued by the generals. Nacor had three such passes in his bag, having stolen them two nights before, but he didn't want to try to use one until he could study it, and there hadn't been any place to study the documents without attracting attention. Besides the risk of losing such documents, Nacor had a predisposition not to call attention to himself unless there was a reason to do so. But the generals had ordered a bridge rebuilt across this tributary, and the work gang was diligently doing just that. Nacor figured he would pose as a worker, and when the bridge reached the opposite shore, he would simply vanish into the crowd on the other bank. Unfortunately, the work was going more slowly than he had hoped, since the labor turned out to be slave labor, and as such the workers were in no hurry. Also, he was now being closely guarded at night. The guards might not have noticed him when he arrived. If there was an extra slave in a squad, the guard would merely assume he had miscounted in the morning, but he would be certain to notice if there was one less. Which meant Nacor would have to wait for exactly the right moment to vanish into the companies of mercenaries. He knew that once he was free of the guards watching the work gang, he would have no trouble staying free, but he wished to create as ideal a moment as possible before he attempted it. A manhunt in the southern camp might prove amusing, but Nacor knew that he must share what he had learned with Callus and the others before too long, so that they could start planning their escape from this army and their eventual return to Crondor. That idiot dropped his end of the plank before Nacor could move, and as a result he took more splinters in his shoulder. He was about to do one of his tricks in retaliation, a sting to the buttocks that would make the man think he had sat on a hornet, when a chill passed over him. He glanced back and felt his chest tighten, for a Pantathian priest stood not ten feet away, watching the construction, speaking quietly to a human officer. Nacor set down his end of the plank and hurried back for another, keeping his eyes down. Nacor had encountered the Pantathians and their handiwork before, while traveling with a man who was now Prince of Crondor, but he had never seen a living Pantathian that close. As he passed the creature, he noticed a faint odor and remembered having heard of this smell before. Very reptilian, yet alien. Nacor bent to pick up another plank and saw that idiot stumble over a rock. He lost his balance and took a half-step toward the Pantathian. The creature reacted, turning with a clawed hand, sweeping out. The talon struck across that idiot's chest, ripping his tunic as if they were knives. Deep cuts of crimson appeared as the man cried out. Then he went weak in the knees and collapsed to lie twitching on the ground. The human officer said to Nacor, Get him out of here. And Nacor and another slave grabbed the fallen man. By the time they had moved him back to the slave's compound, the man was dead. Nacor studied the face, frozen in death with eyes open, and watched closely. After a few minutes, he was certain he knew exactly what poison the Pantathian had on his claws. It was no natural venom, but something created by mixing several deadly plant toxins together, and Nacor found this revelation fascinating. He was also fascinated by the Pantathian's need to demonstrate before the human officer his deadly ability to kill with a touch. There were politics here in the camp of the Emerald Queen that were not obvious to those far from the heart of power, and Nacor wished he had the time to try to uncover more about them. Any struggle in the enemy camp was good to know about, but unfortunately he couldn't afford to spend the time insinuating himself where he could observe the byplays of power. A guard said, Drop in there. 
pointing to a garbage heap that would be hauled away by a wagon at sundown and dumped at a fill a mile or so away from the river. Nacor did as he was bid, and the guard ordered the two slaves to return to work. Nacor hurried down to the building site, but the Pantathian and the human officer were now gone. He felt a brief regret that he couldn't study the serpent priest any longer, and even more regret that that idiot had been killed. The man had deserved to have his backside stung, but he hadn't deserved to die painfully as a poison shut down his lungs and heart. Nacor worked until the noon meal. He sat on the bridge, now only a few yards from the other bank, dangling his feet above the water as he ate the tasteless gruel and hard bread to keep his strength up. All the while he ate, he wondered what Callus and the others were doing. Callus motioned for the outriders on the right flank to keep an even line of sight one man to the next, for a half-mile. Signals from the closest man indicated the order was understood. They had been riding since noon and still had no sign of anyone near the bank. Either the report of those tribesmen being nearby was an error, or they had left the area, or they were, as Praji had said, able to keep themselves from being seen. Eric watched for any unexpected movement in the grass, but it was a breezy afternoon, and the tall grass moved like water. It would take eyes far better than his to see someone moving through this sheltering plain. A short time later, Kala said, If we don't find something within the next half hour, we should return. We'll be getting back to the ford in the dark as it is now. A shout from an outrider, and everyone looked to the west. Eric used his hand to shade his eyes against the afternoon sunlight and saw a rider frantically signaling from the base of a large mound. Callus motioned, and the column turned toward the rider. When they reached the base of the hillock, Eric could see it was covered in the same grass as the plains, making it look like nothing so much as an inverted shaggy bowl. Almost completely round, it was some distance from the next rise, the beginning of a series of hills leading toward the distant mountains. "'What is it?' asked Callus. "'Tracks in a cave, Captain,' answered the outrider. Praji and Vaja exchanged questioning looks and dismounted. They led their horses close to the cave and inspected it. A short entrance, one a man could enter stooped over, led back into the gloom. Callas glanced down. Old tracks. Then he moved to the entrance and ran his hand over the stone edge of the cave. This isn't natural, said Callas. Or if it is, said Praji, also running his hand along the wall, someone's done some work on it to make it more sturdy. There's stonework under this dirt. He brushed away the dirt and revealed some fitted stones underneath. Sarakan, said Vaja. Maybe, conceded Praji. Sarakan, asked Callus. Praji remounted his horse and said, It's an abandoned dwarven city in the Rottengari Mountains. All of it underground. Some humans moved in a few centuries back, some cult of lunatics, and they've died out. Now it just sits empty. People are always stumbling across entrances down near the gulf said Vaja, and in the foothills near the Great South Forest. Callus said, Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's hundreds of miles from here. True, said Praji, but the damn tunnels run everywhere. He pointed to the hillock. That one could be connected somewhere over there, he pointed at the distant mountains, or it could simply go back a few hundred feet and stop. Depends on who built it, but it looks like one of the entrances to Sarakan. Rue ventured. Maybe it's built by the same dwarves, but it's a different city? Maybe, said Praji. It's been a long time since any dwarves lived anywhere but the mountains, and city folk don't linger on the plain of John's. Callus said, Could we use this as a depot? Leave some weapons and supplies here if we need to come down this side of the river? Praji said, I wouldn't, Captain. If the Jelani are around here, they may be using this as a base. Callus was silent for a moment. Then he spoke loudly enough for the entire troop, except for the other outriders, to hear. Mark this location in your minds. Check the distant landscapes. We may be very needful of finding this exact spot soon. If we need to break from the camp, for any reason, or fight our way out, if you can't make straight for the city of Lanara, make for this mound. Those who do meet here, make your way to the south the best you can. The city of the Serpent River is your final goal, for one of our ships should be waiting there. Eric looked around and then looked down at his mount. If he put her nose in line with two peaks in the distant mountains, the one that looked like a broken fang and the other that looked like a clump of grapes, to his imagination, 
and kept the river at his back while keeping another distant peak off his left side, he thought he should be able to find his way back here. After the men had taken their bearings, Callus turned to an outrider up on a distant hill who was watching. Callus made the arm signals to indicate they were turning back. The man acknowledged the order, then turned and signaled an even more distant rider, while Callus gave the order to return to the host of the Emerald Queen. Eighteen. Escape. Nacor waved. He had learned years ago that if you didn't want to be accosted by minor officials, look as if you know exactly what you're doing. The officer standing on the far end of the dock didn't recognize Nacor, as the Isolani knew he wouldn't. Slaves weren't people. One didn't take note of them. And now he didn't look like a slave. He had ducked out of the slave pen the night before, so that the morning and night head count would match. He had wandered around the camp, smiling and chatting, until he had reached the place where he had secreted his belongings when he had run off to play construction worker. Then at dawn he had wandered back to the slave pens and fallen in a few yards behind the work gang. He had moved along the newly constructed bridge, past a guard who started to ask him something, when Nacor patted him on the shoulder in a friendly fashion and said, Good morning, leaving the guard scratching his chin. Now he called to the officer, Here, yeah, catch, and threw him his bundle of bedroll and shoulder sack. The officer reacted without thought and caught the bundle, then set it down as if it were covered in bugs. By then, Nacor had jumped the five feet, separating the end of the bridge and the south shore foundation of rocks. He landed and stood up, saying, I didn't want to take the chance of dropping the bundle in the water. There are important documents in it. Important? asked the officer as Nacor picked up his bundle. Thank you. I must be getting those orders to the captain. The officer hesitated, which was his undoing, for in that moment, while he tried to frame his next question, Nacor slipped behind a party of horsemen riding past, and when they had moved on, the little man was nowhere in sight. The officer stood peering this way and that, and failed to notice that a few feet away, there were now seven sleeping mercenaries around a cold campfire, where moments before there had been only six. Nacor lay motionless, listening for any sign of alarm. He grinned as he lay there, his usual reaction to pulling off a good vanishing act. He found it amazing that most people never noticed what was going on right before their noses. He took a deep breath, closed his eyes, and started to doze. Less than an hour later, he heard a voice and opened his eyes. One of the soldiers next to him was sitting up and yawning. Nacor turned over and saw that the officer he had flummoxed was standing with his back toward the camp. Nacor rolled to his feet, said, Good morning, to the still half-asleep mercenary, and moved off down the trail toward where he hoped Callus was camped. Eric looked up from where he sat, a few feet away from Callus, the Longville, and Foster, polishing his sword. They had returned to camp after nightfall, and Callus had gone to report to the officer's tent near the bridge, while Eric and the others tended the horses. When he returned, he showed no sign of how the meeting went, but Callus rarely showed anything that Eric could read as pleasure or irritation. But now Eric saw a small betrayal of emotion as Callus rose with an expectant expression. Nacor was making his way across the narrow trail that had been worn by hooves and feet between the eagle's camp and the one to the east. The little man came trudging into view with his seemingly ever-present grin in place. Woof, he said, sitting down heavily on the ground next to Foster. That was some doing, finding you. Lots of bird banners and lots of red things, and most of these men, he pointed in general at most of the other companies nearby, don't care who's next to them. This is one very ignorant bunch. Praji, who was lying back picking his teeth with a long sliver of wood, said, We're not being paid to think. True. What did you discover? asked Callus. Nacor leaned forward and lowered his voice so that Eric had to strain to overhear, though he and the others in his squad were trying hard to look as if they weren't. I don't think it's such a good idea to talk about this here, but let's say that when I can tell you, you don't want to know what I saw. Yes, I do, said Callus. Nacor nodded. I understand, but you'll understand what I mean when I tell you. Just let me say that if you have a plan for us to get out of here, tonight would be a very good time to do it. We don't need to stay any longer. Callus said, Well, now that we know where the fort is, we could try to slip across or bluff our way and tell the patrol at the bank that we're going out on another sweep to the south. Nacor opened his ever-present bag, slung over his shoulder, and said, Maybe one of these passes would fool them? 
Eric tried hard not to laugh at the expression on Foster's and DeLongville's faces. They looked at the documents, and DeLongville said, I'm not an expert in reading this gibberish, but these look authentic. Oh, they are, said Nacor. I stole them from Lord Fadawa's tent. DeLongville said, The Queen's Lord High General? That's the man. He was busy, and no one noticed, as I was playing the part of a slave. I thought one of these might do us some good. I wanted to poke around. There's something very funny about that general. He's not what he seems to be. And if I hadn't been in such a hurry to get my news to you, I would have stayed around to see just what this general really is. Callus looked through the four documents. This might do it. It's a vaguely worded order commanding all units to let the bearer pass. It doesn't say if the bearer will have a full company of more than a hundred men with him, but I think if we can keep our wits about us it might work. Praji stood. Well, the day is half done, and if we're going to be convincing about a local patrol, we'd better be on our way now. Or did you want to wait until tomorrow morning? Callus glanced at Nacor, who shook his head slightly in the negative. We leave now, said Callus. Order was passed from man to man to act as if there was little urgency, but to get ready quickly to ride. If anyone in the other campsites took notice, Eric couldn't see. The surrounding companies seemed intent upon their own business. The coming and going of another troop of men seemed of little interest. In less than an hour, Foster had the men in file, and Callus motioned for Eric's squad, the first in line, to fall in behind his own vanguard. Nacor, Praji, Vaja, Atonis, and Alongville. Foster would fall back and take command of the rear guard, the most experienced squad in the company. As Jado Shati and Jerome Handy moved out of line back to where Foster waited, Eric made a good luck sign, which Jado returned along with his broadest grin. They rode northward, along the path to the road, where they paralleled the river until they came in sight of the bridge. That's finishing up quickly, observed Praji. They have many men working on it, said Nacor. I worked on it for a couple of days so I could get across. Vaja said, There are ample forge nearby. Why all the bother? Nacor said, The queen doesn't want to get her feet wet. Callus glanced at the little man, as did Eric. Nacor wasn't smiling. They reached the guard post, and a stout sergeant came forward. What's all this, then? Callus said. Hello again, sergeant. Recognizing Callus from the night before, the sergeant said, Going out again? The generals weren't happy with my report. They think I didn't head far enough south. I'm going out until noon tomorrow. Then I'll be back by morning the day after. No one said anything to me about your company crossing the river, Captain said the sergeant, looking suspicious. Or anyone being out for more than a day. Callus calmly held out the pass. The general had made up his mind just a short time ago. He gave me this rather than relying on a messenger getting to you before we were ready to leave. The sergeant said, Damn officers. We've got our orders, and then some captain of some company thinks he can get his drinking buddy to change the way we do things. Which of those strutting peacocks thinks he can just sign his name? His voice trailed off and his eyes widened as he saw the name and seal at the bottom of the pass. If you want to send a messenger to General Fadawa to tell him that he's not observing procedures, and you want confirmation, we'll wait, said DeLongville. I just as soon not have to go looking for the Jelani. Hell, I don't think the general will mind, Sergeant. The sergeant quickly rolled up the pass and handed it back to Callus. Hear me, Cross, he said, waving them past. He turned to the soldiers at the bank and shouted, they're crossing to the other side. They waved back and resumed their bored poses while Callus walked his horse down to where they stood and into the water, taking it slowly and carefully. Eric felt the back of his neck itch as if someone behind would start shouting they were trying to escape, or someone else would be warning the sergeant that a pass had been stolen from the general's tent. But they moved across the shallow ford in the river until the last company, with Corporal Foster, the last man, had safely crossed. Then Callus motioned for them to pick up speed, and they all started moving south at a trot. Eric found himself fighting an unusually strong urge to dig his heels in and get his horse galloping. He wondered how many of the others felt the same way. When they had moved some distance downriver, Callus ordered them to a canter, and they rode at a good rate for another mile before he signaled for them to return to a trot. Nacor shouted, You want me to tell you now? Callus said, Yes, before you fall off and break your neck. Nacor grinned. That's bad. You remember our old friend, the Lady Clovis? Callus nodded. 
Eric had no idea who she might be, but the darkening expression on Callis's face said he knew her. What surprised him was that the Longville registered no recognition. But Praji said, That bitch who was using the Hakan and the overlord Valgosh down at the city of the Serpent River way back when we first met her? That's her, said Nacor. She's the Emerald Queen? asked Callus. Nacor shook his head. I wish it was so. Jorna, that's her real name, at least back when we were married. What? gaped Callus, and for the first time Eric saw him totally lose his composure. It's a long story. I'll tell you some other time. But when she was a girl, she was vain, and when we were together, she was always seeking ways to stay young forever. I think if we get out of this, you're going to tell me every detail, said de Longville, obviously as astonished as Callus. Anyway, said Nacor, motioning for him not to interrupt. The girl had talent for tricks, what you call magic, and she left me when I wouldn't tell her secrets I didn't have about staying young forever. She was using a different body when she was the Lady Clovis. A different body, said Praji, now obviously confused. How did you recognize her? When you know someone well, bodies don't matter, said Nacor. I guess, said Vaja, obviously amused by the entire conversation. Shut up, said Nacor. This is serious. This woman made a bargain with the Pantathians to keep her young forever while she helped them. What she didn't know was they were using her. I warned her. I told her they want more than you can ever give them. And I was right. They've taken her. What do you mean? asked Callus. Nacor's expression turned grim. What happened to your father with the armor of white and gold? Yes, said Callus color draining from his face. It's happening again. Jorna, or Clovis, is wearing an emerald crown, and it's changing her. She is becoming like your father. Callus looked shaken and said nothing for a moment. Then he turned to de Longville. Tell Foster I want a rear guard to follow by fifteen minutes. I want to know if anyone tries to overtake us. If they encounter anyone, their fastest rider is to come find us, while the others are to lead whoever's coming away. We'll wait for a short time at the cave we found two days ago, then we'll strike straight for Lanada. De Longville said, And if those who come after don't take the bait? Make them take the bait, said Callus. De Longville nodded once, turned his horse, and rode to the end of the column. Eric looked back and saw Foster and six other men slow, and then stop after De Longville gave the order. They would wait a quarter hour, then start riding after Callus's company, hoping they would get the chance to catch up in a day or two. It was mid-morning the next day when someone at the rear of the column shouted, Rider! Eric looked over his shoulder and saw Jado Shati riding the life out of his horse. The animal was completely lathered, and from the huge extension of her nostrils, Eric could tell she couldn't catch her breath. She was blown out and ruined, he was certain. Jado was familiar enough with horses to realize he was killing the mare, so Eric knew it could only mean trouble. He untied the cord that held his sword in its scabbard, as he did not need to be told that they were about to fight. For in the distance, less than a mile behind Jado, came a dust cloud. Eric saw the figures on the horizon, and before Jado could get close enough to speak, Eric shouted, It's the Sir Hour! De Longville asked, How can you tell? The horses look too big for the distance behind Jado. Just then, Jado came within shouting range and cried out, Captain! It's the lizard men! They are following! Callus turned to De Longville and said, We stay in the saddle. Skirmish in two lines. De Longville shouted, you heard the captain. I want the first fifty men dressed left on me. That meant that the first fifty men in the column would line up on de Longville's left arm in a straight line. Eric was the man closest to de Longville when he moved his horse around. Jado came reining in, his mouth staggering as he leaped off. Kala shouted, Where's Forster? Jado shook his head. They bought none of it. As soon as they took off, they followed me and ignored the corporal. The corporal turned around and hit them from the flank, buying me a head start, Captain, but... He didn't have to say any more. Eric thought of the big man, Jerome Handy, who had become something of a friend after being embarrassed by Chopi aboard the ship. He glanced to his right and saw Chopi and nodded. Chopi nodded back as if he understood what Eric was thinking. Louis said, Dan, we bleed lizards, under his breath, but loud enough for those near him to hear. Eric drew his sword and put his reins between his teeth. He unlimbered his shield and made ready. 
He'd control his mount with his legs, but he kept the reins in his jaws in case he needed to yank them. The Sa'awa's animals must be as incredibly strong as their riders, thought Eric, for if Jado's mount was near death, the Sa'awa's looked merely tired. Yet the green-skinned warriors didn't pause once they saw the line of soldiers facing them. We don't scare them much, observed Nakor from behind Eric, who wouldn't take his eyes off the approaching riders. Kata said, When I give the order, I want bowfire. Then the first rank will charge. The second rank will hold until I give the order. The bowmen, all in the center of the second line, drew back their weapons, and the Longville half muttered, Wait for it. The Sa'awa bore down relentlessly, and as they approached, Eric started noticing details. Some wore feathers on their helms, while others had strange animals and birds on their shields. The horses were bay and chestnut, with some that were almost black, but while a few were near white, he saw no buckskins or mottled colors. Eric wondered why he was fascinated by the fact of there being no pintos or buckskins. He fought down an unexpected urge to laugh. Then Kala shouted, Shoot! And the forty archers in the second line let loose. The rain of shafts caused a half-dozen riders to fall, and several of the alien horses screamed. Then Kala shouted, Charge! Eric dug his heels into his horse's flanks, and with a shout and a powerful squeeze of his legs, told the horse to gallop. He didn't look to see how the others were doing, but kept his focus on a sa'awa with a metal crest topped with a horsehair fall atop his helm. The horsehair had been bleached and dyed a bright crimson, so it was an easy target for Eric. Eric sensed more than saw when his own horse crashed into the larger animal. He was too intent on avoiding the blow aimed at his neck. The sa'awa warrior used a large single-bladed axe, which meant he could bludgeon with it on the backswing, but cut only with a forward blow. Eric almost fell into the gap between the two animals after his own mount staggered away from the larger horse. Eric ducked under the looping blow, but recovered in time to deliver a punishing blow with his sword to the thigh of the sa'awa. He didn't see if the creature fell from the saddle or rode past because he was too busy engaging another warrior who had just unhorsed one of Hatonis's clansmen. Eric charged him and got his sword point under the creature's shield before he could turn and face him, and the sa'awa fell backwards, flipping completely over the rear of his horse. Eric swore and reined his own horse away as the riderless alien horse lashed out with a foreleg. Where are the mounts? he cried. They're trained to attack, too. Eric moved to help Rue, who was attempting to work in tandem with Luis against one Sa'awa. He came up on the lizard man's blind side and delivered a killing blow to the back of the creature's helm. The Sa'awa fell over and the helm fell off, revealing an alien face, green and scaled, but covered in scarlet blood. Well, their blood's not green, shouted Bigo, riding by. They're also dying right enough. So are we, said Rue, pointing. Bigo and Eric turned to see that while most of the Sa'awa had been unhorsed, for each one killed, one of their own was down as well. Pushing back his helm, Bigo said, We face them three to one, and still they take us out in equal numbers. Shoot, cried Callus, and the tin archers who remained to him started peppering the five remaining Sa'awa with arrows. Jado said, Look, and pointed into the distance. That's why they're so fearless, shouted the Longville. These are just the trail breakers. Afar, a large column of dust rose into the sky, and even at this distance, the rumble of hooves was thunderous. Eric didn't wait, but set heels to the flanks of his horse and charged after the remaining Sa'awa, who were attempting to keep the humans engaged as long as possible until their companions could overtake them. Bigo let out a whoop and charged after him. They rode full into the same Sa'awa, striking at him from both sides. Eric caught him on the sword arm, shattering bone and cutting deep into flesh, while Bigo hammered relentlessly at the creature's shield. Soon it was quiet. Kala said, Ride for the cave. We'll stand there. Eric sucked a deep lungful of air and willed his tired horse to run. There was no choice. The alien horses were stronger and more powerful and had more endurance. They couldn't outrun them, it was clear, and at one to one, they couldn't outfight the Sa'awa in the open. Eric hoped that the cave tunnel did lead somewhere, as Prodji had claimed. For if it was only a cave in a hill, it would be a lonely place to die. In ragged order, leaving the remounts to follow or wander, Callus's crimson eagles, exhausted and sore from the short but furious fight, headed toward the distant hillock. Nacor was among the first to reach it, and without much grace he half jumped, half fell from his horse. He grabbed a water skin and a bag of rations, then stuck her on the rump, yelling enough to send her running away as he ducked into the cave. As Eric and the others began to dismount, he shouted, There's a door! Come quick! Strike a light, commanded Callus, and Longville produced a special oil and motioned for someone to give him a torch. A bundle of them was fetched from the baggage along with a few other items the men would carry, but most of the baggage, food, and all the horses must be sacrificed. The Longville sprinkled the oil on a torch, then struck flint and steel to cause a spark. The oil caught and the torch was lit, and he ducked inside the cave. Eric followed after and had to duck-walk to pass below the low ceiling. 
After about ten yards, the ceiling rose and the corridor broadened as the passage moved down into an underground cavern. Eric looked for the door and discovered it was a huge round stone. It was nestled in a heavy iron and wooden frame, rigged so it could be rolled from its position to the right of the passage to block it. While a few strong men could use large wooden pegs set in the face to move it from inside this cave, those following after would have no handhold on the smooth surface, nor any way to gain enough leverage to move the massive rock. When the last man was inside the cave, Eric, Bigo, and Jado grabbed the wooden pegs and struggled to move the rock. Others insinuated themselves against the wall so they could push against the edge once it moved enough. Slowly, protestingly, the rock budged, and then with a grinding rumble moved as the sound of horsemen echoed through the entrance of the cave. Angry shouts in an alien language echoed down the hall as the grinding stone moved slowly to block their retreat. Suddenly, Eric felt resistance and knew that the Sa'our on the other side had tried to prevent the closing. Push! he shouted, and another pair of hands moved below his, and he looked down to see Rue trying to add his strength to the task. The little man had slipped below and crawled on the floor to find a place from which he could help. Nacor shouted, Close your eyes! Eric was slow and was temporarily blinded by a sudden flash of light as Nacor lit something from De Longville's torch and tossed it through the narrow space between the wall and the slowly moving rock door. A scream and several shouts of rage answered, but the pressure on the door was released, and it closed suddenly with a deep and final thud. Eric felt the shock in his shoulders as it slammed into the opposite wall. His knees felt suddenly weak, and he sat down on the cold cave floor. He heard Big O laugh. That was closer than I like. Eric found himself laughing, too, and looked over at Jado. Foster and Jerome? Jado shook his head. They all died like men. Callus said, Bobby, light another torch so we can see where we're going. Do we have another torch? asked the sergeant. A voice in the dark said, In the bundle here, sergeant. Callus said, Bigo, while we're looking ahead, I want you and Von Darkmoor to do an inventory. We've left most of what we had outside, but I want to see what we have here. He glanced around. Though if there's not another way out, it really doesn't matter, does it? Without waiting for an answer, he moved off into the gloom as De Longville lit a second torch, handed it to Louise, and moved after the captain. Nacor hurried to grab a few loose rocks and lay them between the stone and the floor. Won't roll back very well if they do get a grip, he said with a grin. Bigo turned and said, all right, me darlings, you heard the captain. Look around and tell old Big Ol what your thieving rascals grabbed when you ran for your lives. Eric chuckled, but knew it was just relief at still being alive. He didn't know who else had noticed, but when he ran into the dark, he had looked back over his shoulder and seen at least thirty of the hundred or more men who had left that morning lying dead on the ground. They had survived the first encounter of a long and bitter journey to come, and almost a third of them were already dead. He put that thought from his mind and began looking to see what resources they had. Hours passed, and there were faint sounds from the other side of the rock door, so they knew the Sa'our were contriving ways to move the boulder and come after them. At one point, Rue wondered aloud what they would do if some Sa'our magician came along and used magic to open the door, and the anger that greeted the remark caused the wiry man to fall instantly silent. Eric couldn't remember a time when Rue had been shut up so quickly or effectively. When Callus finally returned, Bigo said, We've got food for four or five days, Captain. A few extra weapons, but mostly what each of us is carrying. We've got plenty of gold and gems, because the sergeant there grabbed the pace axe. And we've got a fair supply of bandages and herbs. But all our camp gear is gone, and a lot of us are going to be thirsty if we don't find water quickly. Callus said, The tunnel seems to head down gradually and toward the foothills. I saw signs that someone's used this route not too long ago, maybe a month, but no more than that. Tribesmen? asked Rue. Doesn't matter, said Praji, standing up. Unless you're anxious to face that angry pack of lizards waiting out there. He pointed to the door. We go that way, he pointed into the gloom. Callus said, everyone ready? No one said no, and Callus turned to De Longville. Get them into some sort of order, and let's start seeing where this passage leads. De Longville nodded once, then turned and gave the command. Once the men found their way to the positions they normally took while riding, a sense of the familiar surrounded Eric, as if following orders made the closeness of the tunnel and the gloom bearable. Then Callus gave the word, and they moved off into the darkness. 19. Discovery A gong sounded. It echoed off vast ceilings of carved and colored stone, ringing through the great hall, and the warden turned. 
Miranda saw him regarding her with impassive features, but he made no threatening gesture as she approached. She had been flying across the mountains since leaving the vast city known as the Necropolis, the city of the dead gods. Following the instructions given her by the fortune teller in the inn, she had returned to Midkemia and found her way back to Novindus, and from there to the Necropolis. Then she flew upward, guided by her arts, despite her fatigue, and she sought out this mythical place atop the mountains called the Pavilion of the Gods. At last, when she had to use her powers to preserve air around her, she found what she sought, a splendid place atop a cloud, a vast series of halls and galleries that seemed created out of ice and crystal, as well as stone and marble. The clouds thinned, and she saw that the massive building stood atop the summit of the greatest mountain in the area, and in the center stood a single immense opening. She floated through the clouds surrounding the celestial city, moving through the door effortlessly. She felt a tingle as she passed through the spell that kept the freezing cold out and the air inside. The man she had spied across the grand hall floated across the vast expanse of floor to meet her. She took a moment to study her surroundings. A vaulted ceiling was suspended nearly seventy flights of steps above his head, supported by twelve mighty columns of stone, each chosen for beauty. She quickly chose her own favorite, one fashioned of malachite, the green veins of polished stone that could capture the eyes for hours. The rose quartz was lovely, too, but something about the green stone spoke to her. The floor of the hall was partitioned by some faint energy. Miranda used every trick of perception she had, and decided the fields were not barriers or traps, but something closer to signatures, as if each area had a specific use or identity, but only noted for those able to sense those energy barriers. And in each area beings moved, humans from their outward appearance, but all wearing some of the strangest fashions she had ever seen. The great windows were set with crystal panes so clear they seemed air frozen in an instant, and the snowfields outside reflected the afternoon sunlight on the peaks above, bathing the great hall in rose and golden hues. Those people moving across the vast floor threw long shadows, as jeweled, faceted globes threw soft white light across the hall, the source of that light having nothing to do with nature. The approaching man glided through the air, standing regally as if being carried by a company of invisible bearers upon a heavy platform. He touched foot to the stone floor of the hall, as Miranda gently touched down on the marble floor. Several others nearby turned to observe the confrontation, though they remained silent. Miranda threw back her cloak's hood, shaking her dark hair as she glanced around the hall. Who comes to the celestial city? With amusement, she answered, a fine lot of gods you are, if you don't know who comes to your own palace to visit. I am called Miranda. The warden said, None may invade the precinct of the gods without invitation. Miranda grinned. Odd. I'm here, aren't I? None may invade without permission and live to leave, said the warden. Well, consider me an uninvited guest, not an invader. What cause brings you to the hall of the gods? Miranda inspected the figure before her. Like the others who inhabited the hall, he wore an odd robe, tight-fitting across the shoulders, but billowing out below the arms, forming a perfect circle at the hem, almost six feet in diameter. Miranda guessed there was a thin band of metal or heavy cord sewn into the hem. The sleeves were long and also flared along the length, while the collar was stiff and high, surrounding the back of the head up to the ears, giving Miranda the impression that she spoke to a six-foot-tall doll, fashioned from interlocking cones of paper with a painted clay head stuck on the top. What a peculiar-looking character, she thought. His face had olive-shaded skin, darkened by years of exposure to bright sun, and his beard was as white as the snow outside. Eyes of pale blue regarded her from under white brows. She glanced around the hall, wishing she had more time to study the place. Its grandeur was nothing less than breathtaking, yet somehow it was alien and as cold as the wind outside the great door. No mortal lacking great magic could find his way to this abode of the gods, for the climb was impossible. At least a hundred feet below the base of the plateau, the air became too thin to breathe long and remain alive, and the temperature was constantly below freezing. Most of the people were turned her way, and she noticed that each group seemed set off, 
isolated by the sense of separate areas she had detected upon entering, as if there was a zone on the floor they were confined to. After a moment she was certain no one was leaving a given area to enter another. You limit the gods? asked Miranda. They limit themselves, as they always have, came the answer. Again, I must ask, what cause brings you here? I come because there are terrible forces gathering, and this world stands in jeopardy. I have visited with the oracle of Ahal, and she is ready to enter her breeding phase. Her vision will be lost to us. Those forces that march are committed to a course of action that will bring about the end of all we know, including this. She waved her hand, indicating the hall. The warden closed his eyes a moment, and Miranda knew something was being communicated. Then he said, Speak more. Of what? Of what you hope to find here. I had hoped for some sense that the gods of Midkemia were ready to answer the threat to their very existence. Her anger was poorly hidden, and contempt edged her words. These are but the aspects of the gods, answered the warden. Those men and women who have, for reasons beyond our mortal understanding, been chosen to exist on the gods' behalf. They have come to live out their lives as mortal aspects of the gods, eyes and ears, granting the gods' mortal perspective on the world in which they abide. Miranda nodded. Then I would speak to one of these godly aspects, if you don't mind. I have nothing to say in the matter, came the answer. I am but the warden of the celestial city. It is my task to keep those who abide here comfortable. He closed his eyes. You may speak to whoever will answer. Walking past the warden, Miranda approached the area nearest the entrance, where a group of men and women stood surrounding one who loomed over them by a full head. All wore white, without a hint of color, and the woman at the center of the group had hair without hue. Her skin was also without pigmentation, but rather than possessing the look of an albino, she appeared to be of some alien race, with skin truly white in color. Those who surrounded her stepped aside, allowing Miranda to approach. At a respectful distance, Miranda bowed her head. Then she said, Sung, I plead for help. The living incarnation of the goddess stared down at the young woman. Her eyes held mysteries Miranda could only begin to guess, but her face presented a kindly visage. Yet no answer was forthcoming. Miranda pressed on. A great evil arises here, one that, unchecked, will release forces to rival even your own. I must seek aid. For a long moment the goddess studied Miranda. Then, with an economy of motion, she indicated that the woman should move to another area. Seek one not yet come among us. Miranda hurried to another quarter of the hall, in which an empty area stood ready, but unoccupied. Shifting her perceptions through each phase of sight she knew, Miranda searched for some hint of what she might find here. A glyph shimmered in a spectrum of light beyond the ability of most men to see, yet Miranda saw it. She turned to discover the warden had followed her, floating a foot above the stone floor. Who placed such a mark here? One who recently visited, like you. What does the symbol mean? It is the mark of Odan Hosper, one of the lost gods whom we await. You await the return of gods lost during the Chaos Wars? She asked in surprise. Everything is possible in the Hall of the Gods. What was the name of this man? I may not say. I am seeking Pug of Stardock, said Miranda. At the inn in the Hall of Worlds I was told to come here. The warden shrugged. Such matters are not my concern. Has he been here? I may not say. Miranda thought, then asked, If you can say nothing else, where might I go next to find this man? The warden hesitated. It may be that you need to look at that place where you were misled. Miranda said, I thought as much. 
With a wave of her arm she was gone, a faint popping sound, the only indication of her having been there. One of the people attending a nearby guard turned and threw back his hood. He was short of stature, his eyes the color of dark walnut, aged and stained, his beard as dark as that of a lad of twenty, but his manner and size did little to disguise the aura of power that surrounded him. Stepping over to where the warden waited, he said, You have served your purpose. With a wave of his hand, the figures in the hall vanished, leaving only a vast emptiness of rock and ice. Cold air rang in through the now unprotected opening, and bit with enough harshness to make him gather his cloak tightly around him. Glancing around to see that no trace of illusion remained, he was raising his hands to will himself to another place when a voice said, God, it's cold without that illusion. The man turned, and standing a yard away was the woman. Pug of Stardock? The man nodded. Neatly done, lady. There are few who could have seen through the ruse. She smiled, and something oddly familiar hinted at recognition, then was gone. I didn't. But things just didn't feel right, and I thought if I could seem to have left, then perhaps I might learn something. The man smiled. You simply turned yourself invisible and made the proper noise. The woman nodded. You are Pug. The man said, Yes, I am Pug of Stardock. The woman's face took on an expression of concern, and again there was something hauntingly familiar about her. Good, we must go. There is much to be done. What are you talking about? asked Pug. Kaipur has fallen, and Lanada is undone by treachery. Pug nodded. I know this. But for me to act too soon, and the Pantathians counter your magic with their own, I know. But there is more here than a simple bashing of magics, like rams banging heads in the mountains. Her breath hung in the frigid air, and she waited. Pug said, Before I presume to tell you there are forces at play beyond your knowledge, I suppose I should find out what you know. He vanished. Damn, said Miranda. I hate it when men do that. Pug had two goblets of wine poured when Miranda popped into existence. Why did you do that? If you couldn't follow me, then telling you anything was pointless. Pug handed her a goblet. There's something vaguely familiar about you, he observed. Miranda took the wine and sat down on a divan opposite a writing desk. Pug pulled out the stool that went with the desk and sat down. Where are we? Stardock? She glanced around. The room was small and lacking any decoration. All she could see indicated that this was a library. Books lined every wall save one narrow space that held a window, and besides the divan, desk, and chair, the room was devoid of furniture. A pair of lamps burned, one at each end of the room. Pug nodded. My quarters. No one can get in or out but myself, and no one expects me to visit, as no one has seen me here in twenty-five years. Miranda looked around. Why keep it so? I made a major display of breaking off my ties here, after my wife died. He spoke of her death in a matter-of-fact tone, but Miranda could see a tiny tension around the corners of his eyes as he mentioned this. If someone is to come looking for me, they'll look on Sorcerer's Isle. I have left enough people who work magic there that any spell designed to detect magic will be ringing like a dinner bell. And as magic is being practiced here every day, if you do decide to do some work, no one will notice. She sipped her wine and said, Very neat. And this is very good. Is it? asked Pug. He sipped. Yes, it is. I wonder which... He held up the bottle. I have to ask Gothis if there is more of this in the cellar at Sorcerer's Isle when I return. Why all the misdirection? asked Miranda. Why were you looking for me? I asked you first. Pug nodded. Fair enough. The Pantathians are wary of me and my arts. They've discovered ways to neutralize me, so I make sure they and their agents can't find me. Neutralize you? Her eyes narrowed. I've run across snake magic before, and there are smoking corpses to mark those battles. If you're as powerful as they say, Pug said, 
There are more ways to stem attack than simply to meet it with more strength. What if I were to hold a child you love and put a dagger to her throat? Miranda said, So, if they don't know where you are, they can't threaten anyone you care about. Yes. Now, why are you looking for me? Miranda said, The oracle of Aal enters her birthing cycle, and we lose her ability to help us. I have been asked, By whom? interrupted Pug. By some people who would rather not see this world end any time soon, she snapped. I have been asked to help preserve the life stone. Pug stood. How do you know of the life stone? Miranda said, I am Keshian. Do you remember one who came to support the king's army at the battle? Lord Abdur Rakhmar Mimo Hazarakan, answered Pug. Miranda nodded. It took years to penetrate the illusions and false trails, but after a while those few who entered to speak to the oracle and leave with whatever wisdom she gave them, even with that statue at Malak's cross as the transfer point, even after decades, the truth was known. So you work for the emperor? Do you work for the king? countered Miranda. Boric and I are something of cousins, said Pug, sipping on his wine again. You beg the question. So I do. He set the goblet down. Let's say that I am somewhat less constricted in my loyalties than I used to be. Which is all beside the point. If you know anything of the lifestone, you know that national interests are petty at this point. If the Valheru reawaken, we will all perish. Then you must help me, said Miranda. If those foolish men I helped recruit for the prince survive, we'll know who and what we face. Pug sighed. You, a Cassian, recruiting for the prince? It seemed the prudent thing to do to serve my real master's interests. Pug only raised an eyebrow. So which foolish men are these? Callus leads them. Tomas's son, said Pug. I haven't seen him since he was young. It must be twenty or more years. He's still young, and angry and confused. He is unique. There is no other creature like him in the universe. He's the product of a union that should not have borne fruit, and he will die some day. Unique. And alone. Pug nodded. Who else? A band of men condemned to die, none known to you. And Nacor the Isolani. Pug smiled. I miss his rambling brilliance and his sense of fun. Miranda said, Fun is far from his mind these days, I fear. With Arutha's death, Nicholas becomes the hope for the Western realm, the kingdom, and the world. He has grudgingly adopted his father's plan, but he has little enthusiasm for it. What plan is this? She told him of the previous voyages to Novindus, and of the destruction endured by Callus and his men the last time. She told him of the plan to send men down to join with the conquering army, men who would return with the truth about what was facing them. Do you think, asked Pug after she finished, that this is anything but a full-scale consolidation of all the armed might in Novindus, so that an attack can be launched across the sea to seize the lifestone? The Pantathians lack subtlety, answered Miranda. But it could be someone is manipulating them the way they manipulated the Moradel during the Great Uprising. Pug conceded that this was true. But every indication is that they are seeking to put all Novendus under their sway, to create the largest army ever seen in this world, and from that it is just one logical step to assume they are going to throw that army at the kingdom, perhaps sail right into Crondor Harbor, then march across half the kingdom to Sethanon. Pug was silent for a moment, then said, I don't think anyone is using them in the sense you suggest. The Pantathians are too alien by other beings' standards, judging by everything I've seen. They have a view of the universe that is so warped it defies logic, but it is so ingrained in their very nature that they have not allowed more than two thousand years of observing the way in which the universe really works to sway them from their fanatic devotion to their unique view of things. Miranda raised an eyebrow. That's a little too analytical for me, Pug. 
I have encountered other fanatics, and reality doesn't seem to sway them much either. She waved off a comment he was about to make. But I see your point. If they move for their own dark purposes in such numbers, then it's clear they risk all or nothing on this massive undertaking. Pug shook his head no, and sighed. Not really. The damnable thing about all this is we can defeat them again, perhaps destroying every man and creature they send across the sea. But what does this gain us, save wholesale ruin on our own shore? We still don't know where they live, Miranda said. Pug nodded, yes. We have only vague rumors. Up north, near the headwaters of the Serpent River, the Serpent Lake, down in the great south forest, somewhere deep in the heart of the forest of Irabek. No one knows. You've looked? Pug nodded. I've used every magic spell I could find or dream up, and have traveled on foot across a great deal of that continent. The sad truth is they are either incredibly gifted in shielding themselves from sight, both magic and mundane, or they are doing something so obvious I'm not seeing it. Miranda sipped her wine. After a moment, she said, That still leaves us with an army to defeat. More, I'm afraid. What? Pug said, I believe that Callus is going to find something far more powerful at the heart of this particular campaign, and I can't tell you why. He went over to a bookshelf. There are several tomes here that speak of doorways, pathways, and routes between different levels of reality. Like the Hall of Worlds? Pug shook his head no. That place exists in the objective universe as we understand it, though it is somewhat of an artifact of creation, allowing those who travel the halls to exist beyond certain limits of that objective reality. Do you remember how real the Hall of the Gods looked? Yes, a most convincing illusion. It was more than an illusion. I tapped into a higher level of reality, a higher energy state, for lack of a better description. A long time ago, I went into the city of the dead gods and entered through a seam into the hall of the goddess of death. I spoke to Lim's Gragma. Interesting, said Miranda. Pug looked at her and saw she was not mocking him. It was really the goddess of death you spoke to? That's the point I'm trying to make. There is no goddess of death, yet there is. There's the natural force of creation and the equally natural act of destruction. What breaks down a once living being provides food for new life. We understand so little of these things, he said, showing a hint of frustration. But these personifications, these gods and goddesses, they may be but a way in which we, who live in one state of reality, can interact with forces, beings, energy from another reality. Interesting theory, said Miranda. Actually, most of it is cause. But what has this to do with all the murder about to be done? Beings from these other states exist. I have faced the dread to name but one. Really? She said, obviously impressed. The stealers of life are not to be trifled with by all reports. That's the first clue I had. Pug's face grew animated as he said, When I fought the dread for the first time, I sensed a different rhythm, a different state to the energy of his being. When I bested him, I learned a few things. Over the years, I've discovered other things. Living on Kelawan, that Sarani homeworld, for a number of years, gave me insights I never would have gained here on Midkemia. One thing I've discovered is that the dread do not drink the life of living beings on this world. They change the energies to a state they can use. The unfortunate side effect of that change is the death of the creature they touch. Such academic considerations are of little interest to those who die, I'm afraid. True, but you see it's important. If they can do that, why can't forces we can't see in our normal frame of reference not be able to reach out and manipulate energy here in our world? Where are we going with this? asked Miranda, betraying impatience. What was the life stone like when you last visited the oracle? asked Pug. What do you mean? Did it appear as it always did? I don't know. Miranda looked puzzled. It's the only time I've ever seen it. But there was something odd about it, wasn't there? Miranda shrugged. I had a feeling that the Valheru trapped inside was somehow doing something. Miranda had a faraway look. Stirring, I think that's what I said. 
they were stirring more than usual. I fear they may have found a way to interact directly with someone or some group within the Pantathian community, perhaps with this so-called Emerald Queen who now leads them. That's a chilling thought, Pug said. There is something few know. Have you heard of Makros the Black? Miranda said, by reputation. Her tone was dry, and Pug assumed she didn't believe the inflated tales about the black sorcerer. Much of what he did was theatrics, but much was an order of magic beyond even my understanding today. He was able to do things with time that I can only speculate on, for one example. Her eyes narrowed at that. Time travel? More. Tomas and I were trapped in a time well with him, and we traveled to the dawn of time and returned. But he could use his mind and will across eons. How do you mean? He used his skills and powers to fashion a relationship between Tomas, a boyhood friend of mine, and Ashen Shugar. The Valheru, whose armor he wears, supplied Miranda. It was never a simple case of an ancient magic lingering in a mystic suit of armor. Makros used that armor as a vehicle for his own manipulation of my friend centuries later, so he could act as he did during the Rift War. That wily bastard, muttered Miranda. What if Tomas's armor isn't the only vehicle for such manipulation? Miranda's eyes grew wide. Is it possible? Of course it's possible, said Pug. The older I get, the more certain I become that there is very little that isn't possible. Miranda stood up and began to pace the tiny room. How would we know? We wait for Callus to return or somehow get word to us. When last I saw Nacor, I asked him to travel with Callus if possible for he is uniquely suited to spying out this sort of problem. I suggested the possibility I just spoke of to you more than three years ago. Now that you tell me he's gone with Callus, I am content to wait until they return, and we keep out of sight until then, so as not to provide the Pantathians with a target. I could protect myself for a while, as you can, I am sure, but constantly having to defend myself would prove wearisome and divert me from certain studies. Miranda nodded. What was that business of the clue and the rest with the Hall of Worlds and the City of the Gods all about anyway? I wanted a way to keep to myself and yet be found if someone with the wit and talent needed to find me. Had you gone prowling the hall asking questions on any number of worlds, well, you would have encountered a difficulty. I was warned of your assassins, she countered. Who told you? It was the gossip of the day at Honest John's. Pug said, The next time I hire someone for a quiet undertaking, I think I will avoid the inn. Who directed you to Mustafa's? Bold our blood. When you left Mustafa, I went ahead to the mountains to wait for you. The simple trick of telling you to go somewhere else was my last trick. He smiled. Had you not proved so agreeable a guest, I would have disposed of you up on those cold peaks— so as to be as far from Stardock as possible when the Pantathians noticed the display. Miranda gave him a sour expression. Lax subtlety. Perhaps, but time goes short and I have much work to do while I wait for Callus and Nacor. Can I be of help? Boldar Blood is waiting for me in an inn in the Mutt, if he can be of service. For now, send word to him to wait. Let the mercenary enjoy Tabard's girls and ale, said Pug. As for you, there are any number of tasks around here that I could use help with, if you don't mind. I won't cook, she said, or mend your small clothes. Pug laughed. He was genuinely amused. My, that's the first good laugh I've had in a long time. He shook his head. Hardly. I can get all the dinner and laundry I require on Sorcerer's Isle. I inform Gathus, and when all is ready, I transport food in and linens out. No, I need you to start digging through a large part of a very old library, looking for clues. Clues to what? asked Miranda, now obviously intrigued. Clues to where we may have to go to find someone, if the need arises. Cocking her head to one side, as if she already knew the answer, she said, Looking for whom? Pug said, If Callus brings me the news, I fear most of all. 
We're going to have to find the only being I know of who can counter the sort of magic we'll face. We're going to have to try to once again locate Mokros the Black. Twenty. Passage. Callus signaled. Suddenly the men behind him halted in place and raised hands to warn the others farther down the line to stop. Since entering the tunnel two days before, they had adopted silent travel. All communication was done by hand gestures, and noise was kept to a minimum. While every man in Callus's company had been trained in such practices, the clansmen under Hatonis and the mercenaries hired by Praji had been a noisy bunch at first. They had learned quickly, however, and no longer needed constant reminders to keep silent. Of the 111 men who had left the rendezvous, the 66 men in Callus's command and the 45 with Greylock, Praji, Vaja, and Hatonis, 71 had survived the clash with a sa'our above. Above was how they now thought of the plain of Jams. The tunnel had moved continuously down until Nacor estimated they were close to a quarter mile below the surface. At camp the night before, he had whispered to Eric that someone had once badly wanted to trade on the plains above to have built such a long and deep passage. Either that, or they had wanted their front door a very long, defensible distance from their home. The tunnel had been a uniform size, varying only with an occasional outcropping of stone that was easier to move around than to dig through. Except for those minor deviations, the tunnel was a uniform seven feet in height, ten feet wide, and apparently endless. At several points along the way, larger areas had been dug out that might have served for rest areas or places to store provisions, but their original use could only be guessed at by those now passing. Callus turned back to where Luis waited and motioned for him to come forward. Eric wondered at the choice until he saw Callus draw a dagger from his belt. Beyond the captain lay another opening, but Eric had the impression this was more than another widening in the tunnel. He sensed air movement and wondered if they had reached some portion of the abandoned underground city Praji had told of. He knew it was not possible that they had come far enough to enter the particular one Praji spoke of down in the south, but perhaps there was another such place up here in the mountains. Callus and Luis vanished into the gloom. The single torch was at the center of the column, and the light barely reached either end. Eric did not know how Callus did it. His vision must be inhuman, for the faint light that reached the head of the line barely gave Eric enough illumination to see De Longville's back as he crouched, waiting. Eric hugged himself, for it was cold in the passage. All the men were chilled, but they endured it in silence. Since losing Foster, De Longville had been relegating tasks equally to Big O and Eric that usually fell to the corporal. Eric was uncertain if this was any endorsement of his ability or simply a question of proximity. They were the two men De Longville was most likely to find at his back when he turned around. A few moments later, Callus and Luis returned, and Callus spoke in a hushed whisper while Luis returned to his normal place in line. It's a large gallery and we're entering through a passage that empties into a ledge leading both downward and up. It's wide enough for three men to walk abreast, but there is no railing, and it's a long way down, so pass the word that when we move out, everyone should be cautious of the edge. I'm going to explore. You rest here for a half hour, and if I'm not back, that means follow the upward path. De Longville nodded and motioned for rest. Those behind him passed along the silent instruction, and the men sat where they were. Eric shifted around until he found a relatively comfortable position resting against the cold stone, while the others did likewise. He heard a faint scraping sound and realized that Longville was counting knots in a thong. It was an old trick, moving your fingers along a piece of rope, twine or leather, soundly reciting a fixed ditty, one that had been practiced over and over until it was almost as exact as sand falling in a glass. The Longville would move his fingers down a knot each time he finished the rhyme. When he reached the end of the thong, ten minutes would have passed. When he had used the thong three times, the half hour would be up. Eric closed his eyes. He couldn't sleep, but he could relax as much as possible. Without thought, he put his hands on his aching legs and felt them grow warm with the healing power he had learned from Nacor. As the rest of his body was chilled by the cold rocks, it was a welcome sensation. Eric wondered how the rest of the villagers and Weenot were doing, and what would become of them when the Emerald Queen's army reached that area. There were so many invaders, there was no chance they could lie low in the woods until they left. 
That host would strip the land of everything edible for five miles on both sides of the river. The only hope those villagers had would be to go up into the mountains and hide in the high valleys. Perhaps Curzon and his people would help them. Eric doubted it. They would have barely enough food for the winter for themselves. Then he wondered what his mother was doing. He had no idea what time it was back home. He didn't really know what time it was above. He thought it was midday. That probably meant it was the middle of the night back in Ravensburg. She was most likely asleep in her little room at the inn. Eric wondered if she knew he still lived. Her last news of him might have been that he had been condemned to die. Given the secrecy surrounding the mission and the chance of not surviving training, he suspected she thought him dead. He sighed softly and wondered how she was, and Rosalind and Milo and the others in the village. They seemed so far away, and that life so alien, he could barely remember what it felt like to rise up every day with his only expectation being hard work at the forge. Suddenly he felt a touch on his wrist and looked over to see De Longville in the dim light, signaling it was time to move out. Eric reached over and nudged the dozing Big O, who nodded and nudged the man next in line. Eric rose and moved out after the sergeant, who passed through the opening to the gallery and turned right on the walkway, heading upward. In the deep darkness, Eric could only sense the size of the place, and he was about halfway around the circular path when the man holding the torch emerged from the side passage. Suddenly, Eric could see the entire gallery, and he involuntarily stepped back against the wall. The floor was lost in the gloom below, despite the torchlight, as was the ceiling above. A faint draft of air rose up, and it carried a damp, stale odor. Eric wished he hadn't known the pathway was so narrow and the fall so great, as now he walked with considerably more discomfort. He moved on and followed the Longville upward into the darkness. At several points along the way they encountered entrances to new tunnels, and they paused to see if Callus had marked any, indicating they should leave the upwardly spiraling path. They never saw any marks. There were wide places, as if ledges had been carved into the rock of the mountain to allow more comfortable movement, and places where the men could sit. Eric had no idea how long they had been following Callus, but he knew his legs hurt. The constant upward climb was taking its toll. Suddenly they saw Callus ahead in the gloom. He said, This area is deserted. The men seemed to relax at that, and DeLongville said, Proji, is this like that dwarven place you spoke of? Not that I'd recognize, said the old mercenary. He was short of wind and obviously pleased to be halting, even if only for a few minutes. Mind you, I have only tales, but it's been described to me several times by different people who've been there. He looked around. This place? I don't know what it is. Calla said, There are dwarven mines back home, and I've been through a couple. They have galleries and such, but this is something different. No dwarven hand built this place. This is no mine. Eric heard Rue's voice coming from behind. This looks like a city, Captain. Eric turned and heard Calla say, A city? Rue said, Well, something like it. Those tunnels lead to other places, maybe. Sleeping quarters or places to store goods. But those wide places, if you noticed, are in a pattern. There's one for every two entrances along the way. And they're all of uniform size. I think they're like market areas. Then this would be some sort of central passage, like a boulevard in a city. Only it moves up and down, instead of north and south, said Bigo. Who would have built such a place? asked Eric. Calla said, I don't know. He changed the subject. We're about at ground level, so I'm inclined to start looking for a way out. I'm going to explore the next corridor we come to. I want the men to make camp at the next market area we find. Is it sundown already? asked the long bill. I'd judge it an hour past, said Nacor from behind. More like two, answered Callus. How do you know? blurted Rue. Callus smiled in the dim light. I'll be back before dawn. With that he moved ahead, and the weary column of men followed after until they came to the next wide space on the trail, where they gladly settled in for a night's rest. Eric discovered he had no sense of time in these caves. Callus had mentioned to De Longville that it had been two and a half days of travel, which, in his judgment, accounted for a twenty-mile journey from the hillock to the foothills of the mountains, and then a gradual climb into the interior of a large peak. 
Eric felt as if it had been a lot farther, but he realized that so much of the trek had been up the spiral path inside this mountain. Earlier that day, Callus had said he was convinced the entire region was deserted, but there was something in his voice that hinted to Eric there was more that he was not sharing. Despite Eric's constant pledge to himself not to seek trouble but to mind his own business, he couldn't help but wonder what it was that seemed to be lurking behind the captain's words. One fortunate result of Callus's exploration was his saying that he thought they were getting close to a way out of this maze of dark passages and tall caverns. At one point he had hesitated between two large tunnels, one angling down into the mountain, the other veering once again upward. Eric sensed Callus had wanted to take the other tunnel, the one heading deep into the heart of the mountains, but he kept them moving upward. Eric wondered what had drawn Callus to that other tunnel. Late the next day, the soldier carrying the bundle of torches said they were running low. Callus acknowledged the report, saying nothing else. Eric felt an unexpected stab of fear at the thought of being in these mines without light. They had been extinguishing the torches when they slept. On the first night he had awakened in total darkness and had to fight back the urge to shout in alarm. He had never awakened to so utter a blackness, and he had lain there listening in the dark. He realized he was not the only one awake, for he could hear the rapid breathing of men not able to sleep in such conditions, and the quiet weeping of one or two who felt terror so profound he could understand it even if he couldn't name it. Another fitful night was spent in utter darkness, and then they resumed their march. At noon on the fifth day they broke for the midday meal, more dried rations. Water was a problem, as they had only two large skins and a handful of smaller ones filled at an underground pool the morning before. But there was no sign of water anywhere nearby, and Callus ordered the men to drink as they had in the desert, one mouthful, no more. As they were readying to move out, a distant clatter rang through the tunnel, as if someone had dislodged rocks. Callus motioned for everyone to stand still. After a while, the Longville whispered, Rock slide. Perhaps, answered the captain, but I need to be sure. He pointed up and toward the left. If I am correct, somewhere up ahead you should come either to an opening that leads directly to the surface, showing you some light, or a big passage leading up and away to the left. Ignore any passages that clearly lead downward or off to the right. He smiled slightly. You should be on the surface by the time I catch up with you. I will follow as soon as I am sure there is nothing behind us. Do you want a torch? asked de Longville. I can find my way without one. If we are being followed by the Sahara, I don't want any light to show them where I am, if I get too close. Eric wondered how he could find his way through the dark, and even if he could, how he was willing to give up the torch's reassurance, scant as it was. Callus moved down the line, offering a quick tap on the shoulder or nod to each of the men as he passed them. The Longville motioned for hand signals only, and indicated they should follow him. Eric discovered he was now second in line. He peered into the gloom, barely able to see ten feet beyond the sergeant into the murk, as the flickering torch in the middle of the line caused the shadows to dance. He fervently hoped that Callus was correct, and they were getting close to getting out of these caves. They moved forward. Faint noises echoed through the passages as the torch burned low. De Longville judged Callus had been gone for almost a half day. The men were tired, and it seemed an appropriate time for sleep. Motioning for a halt, he whispered back, How many torches? The answer came, We have two after this one. De Longville swore, If the captain doesn't get back soon, we may be truly lost in the dark tomorrow, unless that passage he spoke of is nearby. Put out that torch, and make sure you have everything needed to light it quickly, if there's any trouble. I want two shifts, first four hours and second four. Then we walk out of this God's forsaken hole. Eric knew he would be among those sleeping first, so he lay down and tried to get as comfortable as possible. Despite being tired to his bones, he just couldn't find it easy to sleep in the pitch darkness on rock. He closed his eyes and heard muttering which told him that the torch had been extinguished, he was not alone in being troubled by the total absence of light. He kept his eyes closed and turned his mind to pleasant thoughts. He wondered how the harvest at home this year had gone, and how the grapes looked. He recalled the growers bragging about a record crop, but that was nothing unusual. You could usually tell if they were just talking to hear themselves talk, or if they truly meant it by their manner. The more earnest they were that it was to be a great year, the more you could suppose it wouldn't be. But if they spoke of the harvest in a matter-of-fact, nearly indifferent way, 
it would be a great year. He then wondered how the other young men and women in the village were. He thought about Gwen, and regretted he hadn't gone to the orchard with her on the occasions he might have. Having a woman was a great deal more than he had imagined, and the memory of the whore's softness roused his flesh despite his fatigue. He thought of Rosalind, and found himself both fascinated and disturbed by remembering her without her clothing. He had seen her numerous times as a child, bathing, but seeing her woman's breasts as she lay before the tree. He found the memory now oddly disturbing, as if there must be something wrong to think about how she looked as the result of a rape. Eric tried to turn over, and succeeded only in making himself less comfortable. Maybe he could talk to Nacor about this unsettling memory of Rosalind. The funny man seemed to know a great deal, and perhaps could tell Eric why he was suddenly aroused by such a repulsive memory. Yet when he thought of that night, the rage and anger were distant, and the murder seemed as if it happened to someone else. But those small, firm breasts... He groaned slightly and sat up, suddenly disoriented in the darkness. He started to berate himself for being as depraved as any man living, when it struck him suddenly there was light coming from ahead in the tunnel. It was faint, but any light would be noticeable in the absolute gloom of the cavern. He sensed more than saw the form of De Longville before him, and saw that the soldier who was to have been on duty had dozed off. He felt no anger for the man. Remaining alert in total darkness was almost impossible. The sound of slow breathing everywhere told Eric he might be the only man remaining awake who was close enough to the head of the column to see the light. He gently reached past De Longville and nudged the sentry. The man came awake, saying, What? De Longville was awake an instant later, and also whispered, What? Before the sentry could say anything, Eric said, Mark thought he saw light ahead, Sergeant. He was asking me if I saw it, too. Turning to the sentry, he said, Yes, there is light up there. De Longville said, Wake the others, quietly. No torch. First six men come with me. They crept forward, and after a few steps, Eric could see it was a moving light, coming from the left, from a passage that intersected the one in which they traveled fifty or so feet farther along. As they neared the passage, it was clear it was rapidly growing brighter. Then suddenly De Longville was motioning for everyone to hug the walls. The sounds of movement preceded a figure who strode into view, passing through the intersection without a glance right or left. Eric gripped his sheathed sword-hilt, ready to pull it free should the need arise. The creature was a serpent man, dressed in a tunic and leggings rather than trousers, which allowed his short tail to swing freely. Behind him came two more, larger and dressed in armor. Eric had had a good look at the Sa'our, a better look than he would care to repeat, but these creatures were of a different stripe. The tallest of them was smaller than human by a head, and they were sinuous. Eric noticed they seemed slow and deliberate in their movement. He wondered if it might be the chill in the cavern that slowed them, for Nacor had said these creatures were cold-blooded. Another pair of guards passed through, one glancing in their direction. Eric waited, but the creature moved on without comment or alarm. Eric could only reason that the creature's night vision had been harmed by the closeness of the torch before it, and that hugging the walls the humans were nearly invisible. Another pair, then another, until a full dozen Pantathians walked by. The Longville motioned for the others to wait, then moved to where the light was quickly fading. He hurried back and whispered, They're gone. As the tunnel was plunged into darkness again, they reached the remaining column, now alert to the last man. Nacor, who had worked his way to the head of the line, said, Serpent man, yes? How do you know? I felt them, was his answer. I feel a lot of strange things here. This is a bad place. I'll not argue that, said the Longville. He let his breath out slowly in frustration. Then he said, I want us out of here as fast as we can get. Eric found, listening to his voice in pitch darkness, only heightened his appreciation of the tone of frustration in the man's statement. Then De Longville asked, Which way do we go? Nacor whispered, We move roughly to the southeast. I think we go the way the snake men came from, not follow after. I think they came from the surface and go somewhere deep within the mountain. We are high enough that we will find it cool, cold even, when we come out. Serpent people don't like the cold, so I think that would be the place they don't live. You think they live down under the mountain? Could be, Nacor answered. 
Hard to know, but they are here, and we need to do many things before we start fighting again. If we die, then no one knows what's really going on, and that is bad. The Longville was silent. Eric found himself growing uncomfortable with the duration, and at last said, Sergeant? Shut up, came the quick response. I'm thinking. Eric and the others stayed silent. Then at last, the Longville's voice cut through the darkness. Great luck, he called, his voice low but urgent. From the rear, a figure moved slowly forward, trying not to step on feet in the dark. At last, a voice said nearby, Yes? You're in charge. I expect you to get as many of this company out alive as you can. The former officer said, I will, Sergeant. I'd like Eric for my second. De Longville didn't hesitate. Von Darkmore, you act as Sergeant for a while. Shadow, you're as Corporal. All of you pay attention to whatever Nacor and Hatonis have to say. This is what you're going to do. I'm waiting here for Countess. I don't want to try to mark the passages we take in case more of those Pantathians come this way. Leave me one torch and I'll wait here until I decide the captain's not coming back. There was a note of urgency and worry in his voice Eric had never heard before. He wondered if he would have noticed it had he been able to see DeLongville's face. Then I'll catch up with you, continued DeLongville. Now, here's what you'll do. When you reach the surface, get across the grasslands as best you can into the coast. Acquire horses or steal a boat, but somehow get back to the city of the Serpent River. Trenchard's revenge is there, or she's been sunk, for Nicholas gave orders that at least one ship would remain for us. Atonis and his men will know the best route. Atonis, from the rear, spoke loudly enough for his voice to carry just to the front of the line. As an old trade route, overland from Ispar to the city of the Serpent River, through Maharka. It's rarely used any more, but it should be passable on horseback. The Longville took a deep breath and said, All right, light a torch and get out of here. The man who had been harboring the torches lit a spark, and soon the flame was going. Eric found he had a squint, which surprised him, given how far back down the line the light was. He turned and saw the Longville. The sergeant had his usual mask of determination in place. Eric decided he wouldn't have noticed the sound of worry if he had been looking at the man. Without saying anything, Eric reached out and quickly placed his hand on DeLongville's arm, gave a quick squeeze, and released it, the only gesture he could make without saying something. The sergeant looked at him, giving him only a brief nod of acknowledgment, before Eric moved down the tunnel. Greylock reached the junction of the tunnels, peered both ways, then motioned for the men to follow to the left. Eric reached the junction, and as he started to turn the corner, he fought down the urge to look back to where DeLongville waited. If only the captain were here he said to himself silently. Where could Callus be? Callus held close to the wall as he stared in wide-eyed amazement. He and his father had spoken many times of what it would be like to confront their unusual heritage, a legacy of ancient magic warped by the skill of Mokros the Black, and used to bring to his human father the powers incarnate of the legendary Valheru. Tomas had wooed and won the hand of Agarana, the queen of the elves, and had fathered Callus, impossible fruit of a union unique in history. Callus was young by the reckoning of the elven people, little more than a half century old. By human consideration, he was a man of middle years, and by any measure, he had more than a dozen lifetimes' experience in watching the pain and madness of the creatures who lived on this world but nothing had prepared him to deal with the consequences of what he had chosen to investigate. Elves possessed the ability to navigate by the dimmest light of the night, a single moon or distant stars. But even dwarves were incapable of seeing in the utter blackness of underground tunnels. Yet they had other senses, and Callus, unlike his elven cousins, had travelled with dwarves enough in his youth to have learned some of their tricks. The sound of air moving faint echoes upon the passage walls, counting turns, and remembering distances. It was said that once upon a path, no dwarf could ever fail to retrace his steps. Callus possessed the same knack. After leaving the company, he had moved back down to the vast gallery, the circular central hall of the city within a mountain. For that was what he was certain it had been, once in ancient days, a city beneath the mountains, as Rue had supposed. But the youth from Ravensburg had no idea what sort of city. From what he had studied with Tathar and the other spell weavers of Elvendar, 
Callus had suspected from the first that this was a city of elven construction rather than dwarven, but the elves who had built this place were as unlike Callus's people as they were unlike any other mortal race. Those elves had existed as slaves to the Valhero, and only by command of their ancient masters could such a place have come to be built by elven hands. Once he had reached the gallery, Callus was convinced the sound he had heard had been nothing more than a distant rockfall. There were no signs of pursuit. Still he moved downward to make sure, passing the strange split in the tunnels that had called to him so strangely. He had moved deep within the well of darkness, and when at last he could hear only his own breath and the pounding of his heart in his ear, he turned back. But as he approached that odd junction where he had hesitated the first time he had passed, at the head of the company, he again paused, sensing something ancient and compelling deep within the tunnel that moved downward. It was a foolish risk, yet it was impossible for Callus to resist. He knew he should ensure the others got free, but he had faith in the cunning of the Longville and the skills of Nacor. And now he knew what had called him. There was something ancient at the heart of this hall, and he looked upon it with fear and astonishment. He had taken the tunnel moving downward, following it through another gallery, smaller than the grand gallery they had climbed, yet large enough to have served as a small town. High above, a faint light shone down, so far away that the noon sun was but a pinpoint, yet that entrance, at the summit of some high mountain, told him his instinct was correct. This ancient place had once been home to a Valheru, much as the great cavern below the MacMordane Kadal, the ancient dwarven mines in the Grey Tower Mountains, had been home to Ashen Shugar, the ruler of the Eagle's Reaches, the Valheru whose ancient spirit had come to possess his father and change his nature so profoundly. Crossing a narrow stone bridge, he had come to a set of wooden doors, large enough to admit a great dragon. And Callus knew that once they did, for the dragon lords kept their mighty mounts close at hand. In the door was a smaller portal, one used by servants in ages past. He had moved a heavy iron handle, and to his surprise it opened the latch easily and without noise. The door had swung open on hinges recently well oiled, and Callus blinked his eyes as the sudden light threatened to blind him. At the end of the long cavernous hall, a ledge overlooked the vast cavern ablaze with torchlight, and in the center of the cavern a village of mud huts, crude and without craft in their fashioning, was constructed around a series of cracks. Steam rose, heralding an underground source of heat, and at the center of the largest vent a heat shimmer danced in the air. As he had approached, Callus had been bewildered by the sudden rise in temperature. Where he had been feeling damp chill when he left the others, he was now sweating as much as he had been in the desert. The thermal vents showed that this Valheru Hall was fashioned inside what had once been a volcano. The air was pungent with the smell of decay and the stench of sulfur on the air. Callus felt his eyes burn at the sting of it as he looked down on the scene below. Throughout the hall roamed servant men, and at the center rear of the hall, on a high dais, a great throne rose against the wall. Upon that throne, where once sat a dragon lord, now sat one of their tribe, a creature of scales and claws, but its eyes were fixed upon space, for it was ages dead. The Pantathians nearest the motionless figure appeared to be priests, wearing vestments of green and black, and to the mummy of some ancient reptile king, they paid homage. Callus was no spellweaver, but he felt the bite of magic in the air, and around the base of the throne he saw artifacts from eons past. It was the presence of these items that caused him to suffer. He ached to march into the hall, brushing aside those creatures, and to mount those steps to the top of the dais, casting down this lesser creature to take possession of the items of might that lay at its feet. For Callus was certain these items were indeed relics of the Valheru. Never had his blood sung so, save once when his father had allowed him to hold the shield of white and gold he wore into battle. Callus fought back such foolhardy urges and tried to make sense of the scene before him. It would be too easy to count this simply a Pantathian village, for there were too many strange things to account for. He wished Nacor was here. The little man's ability to see things clearly would have been invaluable. 
As it was, Callus attempted to memorize every detail before him, drinking in the conflicting images and trying to record them in his mind, without passing judgment on their significance, so as not to neglect an important detail through an error in judgment. After a half hour, several human prisoners were brought into the hall. Most had the vacant-eyed look of those in shock or under some sort of spell or the effect of drugs, but one woman struggled against her chains. The priests ranged themselves in a line across the lowest step on the dais, and the centermost spread his hands, holding in one an emerald-topped staff. He spoke in a hissing language, unlike anything Callus had heard in his travels, and motioned to guards to take the prisoners and move them to another place. Callus wished for his bow that he might kill this priest. Then he wondered where such a violent rage came from. Then the priest motioned for the first prisoner to be brought before the throne, and two guards moved to carry out the command. A series of ritual passes of the staff was punctuated by guttural croaks and deep hisses, and the emerald at the top of the staff began to glow brightly. Death magic surged in the room as one of the guards held the first prisoner's head back, while another quickly struck with a long knife, cutting the head completely from the body. Callus held himself motionless, despite strong anger surging up within. The guard threw the head into a corner, and Callus followed its flight, watching as it landed with a wet thud among a pile of heads, some rotting, others now skulls, that sat behind the throne. The two serpents holding the man's body lifted it, carried it to a recessed chamber, and tossed it down out of sight. The screeches of hunger that answered caused Callus to swallow hard. The woman, who seemed unfazed by the drugs, started screaming, and Callus felt his nerves grow taut. He clutched his sword hilt and ached to charge this den of monsters. One by one the drugged prisoners were slaughtered. Their heads tossed to the pile after dark magics seized their life energy, and the bodies were fed to the Pantathian young. The woman screamed continuously as she crouched on the floor, her terror outracing her fatigue. At last she remained alone before the priests. The priest with the emerald-topped staff motioned for the guards to take the woman next, and they lifted her up, ripping her tunic free, so she stood naked in front of the priest, who ignored the warm, sticky puddle he stepped in as he walked through the pooling blood of the victims. Callus saw the priest motion the guards to hold the woman fast, and he saw them force her to lie back, holding her down while the priest began to make more motions with a staff and prod her with a butt-end while singing in his alien tongue. Callus felt his throat tighten. He had encountered the Bantathians' evil sorcery before. They were able to use humans to create Pantathians who looked like humans. Callus had seen the results before and knew it was a powerful black art being practiced below. Callus was no student of magic but he had some knowledge of it, and this next act was too vile for him to begin to understand. As the priest removed a long dagger from his robe and advanced upon the now shrieking woman, Callus looked away. He judged himself too close to this place of dark magic for too long and moved backwards slowly into the gloom. A few paces up the passage he turned and hurried up the long tunnel. He quickly slipped through the door, closing it behind him, and paused a moment to let his senses start to adjust to the gloom. As he paused, he considered what he had just seen. It was impossible to imagine what the Pantathians gained from the priest's slow torture of a human woman. He had no doubt that eventually the priest would kill the woman, and her head would join the others on the pile as her body went to nourish the young. He wished for a moment that Makor had been along, but the strange little man who claimed not to believe in magic seemed to know more about it than just about anyone Callus had met. He might make some sense of how this ritual torture and slaughter tied into what he feared might be occurring with the Emerald Queen and the Valhero artifacts of power. Callus hurried through the darkness. Without conscious thought, he started counting steps and measuring distances with his hearing, and he hoped that he'd find his company where he had left it. The long villa almost leaped when Callus touched his arm. He spun around to hear a familiar voice ask, Where is everyone else? Captain, the Longville said. I was about to say a brief prayer to Ruthia and a small testimonial to Lim's Kragma on your behalf. Then get the hell out of here. 
Now I can sit down and die of a burst heart. Sorry I startled you, but I couldn't tell who it was here in the dark, and it smelled like you, but I wanted to be sure. Smelled like me? It's been a while since you've had a bath, buddy. You're no bunch of roses either, Carlos. Have you a torch? To answer, De Longville struck steel to flint and set a hot spark into the treated cotton wadding wrapped on a stick. The flame started modestly, but spread quickly, and by the time De Longville held it up, they were bathed in a pool of light. Call me mother, but you look a fright, said De Longville. What did you find down there? I'll tell you when we've put some distance between us and it. Which way? We found a passage used by some serpent men, so I put Greylock in charge and sent the men in the other direction, to the left. Good. That should mean they're on the surface by now. If we hurry, we can overtake them before they get too far down the hillside. We're a lot higher up than when we came in the tunnel, Bobby. And a lot farther from where we want to be than we were when we started, responded De Longville. We'd better hurry. We have a long way to go. Softly, Callus added, And I fear not that much time to get there. 21. Attrition Eric ducked. A shower of darts flew through the air and bounced off his shield as he tried to keep low to the ground. Since leaving the cavern and moving down through the hills to the grasslands, Nacor and Chopi had both claimed they were being observed. When they had finally reached an area of broken rocks, islands of limestone, shale, and granite that broke up pools of tall grass, a sudden attack of the Gilani had greeted them. Six men died in the first assault, which was barely driven back by the heroic efforts of those in the forefront. Greylock had quickly organized the defense, and the struggle had gone on for nearly a half-day. Two more men had died as they retreated up the hillside, looking for this defensive position. Praji and Vaja had moved to the front and were in council with Greylock as Eric approached. I've got everyone situated as best I could, Owen. We're taking a beating. I know, came the calm reply. He looked at Praji and said, Any idea why they hit us? Praji shrugged. We're here, and they're Jelani. They don't like anyone who isn't Jelani. And we're about to enter the grasslands. That's their range, and they're trying to tell us to keep off. How the damn grass gets so tall this time of year? asked Greylock. Vaja said, There are some that grow in the winter and others in the summer, and they are all mixed in down there, is my guess. Putting aside his frustration, Greylock asked, Is there another way out of these mountains? Praji shrugged. Your guess is as good as mine. Even if I knew exactly where we were, I've never traveled this way. Few men from the Eastlands have. He looked around. I'm guessing if we could get over that ridge, he pointed upward at the highest peaks of the mountains, we might be able to make our way down to the Satpura River. Maybe make some rafts and get down to the coast near Tataspan. Or we could move back up into the foothills, staying high enough so the Jelani don't come after us, and could head south, see if we can find a way to the River Dee, and follow that down to Ispar, but I don't recommend that course. Why not? That would take us through the Great South Forest. Not a lot of people get through there alive. Rumor has it that's where your Pantathians hole up, and it's where tigers that talk like men live. When Greylock looked at him with the disbelief written on his face, he quickly added, That's only rumor. A whizzing sound in the air warned them a scant second before another rain of darts pelted them. Eric tried to get his bulk below his shield. A shout and curse told him someone hadn't covered up quickly enough as darts rained off shields and the surrounding rocks. How about all the wounded? asked Greylock. The wounded aren't too bad, answered Eric. One of the men has a dart in the leg, but it's down in the fleshy part of the calf. He can walk with help. A couple of broken arms, and Gregory of the burn dislocated his shoulder. Greylock said, Well, we can't outweigh them here and find out how many of those damn darts they're carrying. In frustration, he added, Well, we don't even know how many Jelani there are. The little men had swarmed over the front of the column, then vanished back into the grass when Callus's company had turned out to be willing to stand and make a fight of it. Since then, they had been launching random flights of darts. Looking around, Greylock said, Eric, try to get back to the rear and start the men heading back up toward the cavern. We'll see if we can find another way down that won't bring us back into this hornet's nest. Eric crouched as he moved along and twice had to flatten himself against the rocks to avoid missiles. The darts were rude things, but cleverly fashioned. Long reeds, little more than heavy grass stalks, were tied together in tight bundles until they were as rigid as arrows, and fitted with tips of sharpened glass or stone. 
the tide reeds were surprisingly strong, and they rained down with enough impact that they could punch through any unarmored part of the body. Praji had mentioned that the Jelani used a throwing stick, called an atlatl, to propel them in a high arc over the victims' heads, causing them to fall with great force. Eric would attest to their effectiveness. He reached the end of the line and started the men moving back up once more. In less than ten minutes, Greylock, Praji, and Vaja came into view, the last of the forward element climbing upward. Eric looked after and saw no sign of pursuit. They don't seem anxious to come up here after us, he said. Vaja said, They're not stupid. They're little fellows. In an open fight, we'd chew them up in less time than it takes to tell of it. But coming after us from tall grass, well, there's no one who can fight out there better than the Jelani. Eric wouldn't argue that. What has made them so hostile? Praji looked back. Usually they simply don't like strangers. They could be coming after us for the pure hell of it. Or maybe the Sa'our are pushing them south and they're just mad. Eric said, But the Sa'our who came after us couldn't have mounted enough of a force to clear out these grass dwellers. They'd need an army as big as the one mustering on the Vedra to do that. Vaja tapped Eric on the shoulder and pointed up the hill. Callus and de Longville were hurrying downward to meet them. When the captain reached the men, Eric could see by more than one face in the company that many were relieved to see the eagle of Crondor back among them. He retrieved his long bow from the man who held it for him and said, Why are you climbing back up? Greylock quickly explained, and Callus said, We well, can't get over the mountains. There's nothing like a pass up there I could see on the way down, and we can't risk going back into the cavern to see if there is a way through. He thought it best not to tell anyone of what he had seen, until he compared notes with Nacor. Turning to De Longville, he said, Send Shopi and Jado ahead. Tell them to find us a trail heading south. If we can move along the face of these mountains, then down behind these Jelani, so we can then cut across to Maharta, we still may get through this without too much more damage. De Longville nodded and went up the line to give the order to the men who would scout for them. How's our water? asked Callus. We're fine if we can find a source every day or two answered Greylock. We've got eight fewer men who need to drink than we did a couple of hours ago. Callus nodded. Praji, what's water like out there? Might as well be a desert, came the answer. The plain of Jams has some streams and water holes, but if you don't know where they are, you can wander by one, never see it through the grass, and die of thirst. Any birds you can follow? A few, but damn me if I know what they look like, admitted the old mercenary. If we get far enough to the south, the foothills along the coast are kinder. Lots of springs, lakes, and creeks, from what I've been told. South it is, said Callus. Ignoring his own fatigue, he hurried past the men in line so he could take over his position at the head of the column. Eric trudged upward, trying to be equally stoic as his legs burned with fatigue. Each step up the slope took its toll, and he was more than grateful when Callus at last ordered a rest. Eric waited with anticipation as the water skin was passed his way and drank deeply. They had passed a pool on the way down, so there was no reason to stint right now. As he handed the skin back, he looked out at the distant plain, and something caught his eyes. What's that rippling movement in the distance? he asked, no one in particular. Praji heard him and came down to where he stood. Squinting, he said, My eyes aren't what they used to be. Turning to face up the slope, he called out, Captain! You should take a look out there, he pointed at the horizon. Callus stared for long minutes, then said, God's above, it's the Sa'our. But that's impossible, said the Longville. For that many to be marching this far south. There had to be a second army, finished Paji. No wonder those bastards were so determined to keep us away from that entrance to the mountains, said Vaja. Callus said, they must have been using the lower portions of the cavern as a staging area. So that's why our short friends in the grass are so out of sorts. They just got through having an army ride through their homes. The Longville said, They mean to hit Lanata from the rear. After another minute, in which most of the men commented or swore, Callus said, No, they move southeast. They're heading for Maharta. Praji said, If the Raj has sent his war elephants to fight with the priest king's army at Lanata, Maharta will be defended by the palace guards and mercenaries. The Longville swore. Our bastards weren't keen on having us serving them. They were just anxious to keep us from joining the other side. He almost spit. Callus said, How long before they reach the city? 
Prodgy said, I only have a rough idea where the hell we are. He thought and said, maybe a week, ten days at the outside. If they don't waste their horses, two weeks. Can we get there before them? No, came the flat answer. If we had wings, certainly, or if we hacked our way through those Jelani and had fresh horses waiting for us on the other side, maybe. But if we keep going south, there's no way we can reach the city within a week of those lizard men. Can the city hold out for a week? Maybe, answered Praji, frankly. It depends on how much chaos is going on due to the host that's got to be fleeing southward. With so many people trying to get in, they may already be under siege. Eric said, Can we get around them? Vaja said, If we can get to Chattistan, we might be able to find a ship that could take us up to the city of the Serpent River. Kala said, Too many maybes. We're going to strike for the coast. Then we'll try for the city of the Serpent River. He called out to Hatonis, Do you want to try for Chattistan or head overland to home? Atonis shrugged and grinned, looking youthful despite his gray hair. One fight is pretty much the same as another, and if we don't fight the snakes in the heart air, we're certainly going to have to fight them at our own door. Callus nodded. Let's go. Eric saw the others get into line, and he slapped Rue on the shoulder as his boyhood friend walked past. Rue gave him a crooked smile that showed there was nothing to smile about, and Eric nodded in agreement. Eric waited until the last man had passed, then picked up the rear guard position. Suddenly he realized he had taken Foster's place in line without being told. He looked ahead to see if DeLongville was signaling or if another was coming to take his place, but when no word came down to give up the corporal's place, he continued along, returning his mind to the business at hand, staying alive. Providence smiled upon them as they found a southern trail. It looked to be a miner's trail, for it was wider than any goat herder would have needed, and at several places along the way, areas of bare rock proclaimed those workers who had hacked their way through the soil and stone to make it easy to get carts up and down the road. For Callus's company, it was as if at last they were running into some good luck. The men moved along swiftly, at a trot for a time, then a walk, the pace designed to cover the maximum distance by the end of each day. The wounded were able to keep up, though the man with the injured leg was almost unconscious with pain and loss of blood by the end of the day. Nacor dressed his wound and told Callus that with him and Chopee working on it all night, the man would be slightly better each day. They found water and were clearly able to increase their speed as they moved quickly to a rising crest. A rumbling warned them as they climbed the rise. Then as they topped the crest in the distance, they saw the falls. The Longville swore. They faced a gorge cut through the mountains. Below them, by a hundred feet, a great fall of water cascaded into a small lake, another two hundred feet below that. From there, the river meandered southeast toward the ocean. Ancient rocks marked where once a rope and wood suspension bridge had crossed the gap. Another pair of rock anchors rose up on the opposite side of the gorge. The Satpura River, said Praji. Now I know exactly where we are. Where are we? asked Callus. Dead east across the plain of Joms lies Maharta, said Praji. Turning to Callus, he said, I don't know what sort of magic was in that tunnel, but we're one hell of a lot farther away from where we entered the grasslands than I thought. What do you mean? said the Longville. We were fifty, sixty miles away from where we entered when we got to that big grotto. More like three hundred, answered Vaja. It would take you a month on a good horse to get back to that mound out on the grass, he observed, if you could get past the Jelani. Nacor said, It was a very good trick, then, for I felt nothing of it. He smiled as if this was a major feat. Then he grinned. Bet it was as soon as we moved from the barrow. Bet you there is no tunnel there. It must be an illusion. He shook his head. Now I really want to go back and look. Kala said, some other time. How far to Mahata? Praji shrugged. By caravan from Palans to Port Grief a month. No one goes there to Mahata overland. They take a ship. But there is that old coast road, if you don't mind the bandits and other low lifes that haunt it. Where is our best course? asked Callus. Praji rubbed his chin a moment. I think we send Shopi and Jado that way he said, pointing down the slope near the gorge, to see if there's a trail down nearby. If so, we take it. 
If we follow the river, we should be less than a week from Palamant. We can find a caravan, or buy horses, and then we ride to Port Grief. From there, a ship, and we're on our way to wherever you need to go. I need to get back to Crondor, said Callus, and several of the men nearby cheered when they heard that. Nacor said, No, first we must go to Maharta, then to Crondor. Why? asked Callus. We haven't stopped to ask why the Emerald Queen is taking the river cities. Vaja said, Good question. Patonus, Praji, you have any ideas? asked Callus. Patonus said, Conquest for its own purposes is not unknown in this land, for booty, to enlarge one's domain, for honor. But this simple taking of everything, he shrugged. Praji said, if there was something I wanted in my heart, and I couldn't trust to have those other cities at my back, Eric said, maybe it has to do with getting every sword under one banner? Callus looked at him for a long minute, then nodded. They plan on bringing the biggest army in history against the kingdom. Then Rue said, How are they planning on getting there? Nacor slowly grinned as Callus said, What? Rue looked embarrassed as he repeated, How are they planning on getting there? You needed two ships to get us here, with stores and all. They've got, what, a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand soldiers, and a lot of horses and equipment. Where are they going to get the ships? Atona said, the shipbuilders of Maharta are the finest in Navindus. Only the shipwrights in the Vajgamaka Islands are their equal. Our clan has long purchased our ships in Maharta. It is the only shipyard that could possibly produce enough transports in a short time, perhaps in two years or so. Kala said, Then we must make a stop there. Nacor said, Yes, we must burn the shipyards. Atonis's eyes widened. Burn? But the city will be under siege. They will have put hulks into the harbor mouth to keep the Emerald Queen's ships from sailing in, and it will be impossible to get within twenty miles of the city for the patrols on both sides. How long would it take to rebuild those yards if they're destroyed? asked Callus. Atonis shrugged. The yards are massive and have been built up slowly over the last few centuries. It would take years to restore them. Lumber must be harvested up here and in the Sothu and Sumanu mountains and shipped downriver or carried in wagons. The great keels take a year or more to be cut and brought down, at great expense. Nacor almost danced. He was so excited. If we burn the yards, we get five, six, maybe as many as ten years before ships can be built here. Many, many things can happen in that time. This Emerald Queen, can she keep her host together that long? This, I think, unlikely. Callus's eyes seemed to light with the prospect. Then he fought back his enthusiasm and said, Don't sell her short, Nacor. Nacor nodded. The two had spoken at great length about what they had seen, and knew they were dealing with the most dangerous foe since the Tirani invasion of the Rift War. I know, but men are men, and unless the Pantathian magic is so powerful as to make their hearts change, many of these soldiers of hers will forsake her banner without payment. Still, said Hatonis, denying her the shipyards would be a major victory. My father ran the most successful trading consortium in the city of the Serpent River. We can send men to the Pajkanaka Islands and ensure they do not sell her ships. I will personally guarantee no shipwright in the city of the Serpent River will work on her behalf. Tala said, You know that after Maharta she will march on you. It's logical. I know we shall have to fight her. If we must, we can abandon the city and live again in the wild. We men of the clans were not always city men. Atona smiled a dark smile. But many of her greenskins will die before that day comes. Kala said, Well, first things first. Jado, Shopi, see if you can find us a way down from here. The two men nodded and trotted back along the trail, looking for another way down. As long as we wait, said Nacor, opening his bag. Anyone want an orange? He grinned as he pulled out a large one and stuck his thumb in, squirting juice on Praji and Longville. They found a trail down, a narrow, rocky pathway as treacherous as the first one had been kind. Three men fell to their deaths when a ledge of stone, seemingly solid, had collapsed under their feet. Now the remaining sixty men huddled in a narrow defile, huddled around two campfires, vainly trying to withstand the cold as a sudden change in weather sent the temperature below freezing. Callus and another three men had gone hunting, for the remaining rations were gone, but could only come back reporting no game was near. 
The company was too large, said Callas, and game was staying clear. He said he'd leave before first light and try to get as far down the trail as possible to see if he could find a deer or other large game. Praji said there were bison roaming the plains, and many of them lived in the woodlands of the foothills. Callas said he'd keep that in mind. Eric and Rue sat shoulder to shoulder, holding out their hands to the fire, while others huddled miserably as close together for warmth as they could. The only exception was Callos, who stood a short distance away, unmindful of the chill. Rue said, Captain. Callos said, Yes. Why don't you tell us what's going on? The Longville, from near the next fire, said, Keep your mouth shut, Avery. Rue spoke through chattering teeth. Hang me now and get it over with, why don't you? I'm too cold to mind. To the captain, he said, You and Acor have been thick as fleas on a beggar since you came back, sir. And, well, if we're going to be getting killed, I'd like to know what for before I close my eyes. A few other men said, Yes, and that's right, before the Longville's bellow silenced them. Next man opens his gob will find my boot in it. Understood? Callis said, No, there's some justice in what he said. He looked at the men nearest him and said, Many of you will not get home. You knew that when you were given reprieve from your sentence. Others of you are here because you're loyal to the Lion Clan or because you're old friends of Prodgy's. And some of you are just in the wrong place. He glanced at Greylock, who smiled a little at the last. Callus knelt and went on. I've told you some of what we face, and I've warned you that should this Emerald Queen prevail, this world as we know it ends. The clansmen and Praji's mercenaries hadn't heard that, and several muttered disbelief. Atonis silenced his own men, and Praji shouted, He's telling the truth! Shut up and listen! Callus said, Long ago, the dragon lords ruled this world. You may have heard legends of them, but they were not legends. They were real. When the men of the kingdom fought the Tyranni a half-century ago, a door was opened, a door between the worlds. The dragon lords who had left this world ages ago tried to use that door to return. Some very brave and resourceful men stopped them. But they're still out there. He pointed into the night sky, and several men looked up at the distant stars. And they're still trying to get back. Nacor suddenly spoke. This woman, the Emerald Queen, she was once someone I knew a long time ago. She is what you would call a sorceress, a magician. She made a pact with the serpent men, and they promised her eternal youth. What she didn't know was that she would lose her soul, her spirit, and become something else. Nacor continued, There is very bad magic under that mountain. Tara said, You don't believe in magic. Nacor smiled, but there was little humor in his expression. Call it tricks, then, or spirit force, or anything you like, but those serpent men, they use their powers in a very twisted way. They do evil things that no sane man would think to do, because they are not sane. These are not the creatures that mothers tell children of to make them mind. These are very bad creatures who think that one of the dragon lords named Amalodaka is a goddess. More, they think she is the mother of all creation, the Green Mother, the Emerald Lady of Serpents. She created them as servants, living decoration, nothing more, but they think they are her favorites, like children she loves, and once they open a door for her return, she will elevate them to the status of demigods. They will never believe that if they do this terrible thing, this Alma Lodaka will sweep them away along with everything else. Nacor fell silent a moment, then said, Carlos makes no stories. If this woman, this Emerald Queen, is behaving as I think she is, then things are very bad. Carlos, tell them of your father. Callus nodded. My father is called Tomas. He was a human boy, as all here were. He came to own some artifacts of power, ancient armor, and a golden sword, once the property of a Valheru, by name Ashinshugar. My father wore that armor and carried that sword through the Rift War, against the Tsarani, and over the years he changed. My father is no longer human. He is something unique on this world, a human body changed by the spirit of the long-dead dragon lord who owned that armor and sword. Unique until now, said Nacor, for this emerald queen may be another such as he. The men muttered, and Kala said, For reasons I only half understand. 
My father's nature is that of the human boy, Nacor interrupted again. That is for another time. I know why, and these men don't need to. To the men he said, It's simply true. Thomas is a man with a human heart, despite his power. But this woman, this one who called herself Lady Clovis a long time ago, Atona said, The Emerald Queen is Lady Clovis. It's been nearly twenty-five years since she fled the city with Valgasha and the Hawkon. Nacor shrugged. It's her body. The point, continued Callus, is that if the Pantathians are using their magic to do with this woman what others did with my father, Callus spoke briefly of how his father, a boy from the far coast, had come to wear ancient armor that magically gave him the memories and powers of one of the ancient dragon lords. Nacor is convinced, he finished, that this Emerald Queen is a mortal woman he once knew, with magic ability, but still much like you, who is undergoing a transformation much as my father did more than fifty years ago. Then another dragon lord may soon be among us, finished Nacor. Vigo said, Why can't your father settle her for once and for all? Then we can all go home. Kala said, There's more to this than two dragon lords facing off. More than I'm willing to tell. He glanced at Nacor, who nodded. Nacor said, She's not a Valheru yet. He nodded with certainty. If she was, she'd come flying across the ocean on a dragon. She wouldn't need an army. Kala said, If you're completely through. Nacor grinned, but without any self-consciousness. Probably not. In any event, someone must return to Crondor and tell Prince Nicholas what occurs here. What if only one of us gets back? asked Luis. What do we say? Callus was silent a moment, then told them, You must say this. The Pantathians bring a host to take by force, what they could not take before by guile. Leading them is one in the mantle of a dragon lord who may be able to seize the prize. Tomas and Pug must be warned. He looked at the faces of the men, orange and yellow from the flicker of the firelight, all discomfort from the cold forgotten. Just those three things. That will be ample warning. Now, repeat them. The Pantathians bring a host to take by force what they could not take before by guile. The men repeated the sentence as if learning a lesson in school. Leading them is one in the mantle of a dragon lord who may be able to seize the prize. The men repeated that. Tomas and Pug must be warned. The company repeated that, too. You may be asked a lot of other questions. Answer truly, and do not embellish or color your account. Truth is our only ally in this. But whatever else, you must remember these three things. Nacor said, Now I will help you understand what each of those three things means. So even if you're too stupid to remember more than those three sentences, you might at least answer a question correctly. A few of the men laughed, but most remained quiet. Callus turned away and started down the hillside on his hunt, and he wondered suddenly if he could truly make any of them understand. Dawn saw shivering men making their way down the trail, frost crunching beneath their boot heels. More than one man had a fever, and all were weak from hunger. Callus had been ahead of them for two days now, and no sign of game had been seen. Thankfully, water wasn't a problem, but if they didn't find food soon, men would begin to die. Nacor's seemingly inexhaustible supply of oranges helped, but they would not be enough to keep the men alive in this climate. It was cold during the day and colder at night, plunging below freezing. Without much body fat, through training and the rigors of travel, the men needed more substantial food. Already some were plagued by the stomach flux from eating too many oranges and nothing else. Eric had never seen Rue look so pale, and he knew he must look the same. They were moving through fairly thick woodlands, devoid of color as the leaves of fall blanketed the ground. De Longville turned to signal the halt, when suddenly a shriek cut through the air and arrows came flying. Defensive square! shouted De Longville. Eric snapped his shield to the front, kneeling to cover as much of his body as possible, while the other men in his squad did the same, forming a large square, roughly fifteen men to a side, ready to take the attack. The brush and nearby piles of leaves exploded with the forms of the men who had been hiding there, and others came running from nearby hiding places. Eric saw the green armbands and shouted, It's the snakes, men! 
Steel clashed and swords answered, and Eric was suddenly swinging with all his might at a man wearing a full helm. He cleaved through the man's shield, his sword cutting deep into the left arm. Then he was dodging a counterthrust as the man fell forward. Rue stepped behind him and took the attacker under the sword arm, killing him before he hit the ground. Eric spun to his left and struck at another, while Rue turned to face one running at him full force. The second man leaped forward, smashing shield against shield, knocking the smaller Rue backwards. In the hollow of the square, De Longville, Greylock, and three other men formed a flying company, ready to plug any breach. De Longville stepped forward and quickly killed the man on top of Rue, yanking him off and shouting, Get back in line, Avery. You trying to avoid work? Rue rolled to his feet and shook off his dizziness, then half ran, half jumped back into place beside Eric. The battle hung close, with neither side taking the advantage, and Eric wondered how long he could keep this up, as weak from hunger as he was. Then a shout, quickly followed by another, and men at the rear of the forward portion of the square saw attackers falling, struck from behind by arrows. Callus stood down the trail, quickly taking bead and letting fly, and before they knew someone was behind them, four attackers had fallen. With a small pause on that one front, the Longville shouted, Charge them! and led his five companions toward the strongest section of the attack. The attackers were expecting anything but a counterattack, which threw them off balance. Seconds later, they were running for their lives. Eric chased two men down a narrow pathway, overtaking one and striking him down from behind. The other swung to face him, raising his sword high, and Eric sought to take him with a quick thrust. The man anticipated this, and Eric's head rang with a shock of a shield bash to the face. Red lights exploded in his vision, and he staggered back, raising his shield in reflex. Hours of training saved his life, as an instant later a sword blow rang on the shield. Eric swung blindly and felt his own sword strike his opponent's shield. His vision cleared in time to avoid another strike, and the two men backed away a step, acknowledging that and the other each faced a dangerous opponent. From somewhere behind, Eric heard the long Bill's voice cut through the woods. I want a prisoner! Eric tried to shout and found his mouth didn't work. He spat and felt a tooth wiggle. He tasted blood and felt his right eye burning as it began to blur with the blood running into it. Gathering his wits, he shouted, Over here! The man facing him, a large, weather-beaten figure of middle years, stood hesitating for a moment, then took another step backwards. Over here! Eric shouted again as he attacked the man, rushing him. The man stood to take the attack, but rather than strike an overhand blow, Eric ducked, threw his shoulder behind his shield, and bashed the man, hoping to knock him down. The man staggered backwards, and Eric drew back his blade, then danced backwards as the other swordsman lashed out. Eric again yelled, Over here! and circled to his right, attempting to cut off any avenue of escape. The man tensed, and Eric made ready to counter a blow, when suddenly the man let his sword fall from his hand. He quickly tossed down his shield and took off his helm, which he also threw to the ground. Eric glanced behind and saw Callus drawing a bead on the man. Eric breathed hard. Took you long enough. Callus looked at Eric and smiled slightly. It just seemed like a long time. Once the man had surrendered, he was affable enough. His name was Dewar, and he was originally from the city of Hamsa, but for the last seven years a member of a company called Nahut's Grand Company. Callus, De Longville, and Greylock interviewed the man while Nacor and Chopi tended the wounded. Eric's wounds were superficial, a small cut to the forehead, a cut lip, some loose teeth, and lots of bruises. Chopi gave him some herbs to take and told him to sit with his hands over his face doing reiki for at least a half hour, and he might keep those teeth. He sat on a rock with his hands over his face, elbows on knees, while others around him groaned in pain, those able to do reiki on their own wounds or being cared for by others. Seventeen men had died in the battle. Of the enemy, twenty-four. When Callus had struck from their rear, they had assumed another company was coming, and it had broken them. Otherwise, it would have been worse. The war said that a hundred men had lain in wait. Having spotted Callus passing the day before, a scout of Nahoots had backtracked, seeing the company coming down the trail above, and had returned in time for their captain to organize the ambush. Nothing personal, said the war. It was orders. We got this trail, and we were told to kill anyone comes this way. It's that simple. Who gave you the orders? Eric heard Callus ask. Someone high up in the Queen's command. Maybe Fadawa himself. I don't know. Now, Hoot's not about to go around explaining everything, you see. He just tells us what to do, and we do it. Calder said, So they're keeping their flanks covered. I guess. Things are pretty crazy, and everyone's running around like chickens in a thunderstorm. We don't even know who's coming to relieve us. When are they due to relieve you? said the Longville. Eric felt the heat from his hands healing him. 
Otherwise, he would love to have removed them to see what was happening. Don't really know, said the war. A couple more days, maybe a week. We've been out here almost a month, and it's just about got the captain chewing his saddle. Calla said, take him over there. Eric heard the war say, Captain, I'm wondering, are you giving me a day, or are you going to offer me service? Why? asked Callus. Well, we're a hell of a long way from anywhere, that's all. My horse is down at the end of this trail, along with all my personals, and it's cold, as you may have noticed. I'd just as soon not be running from your men come sundown tomorrow. Calla said, Can we trust this one? It was Podgy's voice Eric heard next. As much as you can trust any of these mother lovers. I know Nahoot by reputation. He's not one of the worst, but he's certainly far from one of the best. You'd fight against your own companions? Much as any of you would. Rules of war. I've been given no bonus to die for lost causes. His voice dropped to a near mutter. Hell, Captain, none of us have been paid in more than a month. And we're far from looting anything, unless it's nuts from squirrels. There was a moment of silence before Callus said, Guide us to where your former company is, and we'll give you your horse and turn you loose. No one will follow you as long as you head for Pomans. Sounds more than fair, Captain. Eric heard the man being led away, and then he heard the long Bill's voice, low but carrying. Are you mad? There's still something like seventy or so swords down there. But they won't know we're coming at them, said Callus. Advantage of surprise, said Longville, his tone one of disbelief. It's the only advantage we've got, Bobby, replied Callus. We're out on our feet. We need rest and food. There's food down there, and horses. If we can take that company, we might even be able to get back to Maharta without interference. What are you thinking? asked Greylock. Callus said, If things are as confused on this flank as he says, whoever comes to replace this Nahoot might not have any idea what he looks like. If we're waiting for them in the agreed-upon place, wearing those green armbands... The Longville groaned, and Eric was glad his hands covered his face to hide the grimace he made. Eric waited. Ahead, Callus, Chopi, Luis, and Jado crept along, looking for the sentries they knew must be there. Callus held up his hand, motioned to his right, then handed his bow to Jado. He tapped Chopi on the shoulder and pulled his dagger from his belt. Chopi laid his sword and shield on the ground, pulling his own knife. Luis had his out, and Callus motioned for him to circle to the left. Callus pointed to Jado, indicating he was to wait. The three men, Callus and Chopi to the right, Luis to the left, circled out of sight into the evening gloom. Three moons were out, the middle moon high in the sky, and the large and small moons rising. Eric knew it was only going to get brighter as the night progressed, so that the time right now offered their best cover. A sudden sound of movement, then a low grunt cut through the night, and then silence. Eric waited for any sound of alarm, but none was forthcoming. Then Callus was back, retrieving his bow and gesturing to the others to follow. Eric motioned to the line of men behind him and moved as silently as possible down the trail. A few yards beyond where Callus and the others had stopped, he found the dead guard, eyes staring vacantly skyward. He gave the man a quick glance, then got his mind back to the matters at hand. His nose still hurt, but it was only a dull throb, and his lips were now puffy. His teeth wiggled when he touched them with his tongue, so he tried not to, but found himself constantly probing the loosened teeth. They had rested less than an hour. Then Callus had abandoned the dead and left the wounded behind, and had ordered Dewar to show him where his former company's camp lay. Two of the walking wounded now guarded him back up the trail until after the coming fight. Ahead they saw lights, and Eric wondered how many men there were to be so confident just hours after fleeing a battle. Then he could see movement and realized that they were anxious down there, for at least ten men stood watch around the camp. But what astonished Eric the most was that no defenses had been erected. There were twenty four-man tents, haphazardly scattered around the area, with a large bonfire in the center. The sound of horses carried through the night, and Eric judged a large picket line was situated somewhere on the other side of the camp. Eric watched Callus, who signaled for him to approach. Eric moved to Callus's side, and the captain whispered, I want you to lead the first ten men behind you through the trees over there. He pointed to his right. Circle around and get ready to hit them from the side. They're wary now, but after a few hours of nothing happening, they're going to relax. They may think we're running the other way or not coming down until morning. He glanced at the sky. 
It's about four hours until midnight. Once you're in place, be alert but relax. I'm not going to hit them until most of them are asleep. The Longville said, When you hear anything, come running hard. Hit them as fast as you can, and numbers won't mean much. They'll be so confused they won't know what's out here in the dark, but only if you act at once. Eric nodded and moved back in line. He tapped the next ten men on the shoulder, starting with the row, and motioned for them to follow him. The Tombi, the former Keshian legionary, grinned as they moved into the woods. Eric was quiet as he could be, but he was certain at any minute the alarm would sound. When he was approximately one-third of the way around the camp, he halted the men. A couple of sentries stood opposite their position, barely visible to the trees, but obviously more interested in talking to each other than in maintaining vigilance. Eric hoped Callus was right. He motioned for the men to sit, indicating they should rest. He signaled Rue to take the first watch. Eric sat down and put his hands back over his face. He felt the warmth return to his hands and was glad he had been taught this healing. He decided he would hate to lose those teeth. At the appointed time, Callus shouted and launched his attack. The camp was slow to come around, as most of the men were asleep. As they moved to repel the assault from one front, Eric and his ten men raced into their flank. Eric was on a man coming from a tent before he had his pants on. The man died before he could pull a sword. Another was down before he could turn, then suddenly one faced him, astonishment on his face. He shouted, They're behind us! Eric bashed as hard as he could with his sword, and the man went down screaming. Natombi shouted some Cassian war cry, and Bigo let out a bellow to freeze the blood. Men were scrambling from their low tents, and Eric knocked several unconscious with the flat of his blade before they could gather their wits. Then, before he knew it, men were throwing helms, shields, and swords to the ground. The Longville hurried along, commanding the prisoners be taken to the fire. Half-dressed, dazed, and dispirited, several of them swore openly when they saw how few attackers had routed them. Eric glanced around, still suspecting treachery, but found only defeated men looking around in amazement. Of Callus's forty-three men, only thirty-seven had been fit for this fight, and they had almost bloodlessly captured nearly two times their own number. Suddenly Eric felt like laughing. He tried to fight it, but couldn't. He let out a chuckle at first, then started laughing aloud. Then others in his company joined in, and soon there were cheers as Callus's Crimson Eagles had their first victory in a long time. Callus moved through and said, Get no hoot over here. A man among the captives said, He's dead. You killed him up the trail yesterday. Why didn't the war tell us? asked the Longville. He didn't know the bleeder. We carried no hoot down here, and he died at supper. Gut wound. Messy. Who's leading? I guess I am, said the man, stepping forward. Name's Kelka. You the sergeant? asked the Longville. No, the corporal. Sergeant got his head split, too. The Longville said, Well, that partially explains why there was nothing like a defense. Begging your pardon, Captain, said Kalka. Are you going to offer us service? Why? asked Callus. Well, we haven't been paid in a while, and as we've got no captain and no sergeant. Well, Captain, you kicked hell out of us with only half our number. I figure you've got to be better than anyone else we're likely to run into if you give us the day's grace. I'll think about it. Captain, if you don't mind, are you going to take our tents? Callus shook his head. Get back over there. I'll tell you what I'm going to do once I decide. Callus motioned for the Longville and said, Get some food into the men, and send someone up the trail to lead the wounded and the war down here. I want everyone here by noon tomorrow. He motioned to the captives. We'll figure out what to do with them in the morning. Eric sat down, feeling his legs shake. It had been a very long day, and he was exhausted as he knew everyone else in the company was. Then the Longville's voice cut through the air. What? Who told anyone to rest? We've got a camp to make ready. Men began to groan as the Longville ordered, I want a trench and breastwork dug, and I want stakes sharpened. Bring in the horses and stake them nearby. I want a full inventory of stores, and I want to know who's injured. Then after we've got this camp in shape, maybe I'll think about letting you get some sleep. Eric forced himself to stand, and as he moved, he wondered aloud, Where are we going to find shovels? The Longville shouted back, Use your hands if you have to, Von Darkmoor. 22. Infiltration. Callus whispered. Eric couldn't hear the captain's conversation, but he saw Prodgy and Greylock nodding agreement. 
The prisoners had been moved to a small wash, where a handful of men could easily guard them. The Longville was interviewing them against what plan of the captains, Eric had no idea. The traditional head start for the losers who surrendered was a day before any hostilities would be resumed. Usually, according to Prodigy, those who cleared out were left alone, if they kept moving. Eric was lost in thought when Rue approached. How are the horses? asked Rue. They're a little scrawny. The grass is poor this time of year, and they've been kept too long in the same place, but otherwise they're fine. If we move them a couple of times over the next week, they should put some weight on, especially if I can find a place to shelter them at night from the wind. It's the cold takes weight off them as much as anything else. Their heavy coats are starting to come in, so they'll be all right. Rue said, What do you think the captain has in mind? Eric said, I don't really know. I find it strange. He's talking about heading down for Port Grief loud enough so those prisoners can hear. Rue grinned. Not if that's where we want the Queen's Army to look for us. What next? We've got plenty to do, said Eric, and we'd better get on it before de Longville comes back. He finds us loafing around, and there'll be hell to pay. Rue groaned. I'm dying of hunger. Suddenly Eric realized he hadn't eaten except for a quick mouthful the night before. Let's grab something, he said, and Rue's expression brightened. Then we'll get back to work. Rue's expression turned dark again, but he followed his friend. They had done a complete inventory the night before, and found that while Nahoot's men hadn't been paid in a while, they certainly were well provisioned. Eric and Rue made their way to the tent they shared with Luis and Bigot. Chopi and Atombi had moved in with Nacor and Jado in another four-man tent, and found the other two sleeping inside. Half a loaf of trail bread, baked only a couple of days before, and a bowl of grain and nuts were sitting by the entrance, so Eric sat, let out a sigh, and picked up the bread. He tore it in half and gave a hunk to Rue, and then scooped up a handful of grain and nuts and started to eat. The air was chilly, but the sun warm, and after eating, Eric felt drowsy. Looking at Luis and Bigo, he felt the urge to follow their example, but fought it off. There was still work to be done, and he knew de Longville would make it harder on them if he had to tell them. Eric got up and woke Luis and Bigo. They saw Rue and Eric, and Bigo said, "'It had better be good.' "'It is,' whispered Eric. "'Come with me.' Luis looked at Eric with eyes made even more dangerous-looking by the dark circles underneath. As he rose, Eric asked softly, "'Got your knives?' Luis whispered, "'Always,' and whipped his dagger from his belt in a motion so swift it was almost unseen. "'Are there some throats in need of cutting?' Eric said, "'Follow me.' He led them through the tents, moving quickly and pausing often to look around, as if to see if they were being observed. Eric moved to where the digging continued, as men made the quickly dug trench of the night before a deeper, wider barrier. Reaching the work, he pointed to a stack of freshly cut dowels laying in a bundle and said, Quickly, before they get loose. Those need to be sharpened and placed around the perimeter. Rue and Bigo smiled and picked up a piece each as they pulled their belt knives, but Luis glowered. You'll walk me for this? Better I than de Longville, isn't it? Luis stared hard at Eric a moment. For a second he held his knife point directed at Eric. Then with a grunt he leaned over, picked up a dowel, and started to sharpen it. Rue and Bigo laughed, as Eric said, That's good. I'm going to see that the horses are moved. As he laughed, he looked over his shoulder at the men sharpening stakes. Anyone coming across that trench would have a difficult climb over the rampart because of the stakes, and once they broke camp, they could pack them away. Eric moved to the other side of the large defensive square. He joined two men fashioning a drop gate out of wood cut from nearby trees. The lack of proper tools was making the job difficult, as they were basically having to cut the timber with the one axe Nahoot's company had carried, then trim the planks with knives and daggers. Eric would have given the small amount of gold in his purse for a proper drag plane and some iron working tools. Eric knew a little about woodwork so he suggested they carve some notches and dovetail the planks together as best they could, then lash the whole thing with cord. They could run it out when they needed from inside the compound. They wouldn't be able to break it down and carry it with them, as they had with the gate they had built at Weenot. That one had been lost with most of their other equipment outside the barrow, up on the plain of Joms. Eric wondered about crossing the plain. Even though they were miles farther south than when they last encountered the Jelani, he knew that to encounter the diminutive warriors could spell the ruin of this mission. At the last, he decided there were too many things to worry about, so he'd leave worrying to Callus and to Longville, while he just did the work that needed to be done. After seeing the gate finished, 
He noticed the day was rapidly approaching noon. He ordered a couple of fires started and then decided to see if the watch had changed. He found the same men on duty since he had passed them at first light, so he went back into the tents and kicked some protesting men awake, telling them it was their turn on watch. He was seeing that the mess was in order for the noon meal when DeLongville returned from interrogating the Hoot's men. DeLongville got off his mount and asked, Is that parapet finished? Eric said, About two hours ago. Stakes? Being sharpened and placed now. The gate? In place. Sally ramp? It's being built. I doubt it will be much use, though. More than a single horse at a time, and it might fall apart. Has anyone changed the watch? I took care of that a few minutes ago. Where's the captain? Up talking to Greylock, Praji, Vaja, and Atonis. Regular officer's country, eh? Asked Longville, taking a cup from near the cook's fire. He dipped it into a bubbling kettle, then blew on the contents before he finally took a sip of hot soup. Eric said, If you say so, Sergeant, I'm still new at this. The Longville surprised him with a grin, then drank a soup. Making a face, he said, This needs some salt. He tossed the cup down and started walking away. If you need me for anything, I'll be with the captain. Eric turned to one of the men near the cook pot and said, I wonder what that was about. The man was named Samuel. He had served with one of the first groups taken from the gallows and had been around to Longville for a long time. Sergeant has his reasons for doing what he's doing. Then he paused. After a moment, he added, But it's the first real smile out of him since Forster died, Corporal. Eric started to correct the man, as no one had named him Corporal officially, but then thought if it made the men do what needed to be done that much quicker, he'd be better served by keeping his mouth shut. He only shrugged. As the food was almost ready, Eric decided it was time to get the men rotating through the mess so the sentries could get a hot meal before the next watch. Eric oversaw the distribution of horses to those men given one day's grace before being hunted down. Callus made an unusual offer to them. If they would ride directly for the River Dee to the south, then follow it to the coast before making for either Chattistan or Ispar, he would send no one after them. He warned them that if they followed him and his men to Port Grief, he would kill every one of them. He also paid a small bonus in gold. The men who were turned loose swore a mercenary's oath to do as bidden and were now getting ready to ride out of the camp. What surprised Eric was that about twenty of Nahoot's men were being offered a place in the company. They were being kept apart from those trained by DeLongville by being put under Greylock, and they would ride with Hatonis's clansmen. But having outsiders at this late juncture was a risk Eric was not sure he would be willing to take. Then again, he decided, that was probably why Callus was the prince's eagle of Trondor, and he was only an acting corporal. The Longville came over and watched as Eric set up the sixty men leaving. They were being given the least desirable horses, and knew it, but at least none of them were lame. They were allowed to carry a week's worth of rations and the gold Callus gave them, as well as their weapons. All other baggage and stores were remaining with Callus's company. A half-dozen riders from Callus's company would shadow the men for a half-day, then return. When all were mounted and ready, the order was given, and the defeated mercenaries and their escort rode out. Eric watched them leave, then asked, Sergeant, why are we taking on those extra men? De Longville said, Captain's got his reasons. You just keep an eye on them to see they do as they're told. And don't worry why they're here. Just one thing. Pass the word that no one is to talk about our previous set to with a sa hour with those new men. Eric nodded and walked off to pass word. When he reached the center of the compound, he saw that Greylock was passing out green armbands. Eric took one and said, What is this? As of this morning, we are now in the Hoots Grand Company. He motioned to where the Longville was walking, inspecting the stores they'd won. He's no Hoot. At least the men who've joined us say Bobby looks the most like him of any of us here. Eric said, and Callus figures the Sa'awa might think we all look alike anyway. Greylock grinned. Never thought you were stupid. Glad to see I was right. He put his hand on Eric's shoulder and walked him away from the men gathering to pick up their armbands. Lowering his voice, he said, Nahoot's due to be relieved in the next few days. At least that's what everyone thinks. So if we can pass ourselves off, then we can walk back into the Queen's camp and no one will look at us twice. Something like that. If those boys are to be believed, things are even crazier down here than they were up north of Lanana. There's a chance we might run into someone who might remember us from up there, but it's a slim one. 
Greylock looked around to see who was nearby, then continued, Seems no hoots for us were sent to find us. Is that a fact or a guess? asked Eric. Guess, but probably a good one. The orders were to ride out to this road and keep a lookout for any company riding down out of the mountains that didn't have armbands and didn't know the password. I don't know who they were expecting to come down out of those mountains except us. Eric said, You're right. I wouldn't bet against its being us they were looking for. Greylock shrugged. Maybe they're concerned we saw something up in that maze of caves and galleries. Eric said, I saw enough to think it's not some place I'm in a hurry to visit again. Greylock grinned. How are the horses? Good. We've moved them, and they're fattening up on fall grass. There's nothing here to ride that a noble back home would lose sleep over not owning, but for common mercenaries, they're a serviceable bunch. Pick me out a good one, Greylock said. I've got to get back. We're setting new duty to get the new recruits out of our hair, and then we're going to wait. Wait for what? Replacements, so we can head back to join in the assault on the harter. Eric shook his head. We've got a funny way of fighting this war. Helping the enemy take that objective. Greylock shrugged. Aside from the pain and dying, war can be a pretty funny business, Eric. I've read every written history of war I could get my hands on, and I know this. Once a plan of battle is set loose, it takes on a life of its own. And once you make contact with the enemy, the plan has little meaning anymore. It's grab the moment so you can seize the day. Mostly it's hoping the other side makes a mistake before you do and getting lucky. Callus had a plan when we started out, but once he and Acor found what they sought out at the Queen's camp, it's been tossed aside and now he's making it up as we go. So he's hoping the other side makes a mistake before we do, and that we're going to get lucky? Something like that. Then I'll say a prayer to Ruthia, said Eric as Greylock turned and walked away. Eric thought about what he had seen so far and what he had done, and was forced to concede that Greylock was right. There was little of planning and cleverness in what Callus had done since making contact with the Queen's army, and a great deal of boldness and hoping for luck. Putting aside such weighty considerations, Eric decided that as long as things were settling down to routine, he'd try to get some work done on his armor and weapons. He returned to his tent and found it empty, as his three bunkmates were off working on finishing the palisades. Eric unbuckled his sword removed his helm, and stripped off his breastplate. He grabbed a rag and some oil he had liberated from stores and began to work on his armor. He frowned when he saw how corrosion was finding niches to take hold and set to with a vengeance to expunge all imperfections from his breastplate. A rider came speeding over the rise, pushing his lathered horse up the trail for all he was worth. Eric instantly turned and shouted, Rider coming in! De Longville had the men racing for weapons and taking up positions before the rider reached the gate. Recognizing the rider as one of their own, Eric motioned for the bridge to be run out. The moat and rampart camp had been turned into a first-rate base since Callus had run off Nahoot's company. They had found a wandering herd of bison down a ways in the woods, and some deer, as well as a good supply of nuts. With the food liberated from Nahoot's grand company, they were amply provisioned for the time being. As the rider reached the bridge, he reined in, dismounting as quickly as he could. He led the horse across the bridge, which flexed and creaked alarmingly but which held better than Eric had expected. Shrinking the leather had helped, and it would serve, but it still made him nervous each time a horse was hawked across. The rider tossed the reins to Eric and ran past him to where the Longville and Callus were approaching. It's the Greenskins, he shouted. Where? asked the Longville. Down the trail. It's a large patrol, maybe twenty of them. They don't seem to be in any hurry. Callus thought for a moment. Tell the men to stand down. I want us looking alert, but I don't want anything suspicious. Eric passed the word as he led the rider's horse away. He found Luis on duty around the picket and told him to walk the horse for a while to cool her out, then to rub her down and feed her. He returned in time to see men back at their normal posts, but noticed that every man had a weapon close to hand, and many looked on edge. As he walked by, he quietly said, Take it easy, or relax. You'll know soon enough if there's going to be trouble. Still, it was a painfully slow twenty minutes until the first of the hour hove into view. Eric studied them for he had been too busy staying alive the last time he saw them mounted to study them carefully. Rue came to stand beside him and said, That's some sight. Say what you will about the greenskins, but they know how to sit those impossible mounts of theirs. The Sa'awa rode with long legs and easy seats, as if they had spent their lives on horseback. Each rider had a short bow slung across the back of a saddle, and Eric said a silent prayer that the company they had faced before had tried to charge them rather than stand off and shoot. Most of them carried round shields made of hide over wood, marked with symbols alien to Eric. 
The leader wore a plume of horsehair, dyed blue, tied up in a large obsidian ring, affixed to a metal skull cap. The others wore simple metal helms that had large flaring sides and bar nasals. When the last riders came into view, Eric quickly counted. There were twenty of them, followed by a baggage train of four more horses. When they reached the camp, they halted, and the leader shouted, Where is Nahut? His accent was thick, and he tended to roar, but he could be understood. The Longville, wearing a helm that covered his eyes, moved to the other side of the bridge. What is it? he shouted. What have you to report? Towers had fought on this, and had instructed every man, save the new recruits from the Hoots Company, in what was coming next. We were ambushed by some men trying to come down this road. We routed them and chased them back up into the mountains. What? roared the Sa'awa leader. You were told to send a messenger if you found any of those trying to leave the mountains. We sent one, shouted the Longville, trying his best to sound angry. Are you claiming he never reached you? I claim nothing, human, shouted the angry Sa'awa. When did this happen? Less than a week ago. A week? The Sa'awa shouted something in his own language, and half his company started up the trail. The leader said, We need provisions. You will leave and return to the host. I am not pleased. Well, you can bet I'm not pleased. You went and lost my runner, shouted De Longville. I'm going to make sure General Fadawa hears of this. And imps of the evening will come to have sex with you because you are so lovely, snapped back the officer. Eric suddenly relaxed. If the Sa'awa was going to fight, he wouldn't be trading insults with De Longville while dismounting. Whoever this officer was... He had accepted that the Longville was Nahoot and was content to trade insults with him while the two companies changed places. Any trouble with the Jelani? No, grunted the Sahara officer. Our riders have chased the little hairy humans back into the mountains to the north of here. The ride will be so quiet you may sleep in the saddle. He moved on to the bridge, and his huge horse's weight made it creak alarmingly, but it held even if it did bow under the load. He led his animal into camp without noticing. Eric gave a silent prayer of thanks that it held. And he was pleased he wasn't going to be around to see if the bridge held after repeated sour use. The Longville shouted, Break camp! I want every man mounted and ready to ride in ten minutes. Eric hurried, for like every man there, he knew the longer they were around the sour, the better the chance someone would let something slip that would start a fight. He hurried to his tent with Rue beside him and found Big O and Luis already setting about breaking things down. Rue, said Eric, grab my kit. I'm going to keep an eye on the Hoots men. Rue spared Eric any barb about ducking work, and merely said, I'll take care of it. Eric moved to where the twenty men from the Hoots company waited and saw they were muttering among themselves. Not giving them any chance to decide they might be better off turning Callus into the Sa'awa, he shouted, Get over to those horses and start bringing them up. I want the first six for the officers. Then start bringing them up to the first tent, then the second, and the third, until every other man has a mount. Then get your own gear together and get mounted. Understood? His tone, as loud and ferocious as he could make it, imparted the proper message. The last wasn't a question, it was a command. The twenty men moved quickly, several saying, Yes, Corporal, as they half walked, half ran to the remounts. The Longville showed up less than a minute later and said, Where are the newcomers? Eric pointed. I've got them bringing up the horses for the others, and I'll keep an eye on them. The Longville nodded. Good. He turned without another word and rejoined Callus and Greylock. The Sa'awa commander was busy pulling a roll off the back of one of the baggage horses, and Eric turned to watch Nahoot's band. The twenty newcomers were hurrying with the mounts, doing their best to remain orderly, while around them the compound was abuzz with activity. Eric hurried to where his three tent mates were breaking down their equipment, and Rue threw him his bundle. Did yours first, he said. Eric smiled and said, Thanks, as he grabbed his saddle and then ran back to where the newcomers were leading horses. He selected one and quickly tacked it up, then stowed his roll behind the saddle and mounted. He rode briskly at a trot down the line as the compound seemed to melt away. Tents were folded, somehow forced into the small packs that carried them, and stacked up to be tied on the back of a baggage animal. The palisades had already been cleared of stakes, which were now being stored away on a baggage horse. Men were in their saddles and getting in line before the last of the horses were brought up by Nahoot's men. The only things they were leaving behind for the hour were the moat, the bridge and gate, and some cook fires. Eric watched as the hour camp went up. Ten large circular tents, fashioned from what looked like cane or wooden poles bent over into a semicircle and covered with hide, were erected. They were so small that he wondered how the Sa'awa managed to get inside. He elected not to ask to see, and turned his attention to the last men. 
The newcomers were ragged in getting themselves organized, but at last they were ready to ride. Eric moved aside as Callus gave the order to leave and watched as the men rode past him. He also watched the Sa'our commander keeping his eye on the departing humans. There was something in those red and white eyes that seemed suspicious. At least Eric thought that's the case. But then suddenly the commander waved goodbye. Eric found his own hand raised in a parting gesture before he thought better of it. He turned his mount and took his place as last in line. As he passed over the bridge they were leaving behind for the Sa'our, he thought, How odd, like old friends bidding each other a good journey. They passed down from the foothills overlooking the plain of Joms, entering grasslands patrolled by Sa'our companies. Whatever else might have occupied the invaders, a company of mercenaries wearing emerald armbands riding calmly toward the heart of the army wasn't a cause for concern. Several times they passed camps, or signs of camps. Callus judged the Sa'our and their allies were still sweeping the area regularly, perhaps to keep the Jilani at bay, or perhaps to guard against others seeking to hinder the southern conquest. They rode for a week without incident, until they came to their first major staging point, a Martin Bailey construction large enough to house several hundred men and horses. A lookout in the tower high atop the mott called down, and there was a squad of Sa'our waiting for them at a checkpoint a hundred yards before the gate. Without preamble, the lead Sa'our shouted, Orders! We're to rejoin the host, said Callus evenly. What company? The Hoots Grand Company, answered De Longville. The lead Sa'our fixed De Longville with a steady gaze and said, You look different. Keeping his voice rough, De Longville said, You spend your evening sitting up in those bloody damn hills chilling your backside for a while and see how different you look. The Sa'our tensed, as if this wasn't the answer he expected. But the war, one of the men from the Hoots Company said, Let us get by, Murtag. We don't have time for your games. The Sa'our turned and said, You, I know, Dewar. I should cleave you both for your bad manners. The war said, Then who would you have left to cheat at knucklebones? There was a long silence. Then suddenly the Sa'our named Murtag let out a bray that sounded like a leather thong being drawn through a drumhead. He said, Pass, or son, but you must camp outside the moat. We are crowded inside. When you come to game tonight, bring plenty of gold. After they had ridden away from the checkpoint, Eric urged his horse up to the war's side and said, What was that noise? The mercenary shook his head and said, That's their idea of laughter, if you can believe it. Murtag's a bully of sorts, but it's all bluster. Oh, he could cut you in two if he had a mind, but he'd rather have you trembling and pissing your pants, or insulting him back. It's the indifferent ones that get on his nerves. I've gambled with him enough to know. After he's had some drink, he's pretty good company for a lizard. Know some funny stories. Eric smiled. You've earned a bonus. A calculating look crossed to War's face. You and me should talk later, Corporal. After the horses are better, answered Eric. Eric made his way quickly to where the Longville and Callus rode, leaning over in his saddle so he could speak quietly to the Longville. I told the war he earned a bonus, De Longville said, and you can pay it. Callus motioned for the company to fan out on the east side of the moat, near another company of men, who ignored their arrival. He turned his horse around and said, What is it? Young Von Darkmoor here is giving away your money. Eric explained, and Callus said, What's troubling you? He was too quick and easy to bluff us past the Sa'ar. I don't trust him. I remember he was pretty quick to end the fight as well, almost as if he wanted to be captured, finished Callus. The Longville grinned, and Eric said, What is it? Those twenty we kept with us, Eric, answered Callus, aren't the men we felt most able to trust. The Longville said, They're the ones we most need to keep an eye on. Eric sat back in his saddle and stared open-mouthed for a moment, then shook his head. I'm an idiot. No, said Callus, but you've a lot to learn about the less obvious side of Warcraft. The twenty men we kept all had answers that came a bit too fast and easy for mercenaries. I think this Emerald Queen has agents sprinkled throughout her army. All oh, twenty aren't agents, I'm sure, but I'm almost certain one or two are, maybe more. So we keep the most likely close by. Trusting bunch, offered the Longville. Now look. You and a couple of men you trust, say Bigo and Jado, keep close to those men. Don't let too many of them off duty at any one time, and keep an eye on where they wander. If any of them head into that fortress, I want one of you along. 
He reached inside his tunic and pulled out a heavy purse. We lost some gold in the baggage train, but I kept most of it. He opened the pouch and handed a dozen small coins to Eric. Pass some of this around so that if any one of those twenty lads wants to step into the fort for a drink, you'll be the fellow to buy it for them, understand? Eric nodded. I'll make sure no more than four of them are free to cause trouble at a time. He turned his horse, put heels to its flanks, and rode back down toward the end of the line. Callis said, He's rounding out nicely. The Longville said, oh, He's still not nearly half mean enough, but I'll fix that. Callis smiled slightly and turned back to oversee the making of the camp. Eric walked the perimeter of the camp, keeping an eye out for anything out of the ordinary. With a fortress at their back, Callis had ordered no rampart and trench dug. The men set up their tents quickly and saw to their stores and began to settle in for the night. As he moved along, Eric noticed that the eight men from the Hoots company that he had put to guarding the remounts were at their posts, talking in pairs, but otherwise where they should be. Four others were bedded down, or at least had been, ten minutes before when he had passed their tent. Jado was watching that group. Four others were working commissary duty. That left four unaccounted for, and if Bigo was doing as ordered, he was close to them. Eric found Rue in his tent, trying to get some sleep. I thought you had duty, said Eric, sitting down to pull off his boots. I traded with Luis. He wanted to go into the fortress and see if there were any whores. The thought of women suddenly had Eric interested, so he stopped pulling off his boots. Maybe I should check up. Rolling over, Rue said sleepily, You do that. Eric quickly made his way to Callus's command tent, where he found Callus and Delongville talking with Greylock who had somehow found a pipe and tobacco. Eric found the habit noxious, but had put up with it all his life. Smoking was common enough in the tap room at the inn of the pintail, though it was discouraged when serious wine tasting was underway. For a moment, Eric wondered what had become of the fancy flint and steel lighter he had possessed back home. What? asked the long bill. I'm going into the fort, said Eric, if that's all right. Luis is in there, and I think Bigo is there, too. The long bill nodded. Keep alert he said with a dismissive wave. Eric walked up the damp hillock upon which the fortress had been erected and made his way along the perimeter until he reached the gate. It was still open and the guards on duty were almost asleep. A pair of Sa'awar, one wearing what Eric took to be an officer's mark on his breastplate, were talking inside a hut at the gate, but they ignored him as he walked in. The long girl had called the fort a classic Martin Bailey and Eric was fascinated by its construction. An earthen hill had been raised up and a tower built high upon it. Around this hill and tower, a large open area, the bailey, had been left, with the buildings nestled against the wall, sheltered by it. Suddenly it struck Eric that this is the sort of construction Callus had undertaken at Weenot, but on a much more modest scale. This tower could house a half-dozen bowmen with little discomfort, on a platform thirty feet above the ground. A fifteen-foot-high log wall had been erected around a small village, complete with wooden rampart and earthen reinforcement. An army would have little trouble with such a fortress, but most single companies would have had more than enough trouble to take such a fortification. Inside there were a half-dozen buildings, all made of wood and covered with daub made from dried mud and straw. Smaller wattle and daub huts had sprung up around the larger buildings, and a fair-sized town had evolved. Eric could see when the hour at the gate had ordered them to remain outside. It was quite close inside this fortress. He heard laughing and moved toward what he assumed would be an inn and once inside he knew he had been correct. The room was dingy with smoke and poor light, but the stench of ale, spilled wine, and human perspiration struck Eric like a blow. Suddenly he was terribly homesick and wished to be nowhere so much as back at the end of the pintail. He pushed down the sudden surge of feeling and made his way to the bar. The barkeep, a stout man with a florid complexion, said, What'll be? Got any good wine? asked Eric. The man raised an eyebrow. Everyone else seemed to be drinking ale or fortified spirits, but he nodded and produced a dark bottle from beneath the counter. The cork was intact, so Eric hoped the bottle was fresh and not resealed. Old wine tasted like vinegar mixed with raisins, but you couldn't convince the average tavern keeper he couldn't just stick the cork back in at the end of a day and unseal it again the next and not have his customers complain. The barman produced a cup and poured. Eric sipped. The wine was sweeter than he would have liked, but not as cloying as the dessert wines made to the north of Yabon. Still, it was acceptable, and he paid and indicated that Barkeep should leave the bottle. He glanced around the room and saw Bigo on the far side, trying to look inconspicuous and failing mightily. 
He leaned against the wall behind a table where five men gamed with Tusa Hour. The lizard men were too large for their chairs, but they hunkered down as best they could and seemed intent upon the game. Eric recognized the sound of knuckle bones, as they called dice here, rattling across the table and the accompanying shouts of the winners and groans of the losers. After a few minutes, the war stood up and left the game. He came over to Eric and said, Got a minute? Eric motioned to the barkeep for another cup and filled it. The war sipped and made a face. Nothing like the wine from the grand vineyards of home, is it? He said. Where's home? asked Eric. The war said, Far from here. Let's go outside for a minute. Eric picked up the bottle and let the war lead him outside into the fresh, cold night air. The man looked one way, then the other, and signaled for Eric to follow him around the corner, into a dark place next to the wall, sheltered above by the palisades. Look, Corporal, began the war. Let's have an end to the mummery. You're the company Nahoot was sent to keep from coming this way. What makes you think that, said Eric? You're the ones that jumped us. I wasn't born this morning, said the man with a grin. I know your captain's not your captain, but the slender blonde fellow is. What do you want? A way to get rich, said the war, a greedy glint in his eye. How do you propose to do that, said Eric, moving his hand slowly down to his sword. Look, I could maybe get myself a gold coin or two for telling Murtag you're not who you say you are. But that's a gold coin or two, and I'm back looking for a company to join. He glanced around. But I don't like what I'm seeing lately with this grand conquest. Too many men dying for too little gold. There's not going to be much left of use to anyone if it keeps on, don't you see? So I'm thinking I might be a help to you and your captain, but I'll want more than wages and found. You'll get ample chance for loot when we take Maharta. Eric said noncommittally. The war took a step forward, lowering his voice. How long do you think you can keep this up? You lot are not like any company I've seen, and I've been around more than most. You talk funny, and you have the look of, I don't know, some sort of soldiers, without the parade ground nonsense, but tough like mercenaries. But whatever you are, you're not what you want people to think you are, and it ought to be worth something for me to stay quiet. So that's why you covered for us at the gate? Sure. Most of us look alike to the Sa'our, and Murtag's pretty stupid. Don't make that mistake about most Sa'our. Which is why he's stuck out here running this garrison and not with the main host. I figure I can turn you in any time, but I thought I'd first give you a chance to make me a better offer. I don't know, Eric said, holding his wine cup to his lips with his left hand, while his right moved to the hilt of his sword. Look, Von Darkmoor, I'll stick with you until the end, if the pay's right. Now, why don't you talk this over with Captain Callis? Suddenly, a figure loomed up behind the war in the darkness, and large hands reached around and gripped him by the shoulders. They jerked him around, and as he spun, they grabbed the back of his head and his chin and forced it in the opposite direction, and with a loud crack, his neck was broken. Eric had his sword out as Bigo stepped forward. We found a spy, he whispered. How could you be sure? hissed Eric, his heart pounding as he returned his sword to the scabbard. I'm pretty sure no one's called you Von Darkmoor since we met up with this lot. But I damn well know no man's called the captain by name since then. Eric nodded. Strict orders had been passed not to mention Callus by name. How would he know who you were? Eric's heart sank. I didn't even notice. Vigo grinned in the faint light. I won't tell. He picked up the war's body and hoisted it across his shoulder. What are we going to do with him? asked Eric. Why, we're going to take him back to the camp. It wouldn't be the first drunk carried out of here by his friends, I'm certain. Eric nodded, picked up the fallen wine cups and bottles, and motioned for Vigo to leave. Eric set the cups and empty bottle down next to the door and hurried after the large man. For a tense moment, Eric expected a challenge at the gate, but as Vigo had predicted, the guards thought nothing of one drunk cheerfully carrying another back to the camp. They rode out at first light. Eric had told the Longville and Callus of the encounter with the war. They had disposed of the body down in a wash, not too far from their campsite, making sure it was fully hidden by rocks. There had been a brief discussion after that, and Callus had said whatever they chose to do, they'd do it far from the Sa'our and the other mercenaries. The only attention they received as they got ready to depart was one Sa'our warrior who came down to ask what they were doing. The Longville merely repeated they had been ordered to rejoin the host, and the warrior grunted and returned to the fortress. As Callus had suggested, this fortress was as much for keeping deserters from heading south as it was to keep the main army's flanks free from attack. At noon, while the men rested and ate trail rations, Callus told Eric to get five of the men from Nahoot's company and bring them over to where he waited with DeLongville. 
When they appeared, Calla said, One of your companions, the war, got into a fight last night over a whore. Got his neck broken. I don't want to see any repeat of that stupidity. All five men looked baffled, but nodded and left. Another group of five was brought up to Callus, then another. At last the final four men were fetched to Callus, and he repeated the admonishment. Three of the men looked blank, but one of them tensed at news of the war's death, and instantly Callus had his dagger out of the man's throat. The Longville said, Take them away, to Eric, as he and Callus, with Greylock, led the man away to be questioned. As Eric escorted the two men back down the line, several of the men asked what was going on. Eric said, We caught another spy. A moment later a scream cut to the air from behind a small rise some distance away. Eric looked over while the scream lingered, and when it ceased he let out his breath. Then it started up again, and Eric found every man looking off at the ridge. A few minutes later De Longville, Callas, and Greylock returned, all with grim expressions. De Longville looked around and quietly said, Get them mounted, Eric. We have a lot of ground to cover and little time to do it. Eric turned. You heard the sergeant. Mount up. Men scrambled, and Eric found the sudden motion of release. The sound of the spy dying under torture had set his nerves on edge and made him angry. The sudden movement seemed to lift that anger from him, or at least to give him a place to focus it. Soon the column was moving, heading toward the main army of the Sa'ar and the assault on the Harka. 23. Onslaught. Eric blinked. Acrid smoke filled the air for miles, making it difficult to see any distance. Stinging wind carried the smell of charred wood and other less aromatic victims of the widespread fires. Nacor rode back to where Eric brought up the rear. That very bad, he commented. Eric said, I haven't seen a lot that wasn't bad in the last week. They had been traveling for more than four weeks, heading across the plain toward the host surrounding Maharta. As they approached the site of battle, the area began to teem with all manner of passers-by, patrols from the invading host, small companies of mercenaries who had decided to quit the city rather than fight. They tended to give Callus's company a wide berth, though two had chanced to parley. When it was clear that Callus wasn't interested in a fight, both companies had agreed to share a camp and news. The news was sobering. The Nada had fallen by treachery. No one was certain how, but someone had managed to convince the priest king to send his host north, leaving the city under the care of only a small company. The leader of that company had proved to be an agent for the Emerald Queen, and he had opened the gates of the city to a host of Sa'awa riding in from the southwest. The population had gone to sleep one night after a grand parade. The priest king's war elephants, with their razor-capped tusks and iron spikes ringing their legs, had lumbered out the gate, the uh, howdahs on their backs filled with archers ready to rain death down on the invaders. At their side had marched the royal immortals, the Raj of Maharta's private army of drug-induced maniacs, each man capable of feats of strength and bravery no sane man could achieve. The immortals had been promised great glory and a better life when reborn, if they died in the service of the Raj. The next morning the city was in the hands of the Sa'awa, and the populace awoke to the sounds of wailing as the invaders turned each household out, herding everyone to the last man, woman, and child to the central plaza, to hear the priest king. He had been marched out under guard, and had informed the citizenry that they were now subject to the rule of the Emerald Queen. He and his cadre of priests were taken back into the palace, and never heard from again. The host of Lunara, that had been sent north to face an army already behind them, returned under orders from the priest king's general of the army, who handed over command to General Fadawa, and joined his lord in the palace. Rumors flew through the city, ranging from the priest king, his ministers and generals being quickly executed, to them being eaten by the Sa'awa. One thing was clear, this conquest was coming to a head. With Lenada's downfall and near certainty, General Fadawa had held back a token force at his position north of the city, and sent the entire bulk of the host in a circling move around Lenada and down the far side of the river to Maharta. They had moved out only days after Callus's company had deserted. The benefit to the Queen's army had been a swift strike south with almost no opposition. The detriment had been finding themselves on the wrong side of the river. Now the northern element from Lenata was moving down the main road between the two cities, while engineers were throwing temporary bridges across the river some miles north of the mouth. Eric looked at the blackened landscape. Some locals had fired the dry winter grass to avoid being captured by the Sa'awa, he judged, for the brush fires had been started in several places. Only a cold rain had prevented a major conflagration on the plain. Eric reflected on the cold weather and realized it was after midsummer back home. By the time they left Maharta, if they left Maharta, it would be nearly a year since he had fled Darkmoor. 
One benefit to Callus's company from the swift mobilization of Fadawa's host southward was that most of the invading army was in the grip of turmoil and confusion. Moving closer to the front was surprisingly easy. A day earlier, an officer had tried to demand passes from Callus, who had said simply, Nobody gave us anything on paper. We were told to move to the front. The officer had been totally baffled and simply waved them past the checkpoint. Now they were at the crest of a rise overlooking the river valley below, where the Vedra emptied into the blue sea. Eric squinted at the scene below. Maharta was a city of white stone and plaster, bright in the summer sun, now reduced to grey by weeks of falling ash. It spread across two main islands, while several suburbs had arisen on smaller islands in the delta. The main city was surrounded by a high wall on the northwest, north, and northeast, while the remaining sections were flanked by river, harbor, or sea. Several estuaries and inlets provided a variety of anchorages in the deep channel of the river, as well as along the coast. Sprinkled across numerous islands were villages, and on the western shore of the river, a large suburb with its own wall. Nacor peered at the distant city. Things move close to a finish. How can you tell? asked Eric. Nacor shrugged. See the garrison on this side? Eric shook his head. No, there's too much smoke. Nacor pointed. Look, there, at the river and sea, where they join in the delta. There were many bridges there. You can see blackened foundations where they were burned, and some villages on the smaller islands, but there, on this shore, there's a good-sized town with its own wall. Eric squinted against the smoke and fading sunlight, and saw a spot of light gray against the darker water. Studying it, he thought it might be a walled town, but he couldn't be certain. I think I see it. That is the western precinct of Mahata. It is still holding. Eric said, Your eyes must be as sharp as the captain's. Maybe, but I think it's that I know what to look for. What are we going to do? asked Eric. I don't know, said Nacor. I think Callus knows, but then maybe he doesn't. I do know that we need to be over there. He pointed to the far side of the river. Eric looked at the massive host marshaled along the river bank and said, That seems to be everyone's problem, Nacor. What? Thing over there? Eric pointed northward and said, They say there are bridges being built ten miles north of here. If so, why is everyone marshaled down here near the coast? They can't be thinking of swimming across, can they? Difficult swim, Nacor admitted. Doubt that's what they're going to do, but I expect they have a plan. A plan, Eric said, shaking his head dubiously as he remembered what Greylock had told him about battle plans and the realities of war. He sighed. All we have to do is go through this army, cross the river, and get the defenders to open the gate for us. There's always a way, said the little man with a grin. Eric again shook his head in uncertainty as the order to move down into the awaiting host was given, and suddenly he felt very much like a mouse invading a cat's lair. If the outlying fringes of the host were confused, the heart of the army was strictly under control. Callus noticed several heavily manned checkpoints and veered away from them, and twice had to improvise explanations for provo officers running patrol. He claimed to be confused about which campsite he needed to locate, and said he was among those who were going to be first across. Both times the officers assumed that no one would be lying to be the first to cross the river, so in both cases they merely waved Callus along. But as they skirted around the central position of the army, they got some sense of how things lay. A large hill was central to the host, with the Queen's pavilion atop it. Around that tent were the officers' tents and rank upon rank of Sa'our guard, with Pantathian combat troops arrayed behind them. Then came a series of tents used by Pantathian priests. The air was so thick with their magic it reeked, claimed Nacor. Then the bulk of the army radiated outward like spokes of a wheel. The Longville said, it's a pity there's not another army lurking about in the grass nearby. These lads are so bound to conquer, there's nothing remotely defensive about this place. Eric knew little of Warcraft, but after months of working hard to create defensible encampments, even he could see this. There were major flaws in the disposition of this army. They must be planning on launching the attack soon, he observed. Why do you say that? asked Callus. Greylark, what's that word you told me for supp supply? Logistics. That's the one. The logistics are all wrong. Look at where they've got their horses. Each company has them picketed nearby, but there's no easy way to get water to them from the river. This is going to be a mess in a day or two. Callus nodded, but said nothing as he looked around. The Longville said, You're right. This host can't stay here another week without a major blow-up. 
If the men are going to get sick, start fighting, or run out of food and have to eat their horses. They can't stay here much longer. Calla said, There, as he pointed. Eric looked to see a narrow peninsula of sandy ground near the river's edge, sheltered by tall grasses. They rode down a long incline, through some rocky gullies carved out by rain, and down to a sandy stretch, then back up a small rise, and at last reached the indicated area. Eric jumped from his horse and knelt near the water's edge. He cupped some in his hand and found it brackish and salty. I can't drink this. I know, said Callus. Form a team and haul water down from upriver to give the horses something to drink. Looking around, as the sun began to set, he said, We're not staying here very long. Camp was quickly made, and Eric saw to it that the eighteen remaining men from the Hoots Company were always under surveillance. They were not certain exactly what had happened to the war and the other man, but they knew it had been fatal, and it was clear they didn't wish to meet a similar fate. De Longville had remarked there might be another agent among them, but if there was, Eric was forced to concede he was far more clever at disguising his nature, for not one of those men tried anything suspicious. Still, Eric billeted them closest to the river, with his own men and the horses on one side of them and the river on the other. Rue came and found Eric as he was checking to see the horses were fit. Captain wants you over there, he pointed to where Callus stood with the Longville, Maycor, Greylock, and Hatonis. Reaching the mound on which they stood, Eric heard Nacor saying, Three times. I think there is something strange here. Calla said, That's a well-defended position. No, interrupted Nacor. Look closely. The walls are good, yes, but there is no way to bring in reinforcements. Yet the man said they were facing fresh soldiers every time they assaulted the walls. Three times in one day. The Longville said, Camp gossip. Maybe, said Nacor. Maybe not. If true, then there is a way from that place, he pointed toward the small western precinct of the city on this side of the river, to over there. He then pointed to the distant lights of Maharta. It might be why they tried so hard to take it last week. If not for the way in, why not leave it and let them starve? The Longville scratched his chin. Maybe they don't want trouble at their back. Bah, said Nacor. Does this army look like it's worried about trouble? This army is trouble. Trouble soon if they don't get across that river. Soon there'll be no food. Bad. He turned to Eric. What was that word? Logistics. Bad logistics. Baggage train all strung out from here up to Lanada. Men pissing into the river upstream, and soon men downriver got belly flux and bad runs. Horse dung everywhere up to your knees. Men don't get food. Men fight. It's simple. They take this precinct. He made a diving motion and take tunnel under river, then up into city. There was that tunnel under the Serpent River before, conceded Callus. Hatona said, But there's lots of bedrock under the city of the Serpent River. Our clans dug those tunnels over a period of two hundred years because of the storms of summer, the monsoons. You can't safely cross the bridges when the seas are high and the wind is that strong. They get big storms here in the Hata? asked Nacor. Yes, admitted the clansmen. But I don't know what the ground around here is like. Doesn't matter, said Nacor. A good builder, he'll find a way. Certainly a dwarf would know a way, said Greylock. Callus showed a small flash of irritation. Whatever. We take a risk of getting killed no matter what we do. That's not the point. It's wasteful getting killed to get into a city that has no way out. And we don't know there is a way out of the western precinct. We know that across the river is Mahata, and we don't know if there's a tunnel on this side. What if I go and find one? said Nacor. Callus shook his head. I don't have any idea how you plan on getting in there, but the answer is no. I want every man ready to move out at midnight. Word's been passed. There's some sort of celebration on tonight. The Pantathians and Sa'au are making some sort of battle magic. Then tomorrow the northern elements are supposed to hit the city. Nacor scratched his head. There are some men building bridges north of the main camp, but they are not finished. Why this? And what tricks do the serpent men have to get this army across that river? They've been conjuring something all day long. I don't know, answered Callus. But I plan on every man being on the other side when the sun's up. He turned to Eric. That's your job. Those men from the Hoots Company. Suddenly Eric's stomach tightened. He knew what Callus was about to say. Yes? Put them around the horses and give them this to drink. He handed Eric a large wine skin that sloshed. Nacor's dosed it so they'll be unconscious for a while. Eric felt himself grin as he took the skin. For a minute, if Nacor hadn't given me this drug, I would have told you to kill them. Callus finished. Now see to it. 
Eric turned away, again chilled, and for a reason he couldn't put any name to, feeling shame. The camp rang with alien sounds, music from distant lands, screams of joy and pain, and laughter, swearing, and most of all, drums. So our warriors pounded on large wooden drums stretched with hide. The sound echoed across the river like thunder and rang in the ears like the blood's own pulse. Bloody rites had concluded, and now warriors readied themselves for the morning's battle. Horns blared and bells rang, and on and on pounded the drums. Atonis and his men stood near the horses, and Eric quickly saw that all eighteen of Nahut's men were unconscious. He knew that, had any avoided the drug's effect, he was to kill them. Eric returned to Callas and reported, All eighteen are truly asleep. Praji said, If they can sleep through that racket, they are indeed senseless men. Callas stuck out his hand. Goodbye, old friends. First Praji, then Vaja, then Hatonis took it and shook. They and the eight remaining men from their companies would make their way up the river, trying to position themselves to get across the river over one of the northern bridges, while the main band attacked. In the confusion of battle, they were going to try to slip away and head east, making for the city of the Serpent River. Whatever occurred in the coming days, eventually the city of the Serpent River would have to face the Emerald Queen's might. Atonus would ready the clans. Once they had been nomads like their cousins, the Jashandi, and if need be, they would roam the hills near the city again, striking at the host and fleeing into the high forests. For Hatonis knew that this struggle would be settled far from his native city, and more than mere strength of arms was needed. The night was dark as swift clouds from the ocean blew into the shore, keeping the moon's light masked. Only those of especially good vision might notice someone moving along the river's edge from any distance away. Nacor sniffed the air. Rain coming, I think. Tomorrow, almost certainly. Callus motioned, and Eric turned and signaled the first company into the water. The plan was simple. Swim across the swift, running but shallow delta to one of the tiny islands near the city wall, and look for a way to climb the southern breakwater and slip along atop it into the greater harbor. They would still strike for the southernmost quarter of the harbor, the shipbuilder's estuary. That small firth fed off the main river and joined with the larger harbor to form a natural launch point for ships. Callus had complete intelligence from agents who had been on this continent for years, but he knew little about the harbor beyond that. It had never occurred to anyone else that the Emerald Queen might need a navy, until Rue brought it up. After the burning of the shipbuilding facilities, the plan was still simple. Steal a boat and sail up the coast to the city of the Serpent River. Eric thought not for the first time that simple didn't mean easy. The water was chilly, but Eric quickly got used to it. The men had wrapped their swords, shields, and armor for quiet, and some of the men had abandoned their heavier arms so as to be able to swim better. The path taken brought them perilously close to both a picket of the Emerald Queen's host and lookouts in the suburb fortification. Torches on the walls showed clearly that the ruckus from the Queen's camp had alerted the garrison that something was up. Eric hoped they were all watching the lights on the top of the hill and not the rocky shore below their walls. Every man in the company was a competent swimmer. Those that hadn't had the knack had been trained at the camp outside of Condor. But when they reached the distant spot that marked their first meeting point, a small sandy island in the mouth of the river, three men were missing. A quick head count showed thirty-two men on that island, exposed to view save for some tall grass and one lone tree. Kala signaled back into the water, and Eric waited until everyone else was in before taking one look around for the three missing men. Then he followed after the others. The channel deepened, and the current got stronger as they neared the city, and the water tasted saltier. A cough, sputter, and splash nearby were followed by a choking sound, and Eric knew someone else was in trouble. He swam toward the sound of splashing in the darkness, but as he reached the spot, only silence met him. He glanced around in the gloom, then listened, and finally started swimming toward the distant shore. Suddenly he skinned his knee, and found he was clambering across an underwater islet. Then he was suddenly sucked downward and pulled back into a deeper, swifter current, and struggling to keep his head above water. His armor weighed him down, and Eric had to will himself to keep his head above water. He had trained for hours to swim with the sword and shield on his back, but nothing in training had prepared him for this nightmare of laboring through a wet, inky darkness. His chest burned, and his arms felt leaden, and he had to force himself to move forward, lift one arm and throw it forward, and kick, lift the other and kick. He moved forward with no idea how far he had come and how far he had left to go. Then he heard a change in the sound before him and realized it was water lapping against rocks. More, he heard men quietly coughing, cursing, and blowing water from their noses. He lashed out with his last vestige of strength and hit a rock face first. Red light exploded behind Eric's eyes, then collapsed into a ball that receded away from him in a tunnel of inky blackness.
Eric choked, spewed water from his mouth and nose, then vomited. He turned over and struck his head against the large rock. Rue's voice sounded in his ear. Don't! You'll knock your wits out of your silly head again. Lie still. Eric hurt. His body felt like one large cramp, and he had never felt so foul in his life. You drank a lot of ocean, said Vigo nearby. If I hadn't been standing on the rock you swam into, I don't know if we'd have found you to pull you out. Thanks, said Eric weakly. His ears rang, and his face ached, and his nose hurt, and generally he wasn't certain he was glad to be alive. Callus came and said, Can you move? Eric stood wobbly and said, Of course. As much as he might like to sit for a while, he knew that the alternative to moving was being left behind. Eric looked around, then his eyes narrowed, and he counted. Thirteen men stood on the rocks. Looking at faces, he turned to Bigo and said, Luis? Out there, said Bigo, with an inclination of his head toward the river. Sweet gods, said Eric. Thirty-two men had gone into the river, and only thirteen had made it across. Show P was nearby, and he said, Perhaps some of them are washed up at different places on the shore. Eric nodded, but he knew it was more likely they were swept out to sea or drowned in the river. Eric saw they were out on the tip of the southern harbor breakwater, a long finger of rocks built up to prevent tidal flow interfering with shipping in the harbor. Callus motioned, and each man fell into line. They moved carefully along the heavy rocks, piled high to form the breakwater. In the darkness, the footing was dangerous. After about a half hour of moving slowly, they reached a flat road formed across the top of the stones. Nacor whispered, They must pack dirt on it, so they can bring more rocks out in wagons if they need to repair the breakwater after a storm. Callus nodded and motioned for silence. He pointed to a tiny light in the distance. There was a small building located a few hundred yards ahead where the stone breakwater turned into a proper jetty. It was certain to be defended. Glancing toward the harbor mouth, Eric felt his stomach contract. Captain, he whispered. I've seen, came the answer. Eric looked back and saw the others had followed his gaze and were now looking at the harbor. Three ships had been sunk in the harbor mouth to ensure no raiders from the invading fleet could enter the harbor, and nestled like chicks against a mother hen, a flotilla of ships hugged the docks. But none of them looked to be of shallow enough draft to get past the hulks blocking the harbor. The pair of guards in the watch building were vigilantly watching across the river, so they were taken without knowing that Callus had slipped up behind. Using only his hands, Callus quickly disabled both men and lowered them to the floor of the hut. Motioning for the men to gather around, Callus said, The orders are simple. We wait until the sounds of battle in the morning. The Emerald Queen may try to slip some small boats around the jetty, so there may be a few defenders heading this way, but most of the city's army will be on the northern walls, protecting the landward side of the city. Then we move straight up this jetty, head off left toward the shipbuilder's estuary, and fire everything in sight. If anyone tries to stop you, kill him. Then we head back to the main docks, steal a boat of a shallow draft as we can find, and try to get out of this mess. If you can't get back to the harbor, try to get out of the city on the northeastern side and make overland to the city of the Serpent River. He glanced from face to face. It's every man for himself, lads. No one is to linger for a comrade. If no one gets back to Crondor, then this has all been for naught. If most of us are going to die, let's make it worth something. Grim nods of agreement were the only reply he received. The men took what shelter they could around the small hut and waited. Eric shivered. He dozed, but the throbbing in his head made sleep impossible. He couldn't believe how tired he felt, and the throbbing in his nose drained him like no pain he had known before. It's broken, said Rue. What? said Eric, turning and discovering his friend could be seen in the pre-dawn gloom. Your nose. It's a mess. Want me to reset it? Eric knew he should say no, but he simply nodded. Rue had been through enough street fights to know what he was doing. Who put his hands on either side of Eric's nose and, with a swift move, pushed the pieces into place. The pain shot through Eric's head like hot iron spikes. His eyes watered and he thought he would faint. Then suddenly the pain drained away. The throbbing that had bothered him all night lessened, and he felt as if his face might not fall off after all. Thanks, he said, wiping away tears. A loud roar precluded any reply. It was as if the skies parted and a thousand dragons vented their rage. There came a hollow rush of sound like creation's largest waterfall echoing through a gorge, and a wind sprang up from the far shore. Oh, my, said Nacor. This is some trick. Across the river, a giant light of brilliant white, edged in pale green, sprang up and arched across the river, slowly spreading and fanning out as it climbed into the sky. Men and Sa'awa riders moved tentatively upon it, then kicked their balky mounts forward. The horses moved slowly, following the rising bridge of light. Nacor said, now we know why they massed near the mouth of the river across from Aharta. Why no bridges? 
They're using the priest's spells to get the army across. Carter said, we leave now. He rose and moved down the jetty. They reached the main dock area without incident, ignored by those on the dock who were transfixed by the sight of the rising bridge in the sky across the river. Eric forced himself to pay attention to his leader and pushed more than one man after Callus. They ran through a series of narrow streets along a thin neck of land between bodies of water. Eric had no sense of where he was, but he thought he might find his way back the way they had come. Then they were moving left, down a major boulevard. A company of horsemen dashed past, dressed in white tunics and trousers, with red turbans and black vests. Another man, similarly dressed, reined in next to Callus a moment later and shouted, Where are you going? We have our orders, Callus shouted back. The estuary is at risk. The man seemed confused by the answer, but the incredible sight of a bridge of light rising across the river unnerved him enough that he accepted Callus's story and rode on. They reached another street, which crossed the top of the one they were on, and Eric halted. Ahead was a dry dock. It loomed high into the sky, and upon it was the keel of a great ship pulled up for hole scraping. The wooden frame stretched back for what Eric judged a full four hundred feet, and the rear of the ship protruded out beyond that. He looked beyond it and saw the estuary, a mighty lake adjacent to the main harbor. The estuary was ringed by construction yards like this, forming a nearly perfect three-quarter circle around it. Either end was more than a quarter mile off. The Longville said, Take some men and go that way. He pointed off to the right. Go to the far end and start burning everything in sight as you come back. Try to get back to the harbor. But remember, it's every man for himself. At the last, he reached out and put his hand on Eric's arm and squeezed briefly. Then he was off, running to the left. Eric said, You three, indicating Rue, Chopi, and Nacor, the men nearest him. Come with me. As he ran, his head thundered, and he tried to ignore the pain. His knees were wobbly, but his heart pounded and his nerves were taut, and after a few moments he felt his head clear a bit. Riders came speeding past, heading back the way Eric's men had come. He barely got out of the way of one man who seemed willing to ride him down rather than control his horse. The expression on the guard's face told Eric this was no movement of soldiers under order, but men put to flight by terror. Glancing skyward, Eric couldn't blame the men. The bridge now reached a quarter of the way across the river, and upon it stood thousands of Sa'awa, their battle cries carrying across the distance like a thunder peal without end. Eric rounded a bend and saw two shipyards beyond where he stood. To show P, the nearest man, he said, Get down there and fire everything. Nacor, help him. Eric grabbed Rue and moved to the hut before another gigantic cradle of wood. This one was empty. The door to the building was barred. He quickly made his way around it and found a single window. Looking in, he saw no signs of habitation. Using his shield, Eric smashed the window and said, Now put your size to good use. He boosted his small friend through the window. Rue hurried and opened the door, and Eric said, Anything to burn? Some parchment and a torch. Got any flint? Eric reached into his belt pouch and pulled out some flint. Rue took it and his dagger and stuck a spark on the torch, then nursed a small fire into life. When it was burning, he pushed it down into the pile of parchment until it caught. Then they hurried out of the hut. Eric led Rue down to the base of the cradle and saw a pile of old wood scraps. He gathered them by the base and had Rue set them alight. They burned slowly with dark smoke, but at last a good-sized fire was started. Eric glanced around and saw a little smoke from the far end of the estuary, but no sign of any major fires. He motioned to Rue to come along, and they made their way to the next establishment, and found it guarded by a shipbuilder and his family. Three men of middle years, as well as four sons in their teens, stood ready to fight. They were armed with hammers and pry bars. Stand aside, said Eric. What do you mean to do? demanded the oldest man there. I hate saying this to any master of craft, but I'm putting the torch to your shop. That cradle and your tools go as well. The man's eyes narrowed, and he said, Over my cold body. Eric said, look, I do not want to fight you, but no one is going to build ships for the Emerald Queen. Do you understand? Man, it's all I have, said the builder. Eric pointed with the sword to the distant bridge of white and green, moving slowly toward them, and said, they will take all you have. They will rape your women and kill you, or make you slaves and force you to build ships for them, and they will sail them to my home and kill me and mine. What would you have us do? The builder demanded, as much a plea as a challenge. Take a boat and sail away, friend, said Eric. Get your sons and daughters and get away while you still have time. Go to the city of the Serpent River and hold there as long as you can, but if you don't leave now, I will kill you if I must. Bigo and two other men came running up behind Eric, and the sight of five armed men proved too much for the shipbuilder. He nodded and said, We need an hour. Eric shook his head. I can give you five minutes, then I start burning. He saw a small sailing boat anchored in the estuary. Is that yours? No, it's my neighbor's. Then steal it and go. Eric motioned for the men to spread out, and as Bigo passed, one of the sons shouted, no, father, I'll not let them burn our home. Before Big Oak could turn, the young man struck him from behind with a pry bar, bringing it straight across the large man's neck. Eric cried, no, but was too late. The loud crack told him Big O's neck had been broken. Rue charged the young man, bashing him in the face with a shield, knocking him backwards into his brothers and uncles. 
The young man lost the pry bar, which clattered away across the stones, and Eric looked down at the motionless form of Vigo. The shipwright and his family stood motionless as Rue stood over the boy, his sword poised to end his life. Eric stepped over and grabbed his friend, pulling him away. Why? he demanded, as he leaned over the now terrorized youth. Grabbing him by the tunic, he lifted him by main force with one arm until he was nose to nose with him. Tell me why, he screamed into his face. The boy's face contorted with terror. Then Eric heard a woman's voice say, Don't hurt him. Eric turned and saw a woman who stood with tears streaming down her face. He's my only son. Eric shouted, He killed my friend. Why shouldn't I kill him now? He's all I have, said the woman. Eric felt the anger drain away. He pushed the boy toward his mother and said, Go. The boy took a half step, then Eric screamed, Now! Turning to Rue, he said, Burn it all! Rue carried a torch and hurried into the home of the family, who stood watching helplessly. Eric said, Get to that boat and sail away, otherwise you will all die! The father nodded and led his band away, and Eric knelt by Bigo. Rolling the big man over, he saw his eyes wide. Suddenly he heard laughter and turned to find Nacor standing behind. He looks surprised. Eric suddenly heard himself laugh, for it was true. No anger or pain, but amazement was etched on the face of the big man. Eric stood. I wonder if the goddess of death is everything Big O expected her to be. Then he turned and saw Rue emerging from the building, smoke coming through the door after him. Come on, Eric said. We're almost out of time. Rue looked across the distant river and saw the bridge was now arching upward toward the midpoint of the river. Sounds of battle, screams, and the clash of arms rang from the north, and Eric knew the wall was likely breached or would be soon, as the defenders ran in terror from the magic of the Emerald Queen and her army. From the far end of the estuary, clouds of smoke rose, heralding the work done by Callus and his company. Chopi and two other men raced to the next building and set it ablaze, while Eric and Rue went down a series of stone steps to a low assembly point, a series of wooden sheds on a rocky point. These they quickly started burning. Nacor hurried ahead. Reaching the quayside, they discovered the fire had spread to the other side of the street and was growing in strength. Eric ran along until he came to the next construction site and started setting fires. As he moved back toward the main street, Eric noticed a flood of people running along, many carrying bundles, and he knew the enemy was somewhere inside the city. Rue tugged on Eric's sleeve and he said, What? Rue pointed and said, It's the captain. Through the gathering press of men and women, Eric caught sight of Callus, Snakor, and the Longville. Then they were swallowed up by the crowd. Head for the harbor, Eric called out in case any other of his band was nearby. He and Rue made their way as best they could, Eric using his bulk and strength to push through the throng. Rue staying close behind him. He lost sight of the others. Down a side street, they overtook the Longville. Where's the captain? shouted Eric. Somewhere ahead up there. Eric noticed the Longville had picked up a cut to his arm and had hastily wrapped it. You all right? The Longville said, I'll leave for the next few minutes. Where's everyone going? shouted Rue. Same place we are, entered the Longville. The docks. The city's about to fall, and everyone is going to be looking for a boat. We've just got to get one before anyone else. Rue glanced over his shoulder. At least we got the shipyards ablaze, the Longville said. At least we did that. Then it started to rain. 24. Escape. Eric turned. The fires! What do you expect us to do? The sergeant asked as increasing numbers of people swarmed by him. Suddenly Callus appeared, forcing his way back to where the two of them stood. Then Nacor and Chopi were at his side. We have to go back, shouted the little man. What can we do? demanded the Longville. We have to keep the fires burning, said Nacor. As if to taunt them, the rain increased in urgency, turning from a light sprinkle to a more insistent tattoo. If we get them hot enough, only the worst storm will put them out. Callus nodded. They started moving toward the fires, and Eric looked around for Rue. In the faint hope he could be heard over the din, Eric shouted in the king's tongue, Back to the estuary! Back to the fires! Whatever else might be taking place in the city, there was a full-scale riot brewing near the waterfront. Soldiers sent to keep order were joining in the general run for the ships. That the harbor mouth was now jammed by the hulks, and only shallow draft boats could manage to slip out, seemed to be of no concern to the citizenry of Maharta. Ships' crews tried their best to fend off citizens seeking a haven, and several captains raised sail to put some distance between the docks and their craft. A half-dozen horsemen rode furiously down the street, and men and women screamed as they attempted to get out of the way. Eric shouted, Get the horses! And as the lead animal shied at the press of humanity before it, Eric leaped and took a hold on the arm of the rider, catching him off guard. Eric found surprising strength as he yanked the man from his saddle, given how beat up he felt. With one crushing blow, he knocked the man unconscious, throwing him to the ground. 
It was probably a death sentence as the crowd would trample the man, but Eric had no sympathy for someone who would ride down women and children to make good his own escape. The horse's eyes were white with fear and its nostrils flared. It tried to back up and felt the horse behind, and without hesitation it kicked out. The flying hooves caught an innocent trader carrying his last half-dozen jars of valuable unguents, sending them flying through the air to smash on the stones as the stout man was knocked almost senseless. Eric spared a moment to grab the man and haul him to his feet with one hand while gripping hard on the horse's reins with the other. He shouted at the merchant, Stay on your feet, man! If you fall, you die! The man nodded, and Eric let him go, having no more time to spend. He mounted and saw that Callus and the others had followed his example, save for Nacor, who was being attacked by the one remaining rider. Eric kicked hard at the flank of his animal, and the frightened gelding leaped forward. Eric's sure hands guided him through the press to where Nacor struggled to avoid being skewered by a scimitar. Eric took out his own blade, and with a single roundhouse blow, took the rider out of his saddle. Nacor sprang to the now empty saddle and said, Thank you. I grabbed the reins before I thought of how I was to get him to give up his horse. Eric urged his animal past Nacor's and took off up the street after Callus and Delongville. The two remaining riders seemed content to let them keep the horses as long as they were allowed to keep their own, and did not try to interfere with their passing. The bulk of the horses parted the swarming mob that would have swept away men on foot. Once they were back on the street leading to the fires, the crowd thinned out. The rain was steady, and as they rounded the corner alongside the estuary, they saw the fires were beginning to abate. Eric kept as close to the flames as possible, as there he had the least trouble passing the throng running through the street. The horse continued to shy from the flames, but Eric's firm seat in short range kept the animal under control. At the end of the estuary, where the first fire was set, the large ship's cradle and hull were almost completely intact, save for some scorching, and the once brisk fire was now guttering. Eric saw an abandoned house across the street and rode there. Leaping from the saddle, he swatted the horse on the rump, sending it away. Running inside the house, Eric found furnishings turned every which way. Looters, perhaps, thought Eric, or a family desperate to clear out their few valuables before the fire reached them. He grabbed a chair and ran across the broad street to the top of the jetty that overlooked the fire and tossed the wooden chair into the flames below. He made several quick trips across the rainy street, and every loose piece of furniture made its way into the fire. As Nacor predicted, once reaching a certain heat, the fire grew despite the rain, which seemed to be leveling off at a steady drizzle rather than a serious downpour. In the next house, Eric found more loose flammables and threw them into the growing fire. At last he felt certain the cradle and hull would stay alight, but as he looked down the quayside his heart sank. His was the only fire burning strongly enough to withstand the rain, and there was only so much one man could do. He hurried to the next fire, which was almost extinguished, and found a store across the street. The large wooden doors had been forced open, one hanging from a single hinge while the other lay on the street. Eric picked up the one door and carried it to the edge of the street overlooking the shipyard below. He tossed the wooden door as far as he could, and it sailed it down to land on the edge of the sputtering flames. If anything, it banked the fire even more. Eric swore as he hurried back to the shop. The front of the store was almost intact. Whoever had pried open the doors had taken one look and run off. The store was a chandlery, with nothing of value to a looter. Eric hurried through, and in the rear he found yards of sail. More, he found ceiling pitch in barrels. He quickly rolled one out through the ruined storefront and across the street. There he picked up the barrel. He threw it so it landed squarely on the flames. The barrel struck with a satisfying crack, and quickly the pitch began to burn. Eric took a step away, and then a fountain of flame sprang skyward. Nacor ran up and said, What did you find? That was a good whoosh. Pitch, answered Eric. Inside. He turned, and the little man followed after. Nacor scurried around, looking at everything he could find. He came away with several smaller kegs and put them aside out front, then hurried inside. A moment later he came out, stooped over, pushing a barrel as Eric was returning from putting a second barrel on the flame. Eric paused and turned to look at the western sky. The bridge of light was nearing the apex of its arc, the Sa'our and mercenaries at the leading edge standing hundreds of feet above the water. Nacor said, Wish I had a trick, boy. If I could make that thing vanish, he snapped his fingers. That would be something, watching them all fall into the river. Eric got another barrel, and side by side they rolled them down the cobbles toward the third builder's yard. Why doesn't some magician around here think of that? he asked, nearly panting from the exertion. Battle magic is difficult, said Nacor as he pushed the barrel along. Magician has a trick. Another magician counters the trick. Third magician counters the second. Fourth magician tries to help the second. They're all standing around trying to best one another, and the army comes along and chops them up. Very dangerous, and not many magicians willing to try. Surprise is the thing. He paused as he reached the ramp leading down to the lower landing where the main building of the shipyard was ablaze, and let the barrel roll away with a guiding kick. That trick there would be very easy to counter if you gave a powerful magician the time to study it. Lots of Phantathians working together on that bridge. Lots of serpent priests concentrating together. Very difficult. Easy to disrupt. 
like unraveling a bag. You pull the right thread at the seam, and it all falls apart. Eric looked at him expectantly. Nacor grinned. I don't know how, but Pug of Stardock, or maybe some Tsarani great ones, could do it. Eric closed his eyes a moment, then said, Well, if they're not going to show up to help, I guess we have to do it ourselves. Come on. As they ran back toward the Chandlers, Nacor continued, But if Pug or some other powerful magician was to try, the Emerald Queen has even more magicians ready to burn him to a cinder if he... He stopped. I have an idea. Eric halted, gasping for breath. What? You go find the others. Tell them to steal a boat here in the estuary. Don't wait. Leave now. Get out of the harbor fast. I'll take care of the fires. Eric said, Nacor, how? Tell you later. You gave me great idea. Now go. Leave soon. The little man hurried back toward the Chandlers, and Eric took a deep breath and turned. He willed his exhausted body into one more run and set off to look for Callus and the others. At the far end of the estuary, Eric found Callus, the Longville, and Chopee working hard at stoking a fire. Two dead guardsmen nearby told him someone had objected. The rain increased in tempo, and Eric found himself soaked to the skin as he reached Callus. Nacor says to get a boat and leave now. Callus said, There's too much left here intact. He said to tell you he'd take care of it. He's thought up a great trick. Instantly, Callus dropped a long board he was about to toss on a sputtering bonfire and said, Did you see any boats? Eric shook his head. But I wasn't looking for any. They hurried back up the road until they came to the first stone stairway leading down to a lower section of the docks, where some small fire still smoldered. The rain was starting to fall in earnest, a drenching downpour that obscured the mystic arch that now hung more than half the way between the opposite bank and the city. Peering through the rain, Eric said, there's something out there, he pointed. Callus said, it's capsized. They moved along the edge of the estuary and more than once thought they had seen something only to find an overturned hull or smashed bow. Then Chopee said, there, moored to a buoy. Callus tossed aside his weapons and dove in. Eric took a breath and leaped after him. He followed his captain by the sound of splashing more than anything else. Each stroke threatened to be his last as fatigue and cold seemed to leach what little strength Eric had left. But then he came alongside the craft. It was a fishing smack, with a deep center compartment half filled with brine to keep the fish fresh. The single mast lay along the port gunnel, lashed in place. Any small boat sailors? asked Callus. Half falling as he pulled himself inside the boat, Eric said, Just what I learned on the revenge. I'm from the mountains, remember? The longville peered inside the sail locker. No sails anyway. He reached down along the gunnel of the boat and found two pairs of oars. Callus sat down and took one pair and fit them in the oar locks, while the longville cut the boat free from the mooring buoy. By the time Callus had taken a third pull, the Longville had unshipped the second set of oars and was pulling along in time with Callus. Chopee found a rudder and tiller and set them up, while Eric sank deeper into the boat. He was soaked to his skin, battered and exhausted, but he almost gave thanks for being able to simply sit and not have to move. Anyone see Rue? asked Eric. Or Jado or Natombi? The Longville shook his head. Where's Bigo? Dead, replied Eric. Then the Longville said, Find a bucket. We're going to be swimming if we keep taking on water. Eric looked around, and in a bait box found a large wooden bucket. He stood there a moment, then asked, What do I do? Look for pools of water. Fill the bucket and pour it over the side, answered the Longville. It's called bailing. Eric said, Oh, and knelt. The boat had a bilge grate, and he saw water collecting under it. He moved the grate and dipped the bucket and filled it half full. Water wasn't coming in, save for the rain, and he didn't have to work hard to keep the water contained in the bilge. Eric looked ahead. A shallow flow out of the south end of the estuary provided a direct course into the river's mouth. Callus shouted to Chopee, Steer that way. The deeper channel for the big ships leads into the main harbor. This smack might be able to steer between the hulks and the harbor, but I don't want to chance it. Eric said, For the chaos in the harbor, we would be trading one mess for a bigger one. The Longville said, Just keep bailing. Pug sat up as a strange keening filled the air. It was the dead of night at Stardock, and he had been asleep. He pulled on his robe as the door to his sleeping quarters was pushed open. Miranda, wearing a very short and sheer sleeping shift, said, What is that? Pug said, An alarm. I've established wards throughout Novinda, so I could keep track of what's going on down there without risking calling too much attention to myself. He waved his hand, and the sound ceased. The city of Maharta. They had come to share a quiet sense of each other over the weeks Miranda had been staying with Pug. She found it amusing that so many of the mysteries surrounding him were really nothing more than sleight of hand. When he vanished, he was usually nearby, but keeping out of sight. He used a magical gate to leave Stardock and return to Sorcerer's Isle at will, and usually appeared there at night. 
Meals were waiting for him, as well as his laundry, much to Miranda's delight. Pug regarded the dark eyes that studied him. What do you intend to do? she asked. Go there? No, said Pug. There might be a trap. Come along. I've got something interesting to show you. He led her out of his personal quarters in a tower at the center of the keep of Starduck and down the stairs. And why don't you put some clothes on? You're quite a distraction in that nothing you sleep in. Miranda gave him a half-smile as she ducked into her own quarters, grabbed a dress, and slipped it over her head. Stockings, shoes, and the rest she'd worry about later. She returned to the hall and followed Pug down the stairs. She had sensed over the weeks they had been together that Pug found her attractive, and on several occasions had wondered about him in a more personal way, but neither had broached the topic or acted upon it. She had slept alone in a room close to his every night since following him to Stardock. A strange sort of trust had built up between them, for while Miranda refused to reveal much about herself, she had a quick mind and fast wit, and the same dry sense of humor Pug had developed over the years. He had given her the run of the place, and she had been in most of the rooms, but not all. A few rooms were locked, and when she asked about them, he said there were things he was unwilling to share with anyone, and would change the subject. He made a motion with his hand as he approached one such door, and it swung open without a touch. She understood the principles involved in the spell, but had sensed nothing of magic when she had investigated the door a month earlier. Inside the room was a large assortment of scrying devices. A round object lay beneath a blue velvet cover, and as he removed this, she saw a perfect globe of crystal. This was a legacy from my teacher Kulgan, who died many years ago. It was fashioned by Alpha Thane of Kars. She nodded in recognition of the name of the legendary artificer of magic items. As he passed his hand over it, the heart of crystal turned opaque, a milk-white cloud forming within the ball. With another pass of his hand, he brought a rosy glow to the cloud within the orb. This device gave him the first hint I had some talent. His voice fell low as he added, a very long time ago. What can it do? It's a sighting device, and the wonderful thing about it is that it is very subtle. Those being watched have to be very alert to sense its use. He sat on a stool and motioned for Miranda to sit nearby. The problem, though, is that what makes it subtle makes it very stupid. If you don't know what you're looking for, it's no help at all. Fortunately, I know where I placed each ward. He squinted a little, and Miranda felt magic turning and being adjusted, as Pug said, Let's see what is happening in Maharta. It must be mid-morning there. He focused his will, and the city of Maharta was revealed in the glass as if viewed from the clouds by the birds. It lay in smoke and cloudy darkness. What tripped your ward? asked Miranda. That's what I'm trying to... Here, I think. The point of view in the glass shifted, and across the river he saw a bridge of light and an army upon it. After viewing it for a moment, Pug closed his eyes. He opened them again after a moment. One thing about the Pantathians. There's little about them one might call refined. Unless I attacked them directly, there's no possible way they could know I was watching. Is Mahata going to fall? asked Miranda. It appears that's the case, answered Pug. Callus? Pug said, I'll try to find him. Pug closed his eyes, and the scene in the ball shifted, and as he opened them again, the colors swirling in the ball resolved themselves into an image. A small fishing boat, rowed by two men and holding two others, struggled through rough waters. Pug brought the image closer, and they could both see that the first man in the boat was callous, pulling with his more than human strength against the choppy water. Miranda sighed. I suppose helping him is out of the question. Difficult, without letting the Pantathians know where we are. A few I could deal with. Those guarding that bridge, I know, she said. Pug looked at Miranda. You're fond of him, aren't you? Callous? She was silent for a while. In a way, he's unique, and I feel a connection with him. Pug sat back, his face a mask. It's been a long time since I felt that with anyone. Looking back into the ball, he said, We could attempt... Suddenly there was a flash of orange light in the ball. Miranda said, What was that? What was that? shouted a long bill as orange light exploded at the docks. 
They had been making steady headway against the running tide as they crossed the boundary of the estuary and entered the river proper. The winds were picking up and the rain increasing to the point where Eric was bailing in earnest. No one had spoken for a while. Despite their efforts to stoke the fires before leaving, the rain had been defeating them. Even the biggest fire was starting to diminish, and whatever Nacor's idea had hadn't been manifested. Then a hum had sounded in the distance, followed a moment later by a bolt of white energy arcing down from the bridge to strike the center of the shipyard. A huge ball of orange flame climbed into the air, followed by a rising column of black smoke. The sound of the explosion had hurt their ears even at this distance, and a moment later a hot gust of air struck them like a stinging blow. Keep rowing, yelled Callus. Eric bailed, but he looked over his shoulder past Chopi, who also looked back. Look, shouted Chopi, as a tiny dart of blue light rose from the docks and struck at the leading edge of the bridge of light. Within seconds, another massive bolt of energy rained down on the harbor, exploding buildings and sheds into flame. Two previously intact ships resting at anchor, waiting to be hauled out for repair, caught fire as flames touched their sails. Now half the shipyard was aflame, and hot enough, apparently, for the rain to have little impact. Callus and the Longville pulled hard, and a few minutes later another blue bolt of light rose up and struck the bridge. The third blast from above was as large as the first two combined, and fully half the waterfront was engulfed in fire. Suddenly the Longville let out a harsh laugh. Nacor, he said. Even Callus couldn't hide his astonishment. Eric said, But he said he didn't have any magic that would work against the bridge. The Longville said, But they don't know that. He juddered his chin at the bridge, starting its descent toward Maharta. Whatever he's doing, they think it's an attack, and they're doing our work for us. They're going to burn down half the city trying to fry the little maniac. Suddenly Eric started to laugh. He couldn't help himself. The image of the little man dashing madly from place to place, somehow avoiding the terrible destruction the Pantathians were throwing at him, was comic to consider. It's an illusion, said Chopi. The serpent priests are so ready for combat, they don't trouble to look at what is only an illusion. They act as if it were real. Another tiny blue bolt shot skyward, and another thundering response answered, and more of the city's waterfront erupted in flame. Gods, said Eric in a half-whisper. How's he going to get out of that? Miranda squinted against the bright image in the ball. What is going on? Someone has the Pantathians convinced they're under attack, and they're spending a great deal of energy trying to destroy whoever it is. Can we help? Pug said, There's enough going on that I think I can slip something in to make merry hell for this Emerald Queen. He closed his eyes, and Miranda felt power flowing toward him. He moved his lips slightly, and like music, the pitch of the energies in the room shifted. Miranda sat back to watch and to wait. Each time the flames grew and Eric was convinced Nacor must finally be dead, another tiny blue bolt would strike the bridge and another globe of hellfire would descend on the city. The entire waterfront was now ablaze, from the shipbuilder's estuary to the main harbor. As they took the river to the ocean and rode the outgoing tide past the harbor mouth, they could see mighty ships burning at the dockside. Eric tried not to imagine Rue stuck on the docks in the midst of that fire and panic, trapped with no way to escape but to jump into the harbor. As they steered clear of the rocks, they began to follow along the long breakwater they had used to enter the city. Movement caught Eric's eye, and he said, What's that over there? In the rain, he could barely see, but Kala said, Son of our men. He told Chopi to move closer, but pulled up short of letting the boat get too close to the rocks. Eric looked and saw three of the men who had been lost in the river the night before. One looked seriously injured, and the other two waved frantically. Callus stood and shouted, You've got to swim! We can't risk coming any closer! The men nodded, and one slipped into the water. The other helped the injured man in, and the two aided him as he slowly swam to the boat. One of the men was Jado, and Eric was glad to see a familiar face. But of his own company, only Chopi was left. Rue and Luis were not with these men. Neither was Greylock. As Callus sat down to start rowing once more, Eric heard something. It was faint and distant, but familiar. Wait, he said, looking down the breakwater. In the distance, a tiny figure picked its way along the rocks. As it got closer, Eric felt a weight lift from his shoulders, for Rue was limping along toward them. Hey, 
he shouted, waving his hand above his head. Eric stood and waved back. We see you, he shouted. Rue came to the closest point he could, then jumped feet first into the water. He thrashed through the water, and Eric was over the side before anyone could say anything. Near exhaustion a moment before, he gained renewed strength from Rue's plight, and he struck out through the water as if he had all the strength he had ever possessed. Reaching the smaller man, he took him by the shirt and half carried, half dragged him back through the water. He pushed Rue into the boat, pulled himself up half over the gunwales, and let the others pull him aboard. As he fell into the bottom of the boat, Eric said, What kept you? Some damn fool turned loose a horse that kicked me. Damn near broke my leg. He sat up. I knew there was too much going on near the harbor, so I figured if any of you got out, you'd be coming this way. So, here I am. Smart, said De Longville, as he and Callus began to row. Now start bailing. What's bailing? said Rue. Eric pointed to the bucket in the bottom of the boat. Take that, fill it there. He pointed at the bilge, then dump it over the side. I'm injured, Rue protested. Looking around the boat, where no man sat without a scar, Eric said, My heart bleeds for you. Bail! Natombi? Greylock? asked Eric. Rue said, Natombi's dead. He was hit from behind by a soldier while trying to get past another. I haven't seen Greylock since we started back from the harbor. The Longville said, Talk all you want, but start bailing. Rue muttered under his breath, but he dipped the bucket into the water gathering at the bottom of the boat and lifted it to dump it over the side. Power manifested in the air, and a singing sound caused every man to turn back toward the city. They had rowed for nearly an hour and were well clear of the harbor mouth, far enough away to have backed off the pace, and now they were turning northeast, making along the coast to the city of the Serpent River. The Bridge of Light was close to touching down, and armies were now upon it from end to end. But this strange keening, loud enough to cause the men in the boat to flinch, ranged over the landscape. And while they could see nothing of those on the bridge, Eric imagined it must be painful for those close to it. Then the bridge was gone. What? said Rue. A thundering report sounded a moment later, and then a warm wind washed over them, rocking the smack against the roll of the sea. So P said, Someone made the bridge go away. The Longville laughed. It was a dirty, unpleasant sound. Eric looked at him and asked, What? I hope those Sir Hour on the bridge know how to swim. Jado, his broad grin lighting up his face in the gloom, said, As high as that bridge was, man, I hope they know how to fly. Rue winced. Must have been a few thousand of them up there. The more the better, said the Longville. Now, one of you lads needs to take over for me. Suddenly, he was falling forward into the boat. Rue and Chopin moved him while Eric took his place. He was wounded in the arm, said Eric. Chopin examined him. And in the side, he's lost a great deal of blood. Jado took the tiller, and Callus said, I mean to row until dawn, then we'll put in. That should put us ahead of most of those fleeing up the coast, and maybe we can find a place to lay up. Chopin stood up. Captain! What? Pointing ahead, he said, I think I see a ship. Callus stopped rowing and turned to look. Looming up out of the late afternoon darkness, a white sail rose against dark thunderclouds. I hope they're friendly, said Rue. After a moment, Callus turned, and there was no masking the broad grin on his face. Thank the gods. It's the ranger. Oh, man, I'm going to kiss that captain, said Jado. Shut up, said Rue. We want him to stop, not run away. The others laughed. Then Callus said, Start waving anything that will draw their attention. The men stood and started waving swords, trying to catch the late afternoon sunlight, as faint as it was, and reflect it from the blade, or wave a shirt. Then the ship started to turn and make its way toward them. After a seemingly endless time, it came close enough for a man in the bow to shout, Is that you, Lord Callus? Get some help down here. I've got injured men. The ship slowed, and sailors scrambled down and helped get the injured aboard. The smack was left to drift, and once they were all on deck, the captain came forward and said, Good to see you again. Eric's eyes widened. Highness, he said. Nicholas, Prince of Condor, said, Here, I'm just Admiral. How did you convince the king to let you come? Asked Callus. As soon as the ranger returned with the intelligence you'd sent back, I just told Boric I was going. Erlans and Condor with Patrick, acting as his son's regent, so we're both where we want to be. I'll catch you up on court politics later. Right now, let's get you below and into some dry clothing. Callus nodded. 
We need to get far from here, and there's much to speak of. Nicholas called out, Mr. Williams. Aye, sir. Turn us around and set as much sail as you'll carry. We're making for home. Aye, aye, sir, came the reply. Eric was certain he heard relief in the first mate's voice. Sailors led Eric and the others below, and somewhere between then and the next morning, Eric passed out and was undressed and put into a warm bunk by someone. Miranda said, You took a chance. Pug smiled. Not much of one, given the circumstances. All I did was irritate them, really. The city was already theirs. What next? More waiting, said Pug, and for an instant she saw his chafing at the need to do so. When the Queen is ready to make her next move, and she shows us how she is going to dispose of those things in her possession, then we'll know what we must do next. Miranda stretched. I'm thinking we need to travel. Where? Somewhere warm and pleasant, with empty beaches. We've been locked up over these books for months now, and we're no closer to finding the key to the puzzle. There you are wrong, my dear, said Pug. I've known what the key is for some time. The key is Mokros the Black. The problem is, where is the bloody lock? Miranda stood up and knelt next to him. Putting her arm around his shoulder in a familiar gesture, she said, Why don't we worry about that some other time? I need a rest. You do as well. Pug laughed. I know just the place. Warm beaches, few distractions, if the cannibals don't notice you. And we can relax. Good, she said, kissing him lightly on the cheek. I'll go get my things. As she left the room, Pug sat back and pondered this strange woman. The light brush of her lips on his cheek was a small gesture, but the touch lingered, and he knew it was an open invitation, if a demure one. He had not found time to become involved with any woman since his wife had died, nearly thirty years before. He had known lovers, but they had been companions or distractions. Miranda was possibly something else. Suddenly he smiled and stood up as he considered that a lonely beach without distractions was the perfect place to begin unraveling her mysteries. The northern great archipelago would be lovely this time of the year, and there were far more deserted islands than populated ones. As he returned to his own quarters, Pug felt a spring in his step he hadn't experienced since he was a boy, and suddenly he felt the troubles of the world were far away, at least for a little while. Eric looked at the white caps as the ship sped through the ocean. Rue had caught him up on the gossip. Prince Nicholas had come down from Crondor with a returning Freeport ranger and had taken personal command of the situation. He had read the reports Callus had sent downriver from his first meeting with Atonis and had kept himself abreast of the enemy's movement. He had kept Trenchard's revenge anchored at the city of the Serpent River and had come down the coast against the possibility of Callus and his men having to flee that way. They had been anchored in the harbor at Maharta for a month when agents in the city got word to him of the coming blockading of the harbor. He had raised anchor and sailed out past a skiff full of city guards and an angry harbor master, then sailed away from a pursuing cutter. He had stayed out to sea for a week, then returned to find the harbor mouth sealed. Nicholas had then sailed up the coast for a day, keeping out of sight of the city against the possibility of enemy ships coming up the coast. When he had seen the smoke from the first battle, he had given the order to hug the coastline as closely as safely possible, to determine what was occurring on the land. He had been sailing toward the harbor for a better look when he'd spied the fishing smack carrying the last of Callus's party. The Longville came up on deck, his arm and ribs bandaged, and came to stand next to Eric. How goes it? Eric shrugged. Well enough. Everyone's resting. I'm still sore, but I'll live. The Longville said, You did well back there. I did what I could, answered Eric. What do we do next? We, said the Longville. Nothing. We're going home. It's back to the city of the Serpent River. Give the clan chieftains what we know in case Atonis and Praji don't get there. Then we pick up Trenchard's revenge and head back to Crondor. Once we're there, you're a free man. Eric said nothing for a while until... That's a strange thought. What's a strange thought? asked Rue, limping as he came up beside them. He yawned. Never thought I'd live to see the day I'd enjoy waking up on a ship. I was just saying, said Eric, that the idea of being a free man is strange. 
Rue said, I can still feel the noose around my neck. I know it's not there, but I can feel it. Eric nodded. The Longville said, I was asking what you two were planning next. Eric shrugged, but Rue said, There's a merchant in Crandall who has an ugly daughter. I plan on marrying her and getting rich. The Longville laughed while Eric smiled and shook his head in disbelief. Helmut Grindel, said Eric. That's the man, said Rue. I've got a plan that will make me rich in a year, two at the outside. What's that? said the Longville. If I tell you, and you tell someone else, then there's no advantage, is there? The Longville seemed genuinely amused as he said, I guess not. He turned to Eric. And what about you? Eric said, I don't know. I'm going back to Ravensburg to visit my mother. Then I don't know. I don't suppose it would hurt to let you boys know there's a bonus of gold in this for you. Eric smiled and Rue's eyes lit up. The Longville said, Enough for you to start up that smithy. Eric said, That seems like a faint dream. The Longville said, Well, it's a long voyage and you have a lot of time to think on it. But I have a suggestion. What? asked Eric. This battle's just one of many, nothing more. We cut them and they're bleeding, but they're a long way from dead. Burning down the shipyards gained us a few years. Countess thinks maybe five, perhaps six. Then the ships will start being built in earnest. Atonis and the others will run a war, irregulars striking at the lumber trains as they caravan down the mountains and raiding the barges and the rivers. It'll slow them down, but sooner or later the ships will be built. We've got agents all through the area, and we'll burn a few of the ships and cause them general grief for a while, but sooner or later... They will come, finished Eric. Across the endless sea, right into the bitter sea, and on to the gates of Crondor. He waved back toward Maharta, out of sight, but still fresh in their memory. You think on that happening to the Princess City? Not a pretty thought, admitted Rube. We've got a lot of work to do, Callus and I. And I could use a corporal. Rue grinned, and Eric said, Corporal? You've got an axe, son, even if you're not mean enough. Hell, Charlie Foster was a nice guy by anyone's measure before I got my hands on him. A couple of years with me, and you'll be spitting cobbler's nails and pissing lightning. Me in the army? The Longville said, Not just any army. Nicholas is going to give Callus a mandate, signed by the king. We're going to raise up an army the likes of which no man has seen before. We'll train them and drill them, and when we're done, we'll have the finest fighting men in history. Eric said, I'm not sure. You think about it. It's an important job. Eric said, I'm a little soured on killing right now, Sergeant. The Longville's voice dropped, and he spoke firmly but softly. That's why it's important, and that's why you're the right man for the job. We're going to train these men to stay alive. He patted Eric once on the shoulder. It's a long voyage. We'll have plenty of time to talk. I'm going to take a rest now. Eric and Rue watched him leave, and Rue said, You're going to take the job, aren't you? Probably, said Eric. I don't know that I want to be a soldier the rest of my life, but I do seem to have the knack. And there's something about knowing where I belong that appeals to me, Rue. Back home, I never felt that way. I was always the Baron's bastard or that crazy woman's son. He lapsed into silence a moment, then said, And Callus's army? I'd just be Corporal Eric. He smiled. Besides, I have no ambitions to be rich like you. Then I'll get rich enough for the both of us. Eric laughed, and the two men stood quietly for a while, simply relishing the fact of having survived to be able to plan a future. Epilogue Reunion The traveler squinted. Atop a nearby hillock, a figure sat, playing a thin reed pipe. Badly. The traveler leaned on a staff that compensated for his limp, due in the main to a nasty sword wound to the thigh that was only just now beginning to heal. He removed his hat and ran his fingers through his hair, and the figure on the hill started waving. Owen limped closer and at last said, Nacor? Greylock, said Nacor as he walked down the hill. The road was heavily traveled as thousands fled the invaders, making their way up the old coastal trading route toward the distant city of the Serpent River. The two men embraced, and Nacor said, You didn't get out with the others? I don't know who got out, he said, using his staff so he could ease himself to the ground. 
Nacor squatted next to him and put his pipe away in his ever-present shoulder sack. Most didn't, said Nacor. I saw a boat, and I think Carlos was in it. Pretty sure. And some others. Saw a ship, but they were too far away to see me. So someone's getting word back to the prince and Crondor? Pretty sure, said Nacor with a grin. What are you doing now? I was practicing my flute and resting. I'm going to the city of the Serpent River. Mind if I walk with you? asked Greylock. I'm afraid I'm going to slow you down. That's all right, said Nacor. I've got lots of time. What happened to you? asked Greylock. I got caught up in the crush when everyone was trying to get back to the estuary. I got a horse, but got knocked off. Then a guardsman swung at me with a sword before he ran off. He gestured to his leg. I barely got out of the city when the citizens broke down the northeastern gate. Something happened to the invaders, and there weren't a lot of them around for a while, so I got through. I hid for a couple of days until the leg healed enough for me to limp along. He massaged his stiff leg. Don't know what happened back there, but something played fair havoc with their invasion. Pug of Stardock, said Nacor. I think it was his trick. He dumped them all into the river. It was grand. I couldn't see much, though, as I was trying to keep from burning. You were responsible for all that in the city? Most of it. A trick, really. Got the Pantathians to do the work for me. How did you get out of that holocaust? I found that tunnel I told Callus about, the one that led to the western precinct. I got past some rubble and some guards, and when I reached the west side of the river, most of the defenders had fled. Greylock said, Ingenious. Then he said, Wait a minute. If you were on the other side of the river, how did you... Pulling himself up with a staff and a hand up from Nacor, Greylock said, Why don't you tell me about it as we walk? Nacor grinned. Good. If we hurry, we may reach the city of the Serpent River before Callus and the others sail home. You sure they got out alive? Ship I saw sail past a few days ago, said Nacor with a grin, pointing out to sea. Freeport Ranger. If that was Callus I saw in the boat, then they're alive and they're heading that way. He pointed toward the northeast. City of the Serpent River. They'll do some talking with the clan chiefs, make plans, do other things. They started walking. If we don't dawdle, we might get there in time. Think we can steal some horses? asked Greylock. Nacor only grinned in reply as he dug into a sack and pulled out a large round object. Want an orange? End of Shadow of a Dark Queen Serpent War Saga, Volume 1 by Raymond E. Feist Read by Roy Avers